Rebuild World, Chapter 226, Hospital Visits Akira had to stay in the hospital until the treatment for his lost arm was done. It took about three days to grow his new arm. On the first day, Kibayashi came to visit him with Arabe. Seeing Akira cock his head the moment he came in, Kibayashi could not hold back his amused smile. Geez, that was cold. Although I'm here to give you a hospital visit, there's no need to be that prickly, you know. Then why are you smiling like that? Well, that's because you're as reckless as always. It's not like I'm doing it because I want to. Are you here just to ask me about that? That's right, or so I want to say, but before that, business comes first. Let me introduce you, this is Arabe from Drankum. Arabe politely bowed to Akira. I am Arabe. I'm sorry to come here so suddenly, I asked Kibayashi to introduce me to you because there's something I want to discuss with you regarding the recent incident. Nice to meet you. Akira was rather wary since he thought that he would get an earful of complaints after killing Katsuya. But seeing that Arabe did the opposite, Akira was at loss on what to do. That was when Kibayashi suddenly interjected. Before you guys start talking about your business with Drankum, I'll give you a short explanation of what is going on. What happened during the large-scale expedition, and what happened while you were out cold. After all, it won't make any sense unless we let you know all about that first. Although Akira was still struggling to follow the unexpected turn of events, it was also true that he wanted to know more. So he decided to just listen quietly to Kibayashi's explanation. The hunters in the expedition were thrown into chaos when Tsubaki suddenly jammed most forms of communication. But fortunately, the hunters who joined the expedition were skilled. Although not all of them were that skilled, they were still at least able to work smoothly within their respective team. As such, normally, communication jamming would not cause such chaos. But Tsubaki prepared something else to stir the pot. She had some hunters paid to attack other hunters, a team to attack another team, hunters betraying their own team. And as the cherry on top, she also prepared Tyal to attack the hunters. With all of these going off in one go, the situation was quickly thrown into utter chaos. Among that chaos, hunters were attacked by their teammates when in reality, those teammates were just lookalikes. They were old world monsters modified with familiar faces thanks to Yatsubayashi. When hunters managed to establish a communication line with them through the close-range connection, what they would hear was filled with screams and gunshots. Tsubaki also lured monsters to clash with city management's powered suits. Of course, the line of command that was already established immediately went down under that situation. Of course, there were also some hunters who pretended to be working with Tsubaki only to leak that information to those on city management's side. Unfortunately, that information was completely useless. The long-term planning division already knew that some people made deals with the caretaker AI, so they did not pay much attention to them. Moreover, the information these hunters gave was mostly useless and had questionable sources. Those who were betrayed also noticed that through their information terminal right before the jamming. Some of the hunters tried to send that information to HQ the moment they noticed it. However before they could do it, long-range communication to HQ was already down. Furthermore, these people were the first targets to be killed under Tsubaki's orders. With all the ensuing chaos, it was difficult to deal with the situation using teamwork. Thus, hunters began to drop like flies and the death count reflected it. The beguiling ghost that tempted hunters to betray each other, it was big enough of a tragedy for such an urban legend to be born. After all these deaths, Yanagisawa managed to form a truce with Tsubaki. Moreover, city management released an order that prohibited any form of retaliation, which would most likely stem from grudges. This applied between hunters, to city management, and to the ruins caretaker as well. There were hunters who betrayed their own team, there were also some hunters who got killed because of misunderstandings. If they seek revenge, either targeting their other fellow hunters, or going to the ruin once again to exact their revenge on Tsubaki, both would only serve to increase the body count. So in order to prevent that, 
city management dispatched a squad to put the expedition area under a tight lockdown. Kibayashi gave a short explanation to Akira. Although, since it was not like Kibayashi knew everything and was only able to give a quick overview of the situation, it was enough to make Akira frown. Akira then noticed something that piqued his interest. You did say that city management dispatched the squad to guard the expedition area in order to prevent more unnecessary deaths, right? But isn't it because they have another reason behind that? HM. Well, it's not 100% a lie, but well, basically, they can use that to mask their other reason. Of course, it's all just my guess though, so don't take it too seriously if you still want to hear more. Akira understood that Kibayashi was actually baiting him to say yes there, but even so, Akira still decided to take that bait. Yes, please. In that case, can you promise me to take Arabe's business in a positive way? Even if I haven't heard what this business might be. In contrast to how Akira negatively reacted to what he just said, Kibayashi just chuckled and casually said. It's not like I'm telling you to throw yourself into more danger without any reason. I just want you to take it positively in exchange for telling you my guess. It's fine if you don't want to do that as well. It's nothing that serious. Well, if it's only that much. All right then. By acting as if it was nothing serious, Kibayashi was able to pressure a high-ranking hunter to accept a talk that he had not known yet. Arabe who realized that could not help but feel a bit of fear. Let me preface it with this, it's all just my guess. City management went as far as dispatching soldiers to guard the place, so one thing for sure, it's something huge. They must have struck a deal with the ruined side. Ah, uh, I see, so that's what it is, huh? So they're planning to gather chrome next, right? Akira was able to come up with such a guess thanks to all the things that he had learned. But his guess said with confidence was quickly shot down. No. It's just my guess, but the deal might have been done in Orem. Orem. But the ruins caretaker doesn't have Orem, right? Correct. That's why the payment is done through selling trash and other unnecessary relics from the ruin to city management by putting a price on them. And then the caretaker AI would use that Orem to pay for the expense of guarding the lockdown. So basically the caretaker AI is paying for the defense of their area. While on the other hand, city management would be able to earn money from this as well. So, to put it simply, this means that Kagamayama City managed to strike a deal so that it can buy old world relics with Orem which is a corporation issued currency instead of using Chrome. Kibayashi's expression turned serious. Do you understand just how big this is? It's extremely ecstatic news for Sakashita Heavy Industry that issues Orem. It ushers a new wave of support for the corporation and it'll gather everyone around Kagamayama City who is seeking old world relics. Obviously, it'll bring a huge influx of money. It's unimaginable just how much profit this will bring. And at the center of this development is that deal with the caretaker AI. Meanwhile, the main player who acts as the bridge between city management and that ruin is Commander Yanagisawa. I bet no one in Kagamayama City can go against him now. Although I have to admit, it's weird why someone of such caliber is in this city in the first place. Akira raised his eyebrows and was obviously surprised. Is that really amazing? Being able to negotiate with a ruin's AI. Yeah, it's way more amazing than you can even imagine. Though it also depends on how well that person handles the negotiation. It's amazing enough for the corporate government to scout them and place them as executives in one of the five top corporations' main HQ. Ah, by the way, there are many AI in the ruins. Business AIs are easier to handle. They're more open to deals, well, they're made for business after all. Many of them are willing to make deals with just anyone as long as they have the funds to pay it. Some of them are even willing to barter in case their negotiation partner does not carry currency with them. But the caretaker AIs work under completely different principles. Many of them focused more on killing intruders, thanks to that, it's almost impossible to make a deal with any of them. 
but that just means how precious it is to be able to make a deal with one of them. After all, if you're lucky, you can get yourself involved in the old world government. Akira gave a light nod, it seems that he was able to understand just how amazing it was. Seeing that, Kibayashi gave a satisfied smile and cut his talk short. That's all from me for now. Well then, Arabe-san will take over from here. All right. Arabe nervously started with an opening. Let me introduce myself once again, I'm Arabe from Drankum. I'm here today to discuss a peace treaty with Akira-san. Akira pulled his head back out of surprise. P-Peace Treaty, aren't you exaggerating this too much? There's no need to be that surprised. Drankum has no wish to be hostile against you. Just think of it as Drankum's way to convey the same. Arabe tried his best to maintain his best amicable smile. It is as Kibayashi-san just explained, we've also received a notice to stop any infighting between hunters because of the mess that happened during the expedition. Although we're still investigating the details, we've confirmed that a misunderstanding between the hunters under our gang had caused you immense trouble. So in order to avoid letting that spark turn into more conflict, we've prepared a peace treaty document through the hunter office. Please carefully read through the document and sign it if you're okay with it. Akira took the document that Arabe offered. But just like usual, it was filled with small dense letters as if it was not written for reading. So he took his usual move which was to rely on Alpha. Although it contains even the tiniest details, it's basically just a normal peace treaty. Are you sure it doesn't have any difficult hidden clause or something that stipulates me having to pay a huge fine if I broke the treaty? Or maybe other weird clauses? I don't find anything like that. I see. With this, Akira confirmed that it was a proper peace treaty. But he still found it a bit too much. Arabe-san, as I said, there's no need to go this far, you know. Or more like, with the notice from city management not to fight, I don't see there being any need to make this peace treaty. Akira did kill Katsuya and a lot of his teammates, so it would not be weird if someone from Drankum attempted to kill him. Because of that, he thought that Arabe's offer was too good to be true. He just could not help but to get suspicious that there were strings attached to it. Arabe replied with a smile, but behind that smile, he was thinking hard about what to say. The silence continued since he could not think of any good argument, which only served to increase Akira's suspicion. Kibayashi, who noticed it, finally decided to intervene. To put it simply, Drankum is gathering documents to shut particular people up. Documents? Drankum received quite a large loan from the city. That's why they receive a lot of complaints when something goes wrong. Something like, if only they had properly followed the words of their sponsors, and that's also the case this time. After getting into conflict with a high-ranking hunter which ended up with so many deaths, the sponsors are questioning if they can believe a simple unwritten promise or even a treaty written on a single leaf of paper by city management. That's why Drankum had to even go to the hunter office to prepare this peace treaty. That way, those people from city management won't have any complaints. Akira nodded in understanding. I see, so that's the reason, huh? If I may add something it's actually a good offer for you too. Drankum has no wish to pick a fight with you, but of course, it's not like everyone in the gang is happy with that. You did kill quite a lot of them after all. So then, if any of them come after you, you can use that peace treaty and send a complaint to Drankum. I'm sure Drankum would get desperate and deal with it swiftly. As a hunter gang, if news spreads of it ignoring a peace treaty made through the hunter office, it will cause damage that endangers the integrity of the whole organization. To top it off, they'll recognize you as someone who could deal with problems calmly and rationally. There are many people who think of hunters as nothing but thugs, so it's important to build a good reputation. Your reputation will get better especially when it has a case to use for reference. Kibayashi then took a short pause as his expression turned even more serious. And also, one more thing, Akira. It's about time you stop looking down on yourself. I know it's something left over from your days back in the slums where everyone looked down on you. 
but you should throw away that view already. No matter what your past is, no one questions the fact that you're a high-ranking hunter right now. I bet you're thinking why someone would come to you with such a document, but from a normal person's point of view, they don't want to get into a fight with you even if it means they have to go through all the trouble preparing a document like this. It's not like I'm telling you to make a 180 degree change, but at least stop looking down on yourself. It brings nothing but trouble both for you and the people around you. It will only give them more reason to misunderstand you, you know. Akira sent a serious gaze to Kibayashi, then to Arabe, before finally to the document on his hand. As he gained new self-confidence, he put his name on the treaty and returned it back to Arabe. Thank you very much. Now then, I need to return back and take care of the administration regarding this matter. So please allow me to excuse myself. Akira, I'm heading back too. It's really unfortunate that I don't have the time to listen to your reckless story, but I'm pretty busy, you see. Until we meet again. Arabe politely bowed to Akira while Kabayashi lightly waved his hand as both left the room. Akira looked at a copy of the treaty for his safekeeping with a deep thought as he mumbled. I guess I've become pretty strong, huh? Alpha smiled proudly and stated. It's nothing to be surprised about since I train you myself. But still, don't get satisfied yet, okay? I know. Akira gave a light smile, it was the smile of someone who had recognized and accepted his strength, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Arabe was walking down the hospital hallway as he sighed in relief. Kibayashi. I really owe you one. Just so you know, it's not for free. As a matter of fact, it is not a cheap favor, okay? I know. We did not have to pay for the damages and were able to sign a peace treaty even after that much fighting. It's a really huge help. Arabe did say that Drankum was still investigating the details of the incident, but in reality, there were points and facts that Drankum had already confirmed. City management gathered all the hunters from the expedition area regardless if they were alive or not and took the data from their information gathering devices in order to help the investigation. Moreover, they also received data regarding the incident from Tsubaki via Yanagisawa. With all of this data, they were able to get a precise and accurate picture of what had happened. Drankum received a piece of that investigation result and understood what had happened during the conflict between Akira and Katsuya's team. Arabe could not help but sigh when he remembered those details. Although there is a lot of restricted information, it's confirmed that Katsuya's team attacked Akira due to a misunderstanding. We won't have any argument to fight back if he demands compensation. In the worst case scenario, Viola might get her hands on this matter as well. It won't end up well for the gang. But now, we got him to sign a peace treaty recognized by the hunter office before that happened. With this, we'll be able to suppress the damage to a minimum. This alone is a huge help for us. It was a huge surprise that Akira did not ask for any compensation. I wonder if he's one of those hunters who don't really care about money. Kibayashi's lips curled up in a rather menacing smile. He's my favorite hunter, after all, a reckless hunter. He might prefer to exchange favors using life instead of money. Good grief give me a break. It was not rare for failed negotiation with a hunter to break into a fight. In the end, power was everything in the eastern district. Although the negotiation took place outside the wasteland, that line of thinking holds true as long as it was outside the city wall. Not a small number of corporations were brought to the brink of bankruptcy after making a huge mistake during a negotiation with a high-ranking hunter. Of course, they were able to repel that hunter, but the sacrifice was not small. Arabe could not help but to rub his temples when he imagined just how much death it would cause if Akira decided to attack Drankum. Seeing that, Kibayashi was happy since it seemed that Arabe understood just how big he owed him. Thus, Kibayashi decided to change the subject. So then, how is Drankum right now? With that huge debt to me, it would be such a waste if the gang crumbles and can't pay it back. To be honest, it's a huge mess. The effect of Katsuya's death is huge. 
Although this might sound weird, most of the officers, including me, never thought that he would die like that. Some of them even got long-term contracts under the assumption that Katsuya would not die. And with his death, all of those turned into dust. He's a hunter, it was not strange for him to die any time. Although it was so obvious, I wonder why no one expected it at all. Getting ahead of themselves, getting too optimistic, was completely normal for hunters. Even so, planning for the worst was a given as well, Arabe thought it was weird how no one was prepared for the worst-case scenario. Kibayashi smiled wryly at Arabe and said. He even caused Drankum to break into factions, it means that he must have been that talented. I did want to have a good chat with him at least once, but that chance never came until the very end. It would be bad if your reckless loving fetish infects him after all. I bet the officers, especially the people around Mizuha, were actively keeping him away from you. Now that I think about it, it might have been better to let him meet you and get him through some dangerous situations. That way, we wouldn't have placed that much expectation on him. But I guess it's all too late now. Well, you should make sure to learn from your mistake for the sake of those who are still alive. Katsuya was loved by many, right? It's not rare for those who are unhappy with the situation to still pursue revenge. They might even do so with the peace treaty and hunter's notice from city management in place. Be extremely careful with this, in the worst case scenario, the peace treaty might be rendered meaningless, you know? Yeah, I know. We went to get Akira's approval first, so we're going to use that as a reason to get Katsuya's team to sign a separate peace treaty through the hunter office. We'll kick out any of them who refuse. Their equipment is all provided by the gang. I'm sure they're not stupid enough to go and attack Akira barehanded. Some of them are still unconscious from exhaustion, so we're planning to deal with them one by one. Arabe imagined all the work that he had to do from here on and sighed. Kibayashi only smiled, watching how great an effect a hunter could bring during his life and after his death. It was indeed one of many fascinating things related to hunters, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. On the second day, the doctor who was responsible for Akira's treatment visited him with a large tube in hand. A single arm could be seen floating in the middle of that tube, it was Akira's new arm. The doctor then changed the setting of Akira's prosthetic to connect his arm stump to the new arm and asked Akira to test how it felt. Akira was surprised when the sensation from his new arm was sent to his prosthetic. He then proceeded to try to move his arm as he was told to. Although he could feel a time lag between his mind and the new arm, he could more or less move it like normal. He felt a strange sensation seeing an arm that was not connected to his body moving under his will. He tried closing and stretching out his palm, and moving his fingers one by one. After trying a few things, Akira suddenly thought of trying something. He tried to move different fingers of his detached arm and his prosthetic arm. Although it was difficult at first, he quickly got used to it in no time. The doctor watched that with fascination. But he quickly returned back to reality and stopped Akira. Ah, don't do that. Stop doing something like that. It would cause confusion in your brain once we attach your arm back. Eh sorry. Akira flusteredly mentally synced back his detached arm with his prosthetic arm. The doctor lightly sighed and stated. But still, you're pretty skilled. Normally, it's impossible to do that, you know. It had the same feeling as when I'm using my augmented suit, so I thought of trying it and somehow actually did it. I see. If you're that skilled, how about you try adding an extra arm? Like two normal arms plus two extra arms that are attached to your augmented suit. We can get you something like that if you want, you know. Normally, it would be extremely difficult to learn to control the new arms, but seeing what you did there, I bet it won't be that difficult for you. I actually have an acquaintance who works on that kind of thing, I would be happy to introduce you if you want. Thank you, but no thanks. I see. The doctor looked rather disappointed. After returning the prosthetic arm setting, he then left the room together with Akira's new arm. Akira sighed in relief. Seeing that, Alpha smiled amusedly and asked. 
That was an interesting offer though. Why didn't you like it? Don't you think it would be convenient to get two more arms? Well, it does sound convenient, but if I get too used to four arms with an augmented suit, I feel like it would be bad. I might just start feeling that my original two arms are not enough. In the worst case scenario, I might end up wishing for more and more arms. I have no complaints with my current two so I have no plans to get more arms anytime soon. Is that so? Well, I won't force you though, it's a matter of preference after all. Preference, huh? How about you, Alpha? You have only two arms yourself, right? Should I add more? No, don't. Akira knew that he would definitely be teased if he said yes. He would most likely have to live with a four-armed girl every day, so Akira made Alpha seriously stop. After that, a group of people came to visit Akira. There were people from Cheryl's gang, along with Inabe, Viola, Yadagawa, Ario, and Shirjima. Of course, the only one who came there to check if Akira was okay was Cheryl. While the rest were only there to check if the hunter supporting Cheryl was still alive or not. Their visit started with some normal talks, but after that, they let Akira meet each individual in private to talk about business. The first one was Inabe. Akira joined the large-scale expedition under his request. Regardless of the reason, Akira was not able to finish the request. So he thought that Inabe was here to talk about that. However, contrary to his expectation, Inabe was there to give Akira his connection as a reward for successfully finishing his request. Akira was extremely surprised by that. Well, uh, I'm really thankful for the information, but are you sure you're okay with that? Yeah, in the first place, these connections will no longer be available to me after such a large-scale expedition failed under my watch. And right now, regardless of the situation, I was saved from that. Although it was completely unexpected, I did send you to danger for my own profit, so you can think of it as an apology from me. That's quite a large sum for an apology, you know. Well, it's complicated, but I have reasons to be generous to you. Inabe sighed and smiled wryly before continuing. About the expedition, putting aside who deserves the credit, it actually ended up being a huge success despite all the sacrifices. Do you need more explanation on it? No, there's no need. I heard that city management managed to strike a deal with the ruins caretaker AI to trade with Orem through someone by the name of Commander Yanagisawa. And I heard that it would no doubt bring in huge profit for the city. Inabe raised his eyebrows. You even know that too, huh? It seems that you have some other connection to city management besides me. In that case, you don't need any more explanation, right? Basically, the area that is under lockdown by the soldiers dispatched by city management is under my control. Although Yanagisawa basically has control over the deal made, I also gained a considerable amount of influence as well. That's why it did not end in a failure. As a matter of fact, it's okay to say it was a success. Though I don't like the fact that I'm basically working under Yanagisawa now. Inabe rubbed his hand on his forehead as if to relax his face that had slowly turned stern. He then sighed as his expression completely returned back to normal. Well, so that's what happened. If you say you don't need it, although it's not like I'm forcing you to take it, you still can keep it. If you still can't accept this form of payment because you feel like you have not completed your request. Well, it might be weird, but there's one thing that you can do for me. Tell Cheryl that you're not angry. After all, I did end up sending you to the hospital. I want to get along well with her as well, so it would be great if you can, you know, pacify her. If it's only that, then sure. Akira was surprised that Inabe actually thought that much of his connection with Cheryl. But thinking of Cheryl's current position, Akira thought that it was nothing strange and just lightly chuckled. But in reality, Inabe actually did that to keep his connection with Akira. Inabe knew about Akira's battle with Katsuya's team in more detail compared to most people. Having a connection with a hunter who could crush Drankum's rising star alone was a good thing. Moreover, 
he already noticed that Cheryl could not go against Akira. Considering his plan to gain money through Cheryl's gang, he needed to keep an amicable relationship with Akira. That's good to hear, well then, that's all I have for today. I will also tell Kibayashi about the connection I passed to you. I hope that we can keep working together from here and on out. Inabe was satisfied with Akira's reply as he left the room after speaking his piece. Yadagawa was the next one to enter the room. He was there fully for the sake of business. Akira's badly damaged powered suit was hung inside his hospital room. He was planning to bring that to Shizuka for repair once he was discharged. But Yadagawa strongly recommended he buy a new augmented suit instead. He was enthusiastically recommending Akira trade his currently broken augmented suit with a new augmented suit from Yadagawa's company. He brought up the company's connection with Cheryl's gang, a special discount for a high-ranking hunter, and a limited-time campaign to offer an extremely expensive high-quality product of his own company to Akira at an abnormally low price. Yadagawa's vigor greatly surprised Akira. Of course, Yadagawa had a reason for this. To be more precise, it was because of competition. It would be bad for his company's reputation if Akira loved the products of another company, especially when he was the hunter who demolished an entire team that was using their equipment. Yadagawa's company already knew that Akira crushed Katsuya's team. Although connections were being jammed, which caused the coordination support system to be unable to utilize its full potential, it did not change the fact that Akira, alone, was able to crush them. To top it off, Akira did that while using an augmented suit from a different company. The recent expedition was filled with a lot of important information. Those with keen insight already knew about Akira's battle against Katsuya's team. Although equipment did not exactly dictate the end result of a battle, it would still play a big role in deciding the victor. If Akira used equipment from another company and made a deal with said company, then if he said that the coordination support system was nothing special, it would deal a crippling blow to Yadagawa's company. On the other hand, if Akira decided to change to his company after that battle, it would be a huge boon for his company. In order to get over this crisis, Yadagawa did not care about profit or loss as he was trying to get Akira to change his equipment to products from his company no matter what the cost. Regardless of the reason, Akira only stood to profit from being able to get an expensive product at such a low price. But that was exactly why Yadagawa panicked when Akira refused. With reason simply being that he wanted to buy equipment from the shop that he was familiar with, which caused Yadagawa to panic even more. I in that case, how about ordering via that shop? Hmm, well, to be honest, I want to discuss with Shizuka-san first before deciding which to buy though. Akira was insisting on discussing with Shizuka first before ordering any equipment from her shop. Basically, he only bought equipment from the shops that he had a good experience with. The only exceptions would be the equipment that he got through his connection with Kibayashi and Inabe. At the moment, he had no plans to add Yadagawa to that exception. Yadagawa already knew that trying to bait a hunter like this would be futile. After all, many of the hunters decided not to use helmets due to their intuition. Though, it was certainly safer to use one. Against those kinds of hunters who risk their lives out in the wasteland, money would not be able to overcome their preference. So Yadagawa decided to withdraw. Very well. It's indeed unfortunate, but I'll excuse myself here for today. Do tell me if you change your mind. Ah, uh, sure, thanks, and sorry. Please don't be, it's perfectly alright. Akira felt that it was rather anticlimactic, but he did not say anything as he watched Yadagawa leave the room. The moment Yadagawa stepped out, the next visitor entered in a rush. It was Viola and Cheryl. But when Viola brought up the suggestion about asking for compensation from Drankum, Akira told her that he had signed a peace treaty with them already. Hearing that, Viola was so surprised as she said curtly. To think that they made their move first, it seems that they have someone pretty skilled with them. Can you tell me the name of the negotiator that Drankum sent? No. Akira's answer was short and showed no chance for negotiation. 
But Viola then gave her usual smile and commented. Oh my, you're so cold. Only say that to me again when you mean it. The first thing that you said when you came here was suggesting that I demand compensation. Oh, isn't that exactly because I care for your well-being? If you just leave it to me, I can still deal with it somehow, you know. There's no one as desperate to rush to their death as to ask for a favor from you, and if there's one, I'm sure they'll kill themselves first before asking for your help. In contrast to Akira, who obviously seemed to be in a bad mood, Viola was smiling amusedly. Is that so? Well, feel free to come to me if you change your mind. I'll do it for cheap. Well then, since it seems that there's nothing more I can do here, I'll excuse myself. Viola turned around and walked with a rather uppity stride. Akira saw her leaving the room while thinking, does she have another prey to go to? This was when Akira noticed that Cheryl was sitting next to him while staring at him. There was a short silence. If they were real lovers, they would have embraced each other or leaned on each other. But Akira did not make any move at all and Cheryl did not have the courage to go any further. It might be a little late, but I'm glad that you're okay. Well, I guess you're not really okay, huh? Is that so? To be honest, I think this is still considered to be okay. But, that arm, it's prosthetic, right? Well, it is, but I asked for the regenerative treatment and I should get my new arm tomorrow. The arm is still in its growing phase and I'm going to go through surgery tomorrow to attach it back. Today, they brought the new arm and I tried to move it around by connecting it to the prosthetic. It was pretty interesting. So, it'll get back to normal. That's great to hear. Yeah, that's why I think this isn't that bad. But it's weird for you to be sent to the hospital if you're really okay. Is that so? Hmm, well, other than losing my arm, I was in a way worse condition the last time I was sent to the hospital though. So judging from that comparison, this is not that bad. Akira was not trying to look strong, he only said so casually. But Cheryl saw that as how distorted Akira's way of thinking was. He went to face death and many close calls. This normally led to the tragic end of those who saw the thin line between life and death too many times. They got too used to dangers, they stood calmly on top of the cliff that separated life and death. They had no problem peeking down the cliff, knowing that falling down would be fatal. As humans, they were already broken, and Cheryl caught a glimpse of that from watching how Akira responded. The person who she loved and was the pillar that supported her, continued to stand next to death even now and it was unlikely that would change any time soon. Moreover, she had no means to stop him. Cheryl had to learn to live with the fear of losing the one that she loved any time from here on out. She could not handle that anxiety as she inadvertently hugged Akira. Please don't die. Yeah, I don't want to die either after all. Please don't die. It's fine, don't worry. Please don't die. Cheryl's voice was thin as if she was crying. Akira was not sure what to do there but he eventually slowly coiled his arm around her. Although Cheryl knew that Akira only did it to calm her down, the warmth still soothed her heart. Rebuild World, Chapter 227, The Aftermaths On the third day of his stay in the hospital, Akira finally went through the surgery, to stick his new arm to his body. Akira's body was already fixed on the operating table, ready for the surgery. The doctor took the new arm out of the liquid tank and placed it on the operating table, he then cut the overgrown part and readjust the stump. After that, he proceeded to shave the stump on Akira's shoulder before sticking both stumps together. The surgery was done while Akira was conscious. When the doctor finished connecting some of the nerves, he then asked Akira to try to move it. Akira looked away from the cross-section of the cut as he tried to move his new arm. How is it? Do you feel any discomfort? It's okay. Due to the painkiller, Akira did not feel any pain at all. The still detached new arm also only had a numb sensation due to the drug. The surgery continued to connect the bone, the nerves, and then the flesh. 
Akira had to try to move his arms a few times in the middle of the surgery to check on the connection. In the end, the doctor wrapped it in a medical tape, and with that, the surgery was finished. Akira tried to move around his new arm to give a final check. As expected of an expensive treatment, there was no discomfort, it was as if it was his original arm right from the start. Try not to do any heavy lifting for the next three days. If it's possible, I recommend using an augmented suit. Okay, thank you. By the way, about the multiple arms, in case you're interested. T thank you for the offer, but no thanks. I see. Akira felt a shiver down his spine from the disappointed doctor, so he quickly put on his augmented suit and left the hospital, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. As Shizuka was waiting in her shop, she noticed Akira frightfully entering it. The moment their eyes met, Akira gave a rather stiff smile, so Shizuka simply smiled and waved at him to come over. It's not like I'm angry, so you can just enter the shop normally. Ah, uh, yes. Shizuka left the counter and went to Akira, she then hugged Akira tightly and gently patted his head. I don't know what happened, but it seems that it was a rough one. I'm glad that you're okay and that's the most important thing. You're okay, right? Yes, I'm alright. It's all good then. I'm happy as long as you return and visit me in good health. Shizuka gave another squeeze before letting Akira go and returned back to the counter. She then returned to her usual business smile and asked. So then, I guess I should return back to my job as this shop's manager. Akira, what can I do for you today? Right, I actually want to order another set of equipment. Akira lost his bike, vehicle, and rifles, not to mention that his augmented suit was close to being unusable. So he needed to buy replacements for them. Shizuka was not that surprised especially when Akira was back in the same situation again. She could not help but smile bitterly. Well, that's just so like you, or more like, it must have been rough. It's not like I'm doing this intentionally. Well, I've already partially given up on how things always end up like this. Fortunately, I have the money to buy good equipment, so I'll at least buy my safety with money. Shizuka smiled mischievously. A lot of funds, frequent orders, and only buying expensive products. It seems that you're turning into an excellent customer for me. Considering that I'm reaping profits as well, as a part of the special treatment for a loyal customer, I'll prioritize your order. Thank you very much. Seeing Akira smiling happily, Shizuka replied with a big smile. Ah, by the way, Akira, are you interested in augmented suits from Kiryu? Kiryu. Someone from that company came to my shop yesterday saying that they want to put their augmented suit in my shop. Since my shop doesn't usually sell that kind of augmented suit, I refused. But they were so desperate that they even offered some special deals which make it actually sound suspicious instead, so I decided to just keep it for now. Although I can't really tell you the details, basically hunters that satisfy certain prerequisites should be able to buy this augmented suit with a special discount. You might be able to get that discount as well, so, what do you think? Shizuka only said so casually, but seeing Akira gave a rather weird response there, she then inquired. Oh, are you familiar with that name? Uh, well, actually. After listening to Akira's story about Yadagawa, Shizuka nodded, looking convinced and a bit amazed. So that's why. Basically, they're hunting for a potential customer. Well, it's true when a high-ranking hunter is using their product, they can use it as advertisement. I can understand wanting to secure a customer who often destroys their equipment and keeps coming back to buy expensive products. In reality, her intuition was telling that was not everything. But since it did not cause any inconvenience for both Akira and her, she decided not to inquire any further. So then, what are you going to do? If you don't have anything against it, I'm thinking of accepting their offer. Of course, as long as it doesn't have any strings attached. It's a good offer both for you and me. If there's anything to worry about, it might be that your equipment will lean toward what they manufacture from here on out. 
But as long as that discount applies and other companies don't give you any discount, the cost performance ratio of their product is great. If it's really a good offer for me in Shizuka san, then please accept their offer. Alright, I'll discuss the details with them, so can you at least tell me your budget for now? I'm thinking about 2 billion orm. Among the ammo and other expendables he had used up in that expedition, the hospitalization fee, the regeneration treatment, and the budget for his new equipment, Akira's account, which was brimming with cash from selling the old world automata, turned pitiful once more. He still had enough to get by, although the digits were reduced significantly. Shizuka smiled amusedly and commented. Good grief, Akira, you've really grown up to be a great hunter. No wonder even companies try to get you on their side. Akira smiled bitterly and replied. That seems to be indeed the case, huh? Shizuka raised her eyebrows. That reply just now showed no self-depreciation that Akira always had up until now. But she did think that this was a good change and was happy for him, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Yanagisawa was waiting inside a hideout in the lower district of Kagamayama City. It was a highly secretive place suitable for dangerous conversations and conspiracies. For example, a meeting with one of the nationalists. Although he had another hideout in the inner wall, smuggling a nationalist inside the wall was too much of a task even for Yanagisawa. Yanagisawa was thinking inside that hideout as he mumbled. But still, to think Katsuya died. After making that deal with Tsubaki, Yanagisawa returned back to the city to deal with the cleanup and the aftermath. Once he was done, he then ordered one of his men to check up on Katsuya. That was when he received a report that Katsuya was already dead. Since that was completely unexpected, Yanagisawa ordered for a closer investigation. But the report regarding Katsuya's death did not change much. So the reason why she didn't ask for my help to deal with Katsuya was not because it violated their rules, but because she already knew Katsuya was dead. No, I believe it's the former. She needed to get him killed through a method that didn't violate their rules. She basically used the jamming to cut off his support and then made use of the chaos. If hunters fight each other, accidents are very likely to happen. I'm sure that's the gist of it. It did not matter how many times Yanagisawa tried to rethink it, he could not differentiate if everything was all according to Tsubaki's plan, or that everything lined up due to coincidence. But since he would be dealing with Tsubaki in the future, Yanagisawa assumed that the first guess was the correct one as he tried to rethink the whole incident. If I assume that this was all Tsubaki's plan, then just how far does her scheme go? Was the large-scale expedition also part of her plan too? No, what about that attack on the forward base? Wait, no, is it from that huge humanoid monster's attack? Can it be even earlier than that? Yanagisawa went through all the recent incidents in chronological order to pull out all possibilities. Now that I think about it, there was a small commotion about old world terminals. Was it from that time? Tsubaki might have transported those terminals here. I've already confirmed that she did something similar in the past to bait hunters. That's why city management was able to quickly determine where those terminals came from. After all, the same thing happened in the past. She might have deliberately released those terminals out to encourage city management to organize an expedition. Then all the incidents preceding the expedition, such as the attack on the forward base, were for the sake of thinning out city management's resources. Once that happened, city management would send out a bigger army to ensure the success of the expedition. In such a manner, she would have basically manipulated the army. Taking that opportunity, she crushed the oncoming army, which resulted in plenty of deaths. To eliminate more people, the bigger the army, the more chaotic it was, the greater the death count. Yanagisawa's smile turned sharp. Everything was nothing but his guess, he had no proof that it was the real truth. But he also did not have any argument to deny that guess as well. Well, it doesn't really matter. It seems that we can get along well from here on out. I just need to always keep my guard up, that's all there is to it. Although they were not allies, they were no longer enemies as well. 
Furthermore, they had the same objective as well. Excessive suspicion would only cause problems. Thus, Yanagisawa decided not to delve any further into this matter. The security system of the hideout suddenly issued Yanagisawa a warning. There was a guest. Yanagisawa did grant passage for certain individuals to his hideout, but since some of them often changed their faces or bodies, the system could not account for them. Because of that, Yanagisawa was no longer surprised when he met an entirely different person with the same name as his guest. But this time, he was surprised when he saw his guest's face. He was surprised to meet someone he recognized though, he knew that this person wearing that face was not one and the same. Your. Katsuya. Shouldn't you be dead? No, more than that, how did you get in here? The boy with Katsuya's face replied cryptically. I've given up my name for the great cause, or so I want to say, but. You can just call me with my previous name. Yanagisawa came up with many guesses from that quick reply, his face then turned stern as he said. I know that followers of the great cause can change any of their body parts excluding the brain, but you, you even changed your brain, didn't you? Although it's way more important than any other body part, the brain is nothing more than another part of our body that can be freely replaced. That young boy was Nergo. That head was gathered straight from its dead owner. There was still a mark left over from where Akira split the head to two. Yanagisawa tilted his head. What happened to Katsuya's mind? He's already dead for good. Or at least, there's no leftover of his personality in the brain. So, he no longer exists. Is he really dead? What is death? It is a difficult question to answer. Technology developments continue to blur the line between life and death. People can't return back to life. If someone returns back to life, it means that they're still alive right from the start. To put it differently, they're not dead yet. Although it's theoretically possible to resurrect someone, it's still open to interpretation whether life after resurrection is still considered as dead or not. I'm not talking about that. You might already know about this. We had a separate deal with Tsubaki to help her cause more chaos during the expedition. At that time, she told us not to cause any harm to him. Even after I took the head off from his corpse, I did not receive any complaint from Tsubaki. So basically, according to the current standard, our standard, and the old world standard, Katsuya is already dead. Yanagisawa was convinced by that argument, Katsuya was really dead for good. Hmm, is that so? So then, how does it feel using Katsuya's brain? Does it feel good? Nergo made an expression that was unlike Katsuya as he shook his head and explained. Unfortunately, it didn't work out as I had hoped. I bet his death also cut off any of his connection to the old world domain. Either that or we made a mistake while handling his brain, which caused some kind of incompatibility to the hardware. The reason doesn't matter, in the end, I wasn't able to recover his ability to connect to the old world domain. I see, that's indeed unfortunate. Yanagisawa returned to his usual joking attitude as he smiled and said. So then, what do you need from me today? Ah, in case you want information about Katsuya in order to slip into Drankum, just to let you know, I don't mind if you want to do that but everyone already knows that Katsuya is dead. I'm pretty sure it's too late for you to do that now. But, do you still want to try? No, there are too many people over there who are under his local network. They won't recognize me as Katsuya even if I use his brain and face. I bet their personal identification system would identify me as a different person. Just to be safe, I won't be going there as Nergo either. I'm planning to change face and work as a different person after this. Hmm, so, why are you here? I just want to check something. Check on something. If you want to ask me something, you could have just sent it to me through the usual line though. No, there's something that I want to confirm, and I was able to do so. So then? The reason why you're looking for us is not for safekeeping, but for eradication. I've confirmed that with absolute proof. Yanagisawa's joking attitude vanished. 
His smile vanished. Only silent pressure and a pair of eyes that could pierce through one's soul remained. So, now that you know, what are you going to do? Yanagisawa said that but he knew Nergo was not someone he could easily deal with. Nothing in particular. Unknown factors are a source of disruptions. If I really have to say it, then my objective is to remove these factors. I see. After that, a short silence wafted between them. Both of them were trying to figure out what their opponent was thinking. Nergo was the first one to open his mouth. It's completely unrelated, but isn't it about time for you to tell us about your real plan? I do believe that both of us are moving for the sake of humanity. And I think that you share some of the same principles with us. After all, we were able to work together although only for a limited capacity. I think we can work together to realize our ideals. Yanagisawa seemed to hesitate for a bit, he then carefully said. I have to refuse. I can't tell you, or at least, not now. Although, if it's after I have everything I need to reach my goal, I do think that we can be allies. I see, that's indeed regrettable. Now then, we shall wait patiently for the day that you have everything you need to reach your goal. Nergo only said so and left. Yanagisawa relaxed his tense body and sighed. Give me a break already. Nergo did not fear death. But it was not because he could not die. It was because of the way he saw the worth of his life and his soul. It was for the sake of the great cause that he lived, murdered, and ultimately died for. But that was exactly why Yanagisawa thought that he was a pain to deal with. If it was because of his immortality, Yanagisawa could still corner him by taking away his immortality. Even if it was only temporarily, he would be able to convince him that he had already lost. That would have been enough to scare him. But against those who laugh in the face of certain death, that method would be meaningless. What a huge pain in the neck. Inside the room where there was no one else but him, Yanagisawa started complaining and cursing. After Nergo left Yanagisawa's hideout, he then frowned and muttered. It doesn't look like it would go well, huh? The reason why Yanagisawa refused the offer and decided to still stay in Kagamayama City, was for the sake of getting what he needed for his goal. The thing he needed most probably lay somewhere deep inside Kuzusuhara ruin, in the direction where the supply line was being pushed. The existence of an old world connector that he could not control was an obstacle for him to reach the thing that he sought after. Nergo noticed that from his last exchange with Yanagisawa. Yanagisawa himself might have deliberately done that as a form of compromise as well as a warning, I would fight back if you get in my way. As I thought, this isn't going to be easy. Nergo understood well that it was a compromise as well as a warning. But even after knowing that, he was still trying to think of a way to get Yanagisawa on their side, unfortunately, no good idea came up, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Yamina was standing in the middle of a white room. Her consciousness was hazy, but she could recognize Katsuya, who was standing not too far away from her. She did not think much and immediately went toward Katsuya. But she suddenly stopped in front of him. She was staring at that person that was obviously Katsuya from the outside. She then tilted her head and said. You are not Katsuya. Who are you? As I thought, you can tell, huh? That Katsuya vanished, and in its place, a girl appeared. She was an extraordinarily beautiful girl with a friendly smile. However, Yamina looked at her as if was a threat. I'm here with an offer, I hope you will hear me out. An offer. That's right. It's a very good offer for you and the rest who have lost Kitsuya. The girl started explaining her offer with an amicable smile on her face. Yamina woke up on the infirmary bed. Her consciousness was still hazy as she pushed herself up and looked around, confused. She felt like she just had a dream but she could not remember what it was. She could not remember who she was talking to and what she refused. As her hazy consciousness retreated, it also carried away that thought and vanished altogether. What was that? Yamina looked confused for a few seconds. 
When she regained her calm, she then went through her memories. She remembered that she was busy preparing to retreat when she was inside the ruin, but nothing passed that. After that, Arabe came in and explained what had happened to Yamina. I see. So Katsuya is all ready. Unfortunately, yes. Yamina was very saddened by the news, but for some reason, she was not surprised. Although she did not know the reason why, she somehow already knew that Katsuya was dead. I know that you haven't fully recovered yet and you might need time to reorganize your feelings. You can just take it easy for the time being. Yes, thank you very much. Arabe felt a slight pang of guilt seeing Yamina politely bow at him, but he then shook that feeling off and returned back to business. Ah, and also, I know that I should bring this after you have fully recovered, but it's my job, you see. I have something that I need to talk to you about, so please just listen to it calmly, okay? Arabe awkwardly took out a peace treaty and gave it to Yamina as he started explaining its content. Yamina only listened silently, and when Arabe finished, she signed her name on the treaty and returned it back to Arabe. Arabe was a bit surprised by that as he looked at Yamina with eyes full of questions. His biggest worry was that Yamina only accepted that in appearance while was scheming for revenge inside. Uh, well, it might be weird for me to say this since I'm the one who came to you with this subject, but, are you really okay with this? Yamina still had a saddened expression on her face as she forced a smile. Yes, I honestly don't want this conflict to escalate any further. Moreover, I think Katsuya wouldn't want us to hold on to this grudge and cause even more deaths. Arabe sighed in relief, it seemed that there was nothing for him to worry about. Thanks, actually, there are quite a lot of people who have refused, you see. Although I'm sure that it's not like they will try to kill Akira, considering our relationship with city management, we need to do this properly. I'm sure that they will change their mind once they calm down after a few days. At that time, I plan to try and convince them as well. If they still insist on not signing the peace treaty, we have no other choice but to strip them of their equipment and kick them out of Drankum. To be honest, I'm really troubled by this. Can you tell me who refused? I'll try to convince them. Really? Thank you. Arabe, who seemed exhausted, thanked Yamina with a serious expression. By the way, did Eri also refuse? Yamina actually asked that question purely out of curiosity. But seeing Arabe make a conflicted expression, she felt that something did not go well as her expression turned cloudy. Uh, Eri is still alive, right? I heard that from someone else before. Yeah, we were able to save her, but... I guess I'll tell you. You will get to know eventually. We did save her and treat her, her life was in no immediate danger. She woke up not too long before you. Once I received that report from the hospital, I came to her room with the peace treaty too, but... She was no longer there. She's gone. Yeah, it seems like she had sneaked out of the hospital. We dispatched some of our guys to look for her, but we have not found her so far. I think she's currently confused and panicking but... The worry in Yumina's chest turned worse. The shock even caused her to feel dizzy. But right now, she remembered a portion of her dream. So only you alone refuse, huh? The girl inside Yumina's dream said so, it meant that someone else accepted her offer. Eri was traversing through the wasteland on a vehicle. She was well armed. Both the vehicle and her equipments were not from Drankum. She had them ready beforehand just to be safe in case she got kicked out of Drankum. She had been slowly gathering these equipment in secret. Not too long after she left the city, she found some monsters. Eri jumped off the vehicle and directed her rifle at them, she closed her eyes and did not even try to take aim as she pulled the trigger. After holding down the trigger for a few seconds, she opened her eyes. All her shots hit and all the monsters in front of her were already dead. A voice came out from her information terminal. Eri looked at the display, there was the girl that Yamina saw in her dream. How was it? Yes, I've confirmed it, we have a deal. 
What should I call you? You can call me anything. I can't think of a name. In that case, you can call me Alias. We're just like the embodiment of that word after all. All right, Alias. I'll be in your care. Likewise. Ari returned back to her vehicle and set out into the wasteland. As she left Kagamayama City behind, her face was filled with determination. Rebuild World, Chapter 228, Akira and Hikaru Not too long after the large-scale expedition incident, Akira called Kibayashi to meet up in a certain restaurant on the first floor of Kagama building. Kibayashi was browsing the menu in a good mood. You're the one who invited me, so you'll pay for it this time, right? Yeah. That's great to hear. By the way, why don't we go to the higher floors? I don't have that kind of money. This place is already expensive for me. Seeing Akira frowning, Kibayashi smiled bitterly and remarked. No one would have expected that coming from a ranking 50 hunter. Whether it's for treating someone else or for treating yourself, a high-ranking hunter like you needs to use the appropriate corresponding restaurant, you know. Although there were many deaths after that incident, many of the hunters did not receive enough to make the job they took worthwhile. It was mainly because most of the hunters participating in the expedition had their reward decided based on the relics that they brought back. Even for those in the extermination team, their contract did not award payment for the number of monsters that they defeated, but instead, the worth of relics found in the area that they secured. Based on those two criteria, most hunters did not receive much at all. Naturally, city management could not use that excuse to not pay the hunters. Nonetheless, these hunters could not really be rewarded considering the fact that most of them were fighting and killing each other. None to mention city management did not have that funds to spare in the first place. The cost of the powered suit used during the expedition was by no means small. There were many individuals and corporations that bet on the success of the expedition. Despite all of that, aside from Yanagisawa's deal with Tsubaki, the expedition ended up in a total failure. Thus, many investors could not reap the reward of their investment. In the worst-case scenario, it might even shake the city's economy. Therefore, city management was working hard to find a way to stabilize the situation. In order to do that, city management offered rewards to the hunters in the form of rank promotion. Rewards were normally a sum of money plus a hunter rank promotion. However, it had now turned purely into hunter rank promotion. Naturally, there were hunters who insisted on getting paid. To pacify them, city management paid them based on their hunter rank after their promotion using loans. The loans came from selling bonds to several corporations and other cities. Although Kagamayama City was in a financial pinch, since there was a prospect of massive sums of revenue soon, city management managed to amass more than sufficient funding. The low-interest loan city management provided was a huge help for the hunters who had to pay for treatment, equipment, and repairs. It was just enough to prevent the hunters from rioting. With this, Akira received a huge boost in his hunter rank. It was thanks to the feat of crushing an entire team of hunters alone. He also shot down a powered suit that was piloted by someone suspected to be a nationalist. If they considered all his achievement, potential payments and converted it into hunter rank, the increase would obviously not be small. And so, with someone as skilled and as powerful as him, Akira's actions and words came off unbefitting of his position. If you want to change it to Shudariana, you'll be the one paying, okay? If you don't want to, then you need to be someone that would give me a good enough reason to treat you there first. Geez, that's so stingy. Just so you know, I'm actually a big shot, you know. So why is this so-called big shot driving a patrol truck in the middle of the wasteland? That's my hobby. Yeah yeah. In contrast to Kibayashi who was smiling amusedly, Akira looked obviously exasperated. Once they finished placing their order, the meal came not too long after. It was only once the dishes were on the table that Kibayashi started talking about the main subject. So then, what do you want to ask me today? After all, you were the one who called me here, it must be a pretty serious subject, right? 
I want to hear the details of the equipment that I ordered back then. It's already been almost six months since then. I know that it's not that simple, but at least tell me what's the progress right now and estimate how long I can get them. Oh, about that, huh? It's still nowhere close to completion, I can't even give you the time estimation. Ha. Huh. Against Akira's obviously disapproving reaction, Kibayashi frowned and rebuked. Just to let you know, it's your fault that I put in the order late, you know. How did that end up as my fault? It's your fault for adding Inabe's connections in the middle of it. Thanks to that, the prearranged deal was thrown into the rubbish can. Moreover, since the situation had changed, when we asked you one more time about your order including the ones through Inabe's connections, you yourself said to use all the connections available to get the best equipment instead of focusing on speed, remember? It's given that only a handful of places sell such exquisitely high-quality equipment. To be precise, everything is from the east end of the eastern district. It is the closest you can get to the front line, where the best of the best equipment is sold. It's really difficult to get your order through them on that side, you know. Kibayashi was fully expressing his exasperation with his body language as well. Seeing him like that, Akira faltered for a bit. I, I see. What's more, after Inabe got control over the supply line, he has become a pretty influential person. Thanks to that, many want to use that route as well. Although, I bet most of them are aiming for Yanagisawa instead. So he's having a hard time over there dealing with the adjustment. I've been really busy, you know. Preparing negotiation materials directly not related to the order to smooth out the deal, getting myself involved in their negotiations, making offers, creating openings. It's not easy, you know. Oh okay. Even after getting the equipment that you asked for, we still have to figure out how to transport it here. I had to ask the city transports to bring it over so many times. They finally agreed when they had spare capacity. However, that is only for a single item. Even after they agreed, they are still scouting the networks and figuring out which route to take. That is not to mention the deals that I have to make to other parties involved as well. There are still a lot of things to do. Why yes, of course. As Akira was overwhelmed by Kibayashi's flurry of explanation that sounded more like an attack, he suddenly thought of something. If it's about the transport, I can help out by paying to get it sent here in its own separate transport vehicle though. That way, everything should arrive faster. Like hell it would, if you really want to do it, make sure to at least prepare 10 billion orum, alright? I it's that expensive. Akira was utterly surprised. Kibayashi sighed exasperatedly and explained. Listen here. The front line is filled with monsters that are normally designated as bounty monsters around here. Now imagine paying the hunters who spend their time fighting such monsters just to escort your equipment here. It will obviously not be cheap, right? Corporations dealing with transportation in between cities have to do a lot of ways to lower the cost. Things like building infrastructure along the safe routes, or carrying multiple cargoes in one go, or getting into long-term contracts with such hunters. If you want to pay to transport your equipment separately, there's no doubt that it'll at least be that expensive. Now that Kibayashi explained it, it did make sense for Akira. So Akira just sighed and replied. I see. That does make sense. I have an acquaintance who once transported equipment from the front line, so I must have gotten a wrong impression from there. Well, there are some safe areas too, even in the front line. Moreover, there are people who love to boast about being in the front line. It's impossible to trust them without any proof. You can test them with stories that they won't know unless they actually visited the front line or stuff that can be found only in the front line. That's true, I can't say for sure that he's not lying, but I got to see something that I heard only exists in the front line. It was a gun called Ragnarok. Elena-san and Sarah-san were there too, so I'm pretty sure it was really a Ragnarok. Kibayashi raised his eyebrows and smiled amusedly. Oh, in that case, he must really have a safe route to the front line at the very least. So, what happened to him? 
people who bet on the transportation of such stuff usually either end up with a huge profit or a huge loss. Stories of people who reached for success through one enormous bet was Kabayashi's favorite. Even if their bet failed, he would still relish it. However, though he showed his interest, in contrast to that, Akira paused for a bit before replying. I think it's neither. It seems that he's working as a normal merchant right now. Oh, that's unexpected. Hmm. Can you introduce me to him? Don't worry, you can just tell me his contact number. There's no need to reserve your time to introduce him directly to me. Sure, I don't mind, but he's not a hunter, you know. It doesn't matter, as long as they're daredevil reckless people, their occupation doesn't matter. Yeah yeah. After Kabayashi received Katsuragi's contact from the obviously exasperated Akira, he then returned to the main subject. So, the equipment will still take some time to arrive. Well, I'm sure it's not fun to just listen to my excuses as to why it'll still take some time. So, I'll at least let you know this. For the transport, it seems that it's going better than I thought, as long as we can get the product, it might reach here sooner than expected. We're in the resupplying season right now, and this time, Kagamayama City is joining the distribution network. The corporate government had a regular large-scale transportation season. During that time, they took in requests to transport money, cargo, and even people all over the Eastern District in order to proactively encourage economic circulation throughout the Eastern District. Due to the support from the corporate government, transporting between cities that would have normally cost a large sum, could be done at a small price or even for free. It also helped transport people, who could not travel due to the price, and distribute them to locations that needed them. Thus, stimulating the development of the Eastern District. Of course, there was also another secret reason. It was also useful to transport people from overpopulated cities to the slums of other cities. Even if the corporate government stopped the free food distribution in the slums of certain cities and told them that there was a surplus in the other cities, people with no money nor power would still not move to the other cities. To be precise, they could not afford to go. However, if transport was free, then it was a completely different matter. People from the slums would actively participate in the transport season, believing that they had a better chance of surviving somewhere else. It was a more ethical way to control the population density of the slums in the cities instead of just killing them. Thus, the reason why cities tolerated such a practice. While at the same time, it also worked as a way to transport hunters who started to run out of work in the cities they were in. They could go to a better place with more hunter jobs before they turn into thugs and bandits out of desperation. After all, penniless but armed hunters would not be able to live elsewhere other than the slums. Moreover, plans for constructing new cities or a baseway past the front line would be often done during this season. After all, they needed to transport a lot of resources to execute such a plan. With all of these reasons intertwined, trucks and other transport vehicles filled the wasteland during this season. Of course, it greatly roused the monsters. However, with the monetary support from the corporate government, each transport vehicle was guarded with enough escorts. It was a good opportunity to show the power of the corporate government as well as to thin out the monsters roaming the wasteland. Due to this large-scale movement, the Eastern District was able to build infrastructure to travel through the wasteland. Akira tried to remember when was the last transport season, but considering that he could not even tell what was the date back when he was in the slums, he could not really identify when was the last transport season. The transport season, huh? I feel like it's been quite a while since the last season. The transport season itself is always done at least once per year, but it has indeed been quite a while since the last time Kagamayama City joined in on it. Although each city is recommended to join, it's still up to each city management's discretion to join or not. Basically, we have no say in such a decision, but well, it's kind of easy to guess the reason why Kagamayama City decided to join this season. Oh, what reason is that? Kibayashi pulled back his head and raised his eyebrows. He then gave a bitter smile as he stated the reason. It's for replenishing hunters. 
Kagamayama City had several ruins around it and each ruin offered different levels of challenge. Some of them were completely explorable even to new hunters while some even required veteran hunters with proper preparation. Moreover, the regular patrol request made by city management was basically training for newer hunters to get themselves ready to face real ruins. At the same time, it also helped these amateur hunters to earn enough money to get by. This way, they would not be forced into robbery and other crimes. Working together like this encourages the hunters to form teams. Thus, effectively reducing the number of hunters who challenged the ruins alone only to end up dead. Although it had many downsides, the benefits were also equally as many if not more. Due to this, Kagamayama City was a relatively good city for hunters to chase after success. This was the reason why hunters from nearby cities were attracted to here. Many hunters stayed in this city for a long time to polish their skills before heading out east for more profitable ventures. With such a background, Kagamayama City had become well known even among the corporate government as the city of hunters. But unfortunately, that title was obsolete. Well, with a lot of things happening, we lost quite a lot of hunters after all. Even if we talk only about the incidents connected to ruins, there were three in Kuzusuhara ruin and one in Mihazono residence ruin. Basically, there were four major incidents recently and each incident took many lives. There was that huge battle in the slums the other day as well. This is on top of all the common deaths from the hunters as well. That's why it would be bad for city management unless we managed to bring in more hunters from the other cities. Is it really that bad? It definitely is. Ah, uh, right, you are used to working alone so it doesn't affect you much, huh? Well, some people might indeed think we didn't lose that much if we only look at the total percentage of fallen hunters. But the effect is clearly palpable. There are quite a lot of hunters who take a short hiatus or even decide to outright completely stop working after losing their partner, you know. There was a short time when we had a crisis. There were a considerable number of relics brought to the exchange centers and the number of hunters who signed up for the patrol request skyrocketed. Oh, wait, this is a secret, okay? After all, everything I just said is insider information. Ah, uh, right. We were able to regain some of our spirit and managed to gather quite a number of hunters thanks to news of Yanagisawa's successful deal with the ruins AI. It would have been really bad if that did not happen. I bet Kagamayama City would have been forced into a recession if it was not for that. Although Kibayashi said so in his usual casual joking manner, he was telling the truth. The city was indeed on the brink of an economic crisis. But that's exactly why Yanagisawa's recent achievement gave him immense power and influence. But Kibayashi suddenly gasped as if he just noticed something. Wait, now that I think about it, you were also involved in all of those incidents, right? Akira inadvertently looked away. Well, I restarted my hunter activity around that time after all. You've gone through all of those incidents and came back alive, no wonder you're doing great as a hunter, as I thought, I can identify an exceptional hunter when I see one. In contrast to Kibayashi, who was laughing cheerfully, Akira only gave an awkward bitter smile. Although Akira thought that those incidents were not really his fault, his face still stiffened when Kibayashi brought them up. They then had a short idle talk afterwards before Kibayashi asked Akira's plan from here on out. By the way, you got promoted to rank 50. Are you planning to go to the other cities? No, I don't have that kind of plan at all. That's great to hear. It seems that I'll still be able to enjoy more of your crazy stories for a bit longer. Akira knitted his eyebrows. Is there any connection between my hunter rank and going to the other cities? Well, it's just a rather common thing for the hunters around rank 40 to leave Kagamayama city and go to the other cities. And it's also very common that they'll leave right before they reach rank 50. Because of this, people basically recognize Kagamayama city as a city for hunters below rank 50. Oh. I didn't know there is that kind of upper limit. Seeing Akira so surprised, Kibayashi added to his explanation. Oh, please don't misunderstand. 
It's not like the hunter office sets an upper limit for the hunters to stay in this city. It's basically just a matter of risk and reward. Convenience, and supply, and demand. Since most of the hunters leave the city before they reach rank 50, as expected, no shop suitable for hunters of rank 50 and above can be found in this city. So, there is the trouble that they would have to go through for their equipment. It's also hard to find suitable party members as well. And to top it off, there are not many ruins around that match their skills. Because of that, it's extremely difficult to raise their rank even higher if they stay in this city. So for those hunters who are aiming for rank 50 and above, this city is only suitable for them at most till rank 50. Akira was listening closely to Kibayashi's explanation. After he gave a nod indicating that he could understand that reasoning, he then tilted his head. I see. Wait, you just said that there are not that many ruins that match their skill, right? In that case, how about the inner part of Kuzusuhara ruin? They can just go there, right? Kibayashi could not hold back his smile in response to that naive question. If you think so, you're more than welcome to try. Akira frowned. Is it that bad? We're talking about the area past the supply line that city management built by splurging a huge amount of money here, you know? We are only able to slowly push deeper only after dispatching powered suits. A rank 50 hunter would die in no time. Those rank 60 or 70 hunters might have a chance if they go with their own powered suit. However, there isn't a shop or a place for them to get their equipment properly maintained around here. Of course, city management itself does have a place for that, but it's usually fully utilized by the city defense squad. So, they don't have the spare time nor capacity for hunters. Ah, uh, by the way, just to warn you. Although people were using powered suits during that incident in the slums, it's unwise to think of them as the same kind of power suit I'm talking about here, okay? What I'm talking about are proper powered suits, properly maintained and piloted by real, skilled hunters. I see, that does make sense. That argument was enough to fully convince Akira. But as if they were exchanging positions, this time, it was Kabayashi who suddenly went deep in thought. But well, the situation might change from now on. Not only has Yanagisawa restarted pushing the supply line deeper into Kuzusuhara ruin, it seems that he's also gathering high-ranking hunters to explore the inner part of Kuzusuhara ruin. Other plans that involve large funding to construct infrastructure inside the ruin are also in progress. Some of the hunters who had gone east are returning back. Don't you notice any of this? Now that you mention it, I feel like I've been seeing more and more hunters with outfits that look like swimsuits under their coats. Are you talking about those people? Judging from their fashion sense, there's no mistaking it. Those are the hunters who used to live in the eastern front line. Akira, be careful. As I said before, Kagamayama City is participating in the transport season which means that there will be an influx of hunters. This includes those hunters that I've just mentioned. Some of these hunters will need some time to adapt to the common sense of this city. They might act meek just because hunters who can destroy a vehicle with their bare hands are considered weak from where they come from. If you get in a fight with any of them, you might get yourself killed. Alright, I'll be careful. In response to Kibayashi who gave that warning in his uncharacteristically serious tone, Akira could feel the danger in his words and gave a firm reply, asterisk, asterisk. Asterisk. On the next day, this time, it was Kabayashi who called Akira to come to a meeting. As Akira was waiting for Kabayashi on the first floor of the Kagama building, just before it was time for the meeting, a girl appeared from the inner wall. Akira looked suspiciously at that girl who was walking toward him. She was donning a city management staff's uniform and looked rather mature, compared to the current Akira who had gone through a growth spurt and fixed his physical condition lately, that girl seemed to be around Akira's age. Basically, she was a tad bit too young to be called a full-grown adult but a little bit too old to be called a little girl as well. In short, she was rather too young to be from city management, which was filled with adults. The girl smiled nervously at Akira and gracefully bowed. 
Akira-san, correct? I'm Hikaru, I'm working from the same bureau as Kabayashi. Nice to meet you. Eh, uh, ah, uh, right, ah, uh, where is Kabayashi? I'll be responsible for you for today. Well then, shall we go somewhere else to discuss the main matter for today? Whoa, wait, wait. Akira took out his information terminal and called Kabayashi. It's me, what is it? Don't give me that crap. Where are you now? If you have someone else to come because some sudden business came up, at least leave me a message, will you? Akira then proceeded to explain the situation to Kabayashi. Of course, he was planning to give Kabayashi an earful at the start, but his plan changed after Kabayashi replied with something that he did not expect. So basically, someone else came to the meeting place right on our agreed-upon scheduled time and she gave my name, right? Let me tell you that it was a good move to contact me first instead of just going with her without saying anything. What do you mean? I'm saying that she might be trying to trick you. Akira shot a sharp gaze to Hikaru. Although Hikaru did not understand why he did that, it still sent a shiver to her spine. Whoa, don't get me wrong though. I'm just saying it as a possibility. Hikaru is indeed someone I know. I can at least guarantee that. But I won't guarantee anything past that point. Akira frowned even more. What kind of game are you playing here? I'll just leave if you won't properly tell me what's going on. That in itself is also an option for you. Kicking the deal down the drain because there's no one that you can trust during the negotiation, without receiving any explanation regarding the matter. That is indeed a good move. Although, I won't say that's the correct move in all cases. Akira sighed. Kibayashi, who could hear that sigh from the other side, smiled amusedly. As I warned you in the past, being a hunter who is only good at fighting but not at negotiating will bring you into a lot of trouble. So just use this chance as practice. Let me remind you again, I can only guarantee you that she's someone that I know. You do the rest yourself to confirm her identity, her position, her goals, if she's someone that you can trust or not and if she's someone capable or not. Of course, you can ask me later to try to check your answers, but you should do it yourself first. Later then. Kibayashi ended the call. Alpha smiled at the troubled Akira. So, what's the plan? Are we going to just leave? Well, this is also a kind of training, so I'll at least hear what she has to say. Akira's gaze returned to Hikaru. Although there was no trace of suspicion in that gaze, Hikaru could not help but get nervous. Akira then decided to bring Hikaru to one of the restaurants on the first floor. Hikaru, who was sitting face to face with Akira, politely lowered her head. I've confirmed this matter with Kiyabeshi beforehand, but I apologize if I made a mistake. Ah, uh, don't worry. Well, it's true that I haven't heard about this before, but I don't think it's your fault, Hikaru-san. Thank you very much. Also, there's no need for honorifics, you can just call me Hikaru and please just talk with me casually. It's in order to build trust which is important during negotiations. Being polite and rigid instead of prioritizing the flow of information might cause distrust and miscommunication, which would defeat the main purpose of negotiating. So please, just talk to me casually. Well, although, I do think that Kibayashi's attitude is way too casual. Hikaru smiled wryly which Akira replied with a light smile. All right then, in that case, you can just call me Akira and you can talk to me casually as well. Hikaru looked a bit troubled, in reality, she was actually really troubled. But after a short pause, she decided to take up the offer. All right. Now then, casually, right? It seems that you haven't heard anything from Kibayashi, so, well, where should I start? Hikaru was watching Akira closely to make sure that she did not sour his mood while she kept her casual attitude on the outside. In that case, is it okay if I ask you some questions first? I'm sorry that it might sound a bit too offensive. Of course. You can ask me anything. But just to let you know, 
I'll just say that it's a secret if you ask me about my three sizes or if I have a boyfriend. Well, it's not about that. Hmm, yeah, let's start with, are you really from city management? Oh, that's a bit surprising. The answer is of course a yes. I'm indeed a staff member from city management. To be more precise, I'm from the general division, in fact, I'm the youngest one in that division. What if I ask you for proof? Hikaru's smile immediately turned troubled. But behind that brave front, she was actually squeezing her brain for an answer. Akira was dealing with Hikaru as a training partner. The reason why he could ask such a rude question was simply because he thought of this meeting as training. But Hikaru did not know that at all. Because of that, she took that question as a form of distrust and suspicion from Akira. Will it be enough if I say that Kibayashi was the one who told me to come here? It's because that Kibayashi only testified that he knows you and nothing more, so I have to do the rest myself and try to identify you. Hikaru's smile stiffened, she spat a curse in her mind. That bastard. So basically this is another test or something. That damn sly old man. Hikaru's job that day was to negotiate with Akira and make him accept the deal. It was a kind of test so that Kibayashi could recognize her skill. Negotiating with a high-ranking hunter was an important job for city management staff. Whether it was about gathering relics or participating in the protection of infrastructure, both depended deeply on the result of the negotiation. Of course, negotiation would go smoother the more the negotiator had the trust of those high-ranking hunters. Kibayashi himself gained his position of power by identifying competent hunters, giving them a chance to shoot for success, and maintaining relations with those who had survived their gambit. Although most of those successful hunters had left Kagamayama city to head east, they were still in a contract with him to send invaluable relics or return back to the city in case Kagamayama city was in danger. As such, he had quite the grip on the city even right now. The reason why he could move freely was because not that many people could challenge him due to his connection with those hunters. Naturally, Kibayashi was a busy person. He could not afford to deal with every single hunter by himself. That was why he often had someone under him take over the negotiation in his stead. These negotiators then formed a connection with these hunters as well and gained influence and power the same way Kibayashi did. Hikaru was recognized as a competent staff even though she was the youngest in her current division. She was proud of that fact as well. So, she thought that it would be no trouble for her when she asked for some Kibayashi's work. However, against her expectation, Kibayashi casually rejected that idea saying that she would not be able to handle it. After that, fueled by her ambition and to take revenge on Kibayashi, she took it personally and went around to lay the groundwork. In the end, she managed to force Kibayashi to give her a task with a certain condition attached. Nonetheless, it had to be said that being able to force Kibayashi like this was a testament to how talented she was. Though, that was also the root of the situation that she was facing right now. Hikaru was trying to find out what Kibayashi's real plan was by looking closely at Akira's reaction. So basically he's telling me that I'm not ready for this job if I can't even convince my negotiation opponent about my identity, huh? Fine then, I'll do it then. Hikaru pulled her information terminal on the table and placed her ID card on top of it. The information terminal then showed her full information as a staff member from city management. This is an identification document used by city management staff to show their identity. It also contains staff information controlled by city management. This uniform is only designated for official staff, anyone else who uses this will get a severe punishment. Will this be enough? Hikaru was satisfied with Akira's reaction, seeing him nod as if he was fully convinced. However, Akira thought that since it was a good chance to train himself in case someone was trying to deliberately trick him, he decided to question her further. What if I say that you can fake that document and no one would get suspicious if you use that uniform with confidence? That's a totally valid question, well. In that case, we can go to the hunter office together where I can prove my identity. Akira nodded again, but he did not stop there. 
What if I say that you're working with someone inside the hunter office? Yeah. I think that's going a bit too far. It's impossibly difficult to do that, you know. Well, if it's about an isolated hunter office with not that many visitors, I don't think it's that difficult to do that though. Akira then told Hikaru what happened back then when he registered as a hunter for the first time. Since Hikaru was not that familiar with the situation outside the wall, she was pretty surprised to hear his story. I see, so there's a problem with the quality of the hunter office's staff outside the wall, huh? But we're talking about the past here, right? Ah, but then again, if we're talking about how far someone would go to trick a rank 50 hunter, I can't really say that it's not possible, hmm. Hikaru already noticed that Akira was not trying to harass her by asking her these difficult questions, that was why she answered rather casually. I heard that a lot of good hunters tend to prefer to get the evidence themselves. So how about you, Akira? What will you do in order to convince yourself? Hikaru thought that if Akira only had half-baked methods to do that, she would use it to corner Akira instead as she leaned forward as if to peer into him and unravel his thoughts. In that case, if someone was suspicious of others just for the sake of suspecting them, then there would be no end to it. They would always find a reason to suspect the other party. The real question would be at what point they would no longer be suspicious of each other. Akira understood that very well, that was why his thought leaned toward what kind of compromise he could take in case he indeed got tricked. Seeing that, Alpha smiled smugly at him and asked. How about asking me? That was my first thought, but if I do that and the other party asks me for proof, I can only say that it's from my intuition. So I don't think that's the correct answer in this kind of situation. But if I can't do that myself, then my only choice is to ask someone else who can tell. Akira smiled wryly and finally answered Hikaru's question. I guess I'll ask someone who can do that for me. I see, then, how about you try that now? Hikaru opened her palm forward toward Akira as if she was challenging him to do just that. He thought to himself that he might have gone too far questioning her as he decided to actually try that in order to at least satisfy Hikaru as well. Excluding Kibayashi, there were two candidates that he thought to call. So he opened up his information terminal to call one of those two candidates. The call immediately connected and picked up. It's you, huh? That's rather rare for you to call me. What is it? Someone is claiming to be from city management in front of me right now. If you know a method to quickly discern if she's telling the truth or not, can you tell me? You called me just for that. It was Inabe, the other candidate that Akira thought of was Viola. But after hearing that exasperated reply followed by a sigh, Akira thought that it might have been a bad choice calling Inabe. But Inabe did not close the call although he sounded really annoyed. Wait for a sec then. This one will work, huh? Alright, I've temporarily connected your information terminal and the identification machine over here. Now put her ID card on top of your information terminal. Akira asked Hikaru to do it and the result immediately came out. The result is out. Sakima Hikaru from the General Affair, that's her. Is that good enough? Is it okay if I ask you how you confirmed it? It's based on secret technology, I can only tell you that it's a technology used in order to prevent people from falsifying their hunter ID. I see, that's good enough for me. Thanks. You owe me one, alright? So I'll have you return this favor now. Let's see, go visit Cheryl to cheer her up, and tell her that I helped you. Alright. Also, face the information terminal at her. Akira did just as he was asked, the information terminal display quickly switched to Inabe's face that was glaring daggers at Hikaru. I don't know who you are but stop giving me trouble. Hikaru knew Inabe very well. Although she was surprised, she did not miss a beat to apologize. I I am really sorry. But before Hikaru started apologizing, Inabe already closed the call. What was left behind was an awkward silence. Akira was the first one to break the silence as he was awkwardly said. Ah, uh, sorry. 
Ah, it's fine, don't worry about it. Hikaru tried her best to don a friendly smile, but as expected, it was impossible, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. After finishing her business with Akira, Hikaru stayed behind in the restaurant, eating a parfait. Akira already left the place, so she did not have any reason to put up appearances anymore. She took her sugary replenishment with a tired face and sighed. It was difficult to tell if it was because of the sweets or because of how exhausted she was. I'm beat. But, it at least went well. Right? She was saying that to herself as if to tell herself that although there were unexpected hurdles, her original goal has been achieved. The reason why she had a question mark in the end, was because the incident with Inabe was outside her expectation. Thus, she was not sure if she was able to handle everything perfectly. He must have thought that I was trying to do something bad there. But it was good that Akira was taking the offer positively after that. But still, I didn't expect Akira to have direct contact with someone like Inabe. That Kibayashi. To think that he gave me such a hunter to handle, is he planning to ridicule me if I wasn't able to deal with him well enough? If that's really the case, I'll make him regret it. Akira was a rank 50 hunter who had direct contact with a city management officer. If Hikaru was able to gain his trust and take him away from Kabayashi, it would greatly boost her position. It might serve as a stepping stone for her to soar higher. I'll definitely handle this well. Hikaru carried another spoonful of parfait to her mouth as she got herself pumped up, the burning spirit and the sweets caused her to show a smile that was suitable for a girl of her age. But that excited Hikaru to forget about one thing. Kibayashi loved reckless people and he enjoyed the end of those people, regardless of whether it was death or success. Kibayashi gave Hikaru a chance to gamble, and now, he was looking forward to the results. Rebuild World, Chapter 229, Pruning Request Akira was traversing the wasteland on a vehicle with Sarah and Elena. The vehicle itself was large with a removable top. At the moment it had its top open. Elena was driving in the front while Akira was sitting in the back with Sarah. Elena-san, I'm the one getting helped here with this vehicle, so the least I can do is drive it, you know. Akira sounded rather apologetic, but Elena replied with a smile. Don't worry, it's fine. We're the ones handling the transport. Since we're doing our duty the best we can, I hope that you'll do yours as well, as our main firepower that is. But Sarah interjected there. Elena, I'm also responsible for that too though. Oh, in that case, I hope you perform at least as well as Akira. Whoa, that sounds tough. Good luck. Seeing that friendly exchange between Sarah and Elena, Akira decided not to let himself be bothered by his worries any further. The job that Akira accepted from Hikaru was a request that was connected to the transport season. According to the contract, Akira had to do hunter jobs in his designated area. And this time, that job was to prune the monsters around the transport route. Of course, the large-size transport vehicles used by the cities were accompanied by powerful escorts, but the bigger the vehicle, the more it would rouse the monsters in the area. Each assault from monster swarms meant accumulating delays to the delivery. In order to ensure the transport took the shortest time possible, there was a need to thin out the monster density along the route beforehand. Akira came to do it with his new equipment, but as expected, it was impossible for him to move around all by himself. After all, his new equipment did not include a new vehicle nor a new bike. The offers that came to Shizuka's shop was not limited to Yadagawa's Kiryu Corporation only. Another offer came from a long-established corporation that was trying to expand its business throughout the eastern district, Tosan. As a matter of fact, Tosan was the manufacturer of the SSB multi-rifle. Tosan found it weird that a small shop that should have been only visited by third-rate hunters was ordering expensive products from the corporation repeatedly. Thus, eventually, Tosan decided to send an inspector from the branch office responsible for the area where Shizuka's shop was. As a weapon manufacturing corporation, Yadagawa's company was standing on the same level as Tosan. 
It was not rare for an augmented suit to be sold in a bundle together with guns. So if Tosan offers a huge discount for such a bundle, Kiryu would have to find a way to counter that offer. Thus, it created an intense price war between the two. Because of that, thanks to the generous discount that both companies were offering, Akira ended up deciding to spend all of his money to buy from both Tosan and Kiryu. Unfortunately, neither of them had vehicles to sell. Of course, if Akira had asked them to, they would use their connection to the other corporation that dealt with vehicles. However, as expected, they could not promise any discount for that purchase. Despite the large discount and the excellent cost-performance ratio of his new rifles and augmented suit, it was still a bad move for Akira to even spend his reserve fund, originally meant for purchasing vehicles. Akira knew that it was a bad idea to not have any means of transportation, but he thought that it would be fine since he could ask Sarah and Elena for help. After all, they did tell him to rely on them, or he could just rent a vehicle. So he pushed through with his decision and prioritized his equipment. Unfortunately, at the moment, it was difficult to get a rental vehicle. Among the people who were related to the rental business for hunters, Akira was already widely known as the vehicle-destroying hunter. Thanks to that, the rental fee was extremely high for him. After knowing the cost of renting a single vehicle, Akira thought that it was better to buy one himself and decided to seek help from Elena and Sarah until he could buy his own. Hikaru was giving a direct request to Akira. And that request did not put any constraints on how he would accomplish it, there was no need for Akira to give any explanation before the request, all he needed to do was to give his final report once it was done. In order to guarantee the success of the request, many requesters tend to ask for detailed explanations and make a lot of suggestions as a form of support for the hunters. Of course, in the end, it depended on the hunters whether they would take that support or not. If the final report was not mandatory, it could be taken as the requester abandoning their responsibility. Which in turn would cause distrust between the hunters and the requester. In conclusion, the requester would need to be skilled in offering support, gaining the hunter's trust in order to increase the chance of success. After thinking it through, Hikaru decided to just let Akira do what he wanted to do in the end. Of course, she would have to take responsibility if the request ended up in failure. She did want to meddle, but she did not think that a hunter who was working with Kabayashi would like that. In order to gather likability points from Akira, she decided to hold herself back. Thus, when he was told that he had free reign, Akira took that literally. He was basically doing everything based on his mood. The only thing that bothered him was that Elena and Sarah were basically working under him due to the request. It might be weird for me to say this, although it's because of the request contract, Elena-san and Sarah-san are working under me though, are you really okay with that? Elena chuckled. Why won't we be? It's not just because of the request contract, in truth, you're already above us. So there's no need to worry, you can just take the lead, you know. You uh, even if you tell me so, to be honest, I still want to learn from both of you though. Sarah smiled and joined in. In that case, you can tell us to track the situation and report it to you with a suggestion on how to deal with it, you know. You're basically our employer this time, so let us do our job to the best of our abilities. Sarah then smiled as if to hide her loneliness and continued as if she was trying to convince herself. Although you have surpassed us in many aspects, if you think that we can still help you, there's no need to hold back. You can rely on us. Okay, thank you very much. Akira questioned himself if he was being a bit too considerate and decided to just put that behind for now. He smiled and thanked them. Elena and Sarah responded back with the same cheerful smiles. That was when Elena noticed that they were closing in on their destination. Akira. It's time. It might be a good idea to let them know as well. Ah, uh, you're right. Akira operated his headgear to contact someone else. It's me, we'll arrive soon. Get yourself ready. Roger that. The one who answered that order was Ariel. A large-sized truck was running not too far from Akira's team. 
It was also a vehicle designed for use in the wasteland. It was well equipped for battle as well. The backside of that truck had an operable cover as if it was designed to carry a powered suit. But the cargo that the truck carried was Aereo's team, who were armed with coordination support powered suits. The children reacted differently toward the current request. Some of them were joking and laughing while some were waiting nervously. Some were utterly scared and some were completely calm. I wonder if we're going to be alright. This place is already quite far to the east, right? I heard that the monsters around there are so different compared to the ones around the city, you know. Though there were some anxious children, there were also those who took it completely fine. Don't worry, Akira-san is here too after all. If boss thought that we were useless, she would not have sent us out in the first place, you know. If we're only going to slow Akira-san's down, boss would have stopped us instead. Why you have a point. The anxious boy nodded repeatedly as if he was trying to convince himself. Meanwhile, the calm boy was telling herself that repeatedly as well for the exact same reason. Considering that there was Kiryu's staff were not in the trailer, it gave another reason for them to feel more anxious when they were looking for reasons to be calm. Ariyo's team followed Akira during this request as helpers. Both Viola and Kiryu received information regarding Akira's request separately, but both of them then came to Cheryl to suggest she join that request. Cheryl wanted to be useful to Akira. Kiryu wanted to get a good track record for their support system. While Viola wanted to get profit from that request as well as to enjoy some other things as well. With all of these reasons lined up, Cheryl's gang also joined in the pruning request. They took it in the form of a reinforcement request from Akira. Don't worry, I heard that Akira-san is rank 50 while the other two are already past rank 40. They'll be the vanguards. We're not the main firepower this time. We can just fight safely while looking for chances to help out and get some money. In the case of an emergency, we can withdraw further and focus on providing support. Our role only amounts that much this time. You're right, yeah. As they calmed down, their conversation started to steer toward idle talk. It showed that they were already feeling safe as they talked about the things around them instead. But still, the other two that Akira brought with him today are both really beautiful. Sarah has impressive boing boing, while Elena has an excellent body line. I thought that he's not interested in that kind of thing since he's going out with boss, but I guess that's not exactly the case, huh? Isn't it the opposite? It's because he doesn't care about such a thing that he's okay with any sizes, it must be nice to be in his position. Laughter started to spread, it just went to show how many agreed with that statement. Naturally, some of them took it as a joke while some were extremely envious of Akira. By the way, just a thought though, I wonder if boss knows that Akira is bringing those two with him on this job. Maybe not, I guess. Well, either way, even if boss doesn't know, it's not like we can just tell her. It'll only sour her mood, you know. Yeah, you can say that again. The others around them smiled bitterly and nodded in agreement, this time, all of them had the exact same thought. In the middle of their idle chat, Ario suddenly lightly clapped his hands to gather their attention. Akira-san just called me. We're already close, so get yourself ready. Make sure to check that the coordination support system is active after you turn on your augmented suit. Make sure to double check, it's basically our lifeline out here. Everyone started their preparation accordingly since they already decided beforehand who would be the leaders during the request. Thanks to all the training that they had done beforehand, their preparation proceeded smoothly and ended up without any trouble. Their moves there were no longer that of children from the slums. But the fact that they still had the chance to have such silly conversation to calm themselves down showed that they were still amateurs. This time, their silly banter was directed at Ario. But still. Even with boss, those maids, Viola-san and Carol-san, along with those two hunters that are with him right now, even with all of these girls, it doesn't seem that Akira-san has any trouble dealing with them. Even you, Ario. You stick out among us and have something similar as well. As I thought, 
when you have a girl, it really pushes you to become stronger, right? Or is it because you get stronger that girls are attracted to you? Which one do you think it is? Just so you know, I'm devoted only to Alicia. It's not really that different, I know that some girls are trying to approach you, you know. The boy was smiling mischievously when he said that, but Ariel glared at that boy and warned. Stop it. I'm not the same. I properly turned them down. It might be because of those rumors that Alicia is getting worried lately. It was tough calming her down, you know. Unfortunately, we can't understand the hardship of a popular guy. As that boy looked around, the other kids nodded in agreement. Although some of them also had a girlfriend like Ariel, they were not that popular so they had the right to agree with that statement. In reality, Ariel really did not have the luxury to brag about his situation, so instead, he replied with a rather snarky remark. Humph, if you're really in a hurry, you can just ask Carol, you know. Suddenly everyone fell into silence, Ariel immediately realized that he said something that he should not have and froze for a second. I take that back, uh, what can I say, never do that, okay? Carol was a beautiful girl with an excellent body. Most of her outfits were tailored to men's preferences. She was someone who was easy to get along with and she knew how to get a conversation exciting. She listens when someone looks for advice and would give great advice. To top it off, for her side job, she would even take little to nothing as long as it was the money that her clients got from risking their lives. Though, this offer mostly extended to first-timers. Naturally, there were some who could not hold themselves back. They got too close to Carol during their joint activities in the gang and ignored Colbert's warning. Although the first go was cheap, the price quickly climbed up for the next time and subsequent times after as well. But even so, they could not forget that so-called heaven on earth and continued. Eventually, they started going out hunting for relics all by themselves. They worked hard past their limits to earn enough to somehow manage to continue. But of course, it was only a matter of time before everything spiraled out of control. Eventually, they could no longer earn enough money. If they were able to hold themselves back because they did not have enough money, then Colbert's warning would have been unnecessary. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Victims started to pile up as they got themselves killed out in the ruins. Some even went as far as to steal money from the gang, which Viola quickly noticed and gave their names to the gang. Even after hearing that, Carol did not change her attitude at all. Cheryl herself was troubled that more and more boys were falling for Carol just to meet their demise. She did make a contract with Carol though. It was so that she would not take the initiative and would not accept those who already had a girlfriend. But that was the furthest she could do. This was mainly because Carol threatened that if Cheryl put even stricter rules, then she would go for Akira instead. Thus, Cheryl had no other choice but to back off. After all that happened, Carol was well known to be a dangerous honey trap inside Cheryl's gang. You don't have to tell us that. We know well what happened to those who ignored Colbert Sand's warning, right guys? He tried to mix a joke in his reply to lighten the mood and looked around to see if the others agreed. Of course, the other kids agreed with him. But among them, there were some who had a stiff awkward smile when they nodded. Ario noticed a message from the coordination support system, so he changed gear and shouted. We've arrived. Let's go. Get to your post. The trailer's side door opened up. Everyone pulled themselves together to get ready for work as they followed the command from the coordination support system. They got to their post and readied their grenade launchers. Not too far from the trailer, there were two other vehicles. One of them was Colbert and his team. They also participated in the current request. But their employer was not Akira, it was Cheryl instead in a form of a proxy contract with Akira. Boss Xu, who was there thanks to Colbert's invitation, chuckled and said. But still, to think that lone hunter we met back then would turn into a rank 50 hunter. And now, we get to participate in the great transport season through him. Colbert, I bet your real aim in helping that gang is to make a connection with that boy. 
Nah, it's totally a coincidence. Is that so? We're talking about you here. Considering your connection with that witch, I thought that this was your real goal. But that aside, it's pretty amazing how you can get along with her. Although Viola and Carol are not the same, both often lead hunters to their demise, you know. Don't you think you should keep your distance from them? You just need to be extra careful with them. Both can bring you profit if you're smart enough, you know. Well, although, I'm basically just trying to get by while taking a break from my original hunter job. But just because I can do so doesn't mean that you should do it too. It won't be pretty if you make a mistake. Colbert said so while smiling bitterly. He thought of someone he knew who made a mistake dealing with those two women. Peppa was also there from Colbert's invitation, just like Boss Shu, he laughed mockingly and spoke to Colbert. The one having it hard is you who is taking a hiatus, you know. It's good that you're slowly returning back to your origins as a hunter, but isn't it too much for your rusty skills to face the monsters around this area? Colbert gave a smug smile and replied. Oh, what was that? Don't tell me that you're too scared and want to go back home now. Don't worry, you can use the excuse that I got too scared so you have no other choice but to retreat when the push comes to shove. Also, even if my skill got rusty after only taking easy jobs since I'm on a break, I'll do something about it. Just like how the past me used to save your asses. Ha! It's funny how you can still run your mouth like that. Seeing Colbert and Peppa exchanging jokes like that, Boss Shu could not help but smile remembering their past. In contrast to his casual attitude, Colbert actually understood that he could not take it easy. He knew that the difficulty of the request was already well above what he could handle. As expected, he could not fight side by side evenly with a rank 50 hunter. If the request from Cheryl did not specify that he would only need to provide support fire, he would never have accepted the request. But even so, that request was a good chance for him to rehabilitate himself so that he could slowly return back to working as a hunter. Up until now, he pushed himself to fight back against his trauma to get out to the wasteland. He would often use the excuse, I was just doing this to accompany Ariel and the other children. During that time, he encountered multiple monsters that looked like the one that took his limbs and almost killed him. Even so, he still forced himself to fight against those monsters and slowly treated his trauma. When today's request came, he decided that it was his time to fully let go of his past and move forward. If he could keep his calm even when fighting against monsters that were way above what he could handle alone, then there would be no longer any need to get scared of that weak monster which had almost killed him in the past. He stepped out into the wasteland with that thought in mind that day. He used all the money that he had been slowly saving up when this day came. He got the best equipment that he could get, thanks to that, he would not even be able to return back to his past lifestyle if he could not earn enough from today's request. Even so, he did not regret his decision at all. Talking with his past teammates like this helped him to regain his past sense of self, calming himself down for the incoming challenge, as well as pumping him up. While the other vehicle was Levin and Hazawa. In contrast to Colbert's team that was filled with light-hearted exchanges, the mood in Levin's team was heavy. After all, they were heading east where the monsters were stronger and scarier than usual. The source of the heavy mood was Levin. He kept sighing even as of right now. Hazawa, who had been listening to him this whole time, eventually had enough and spoke up. Levin. I know it's my fault for reminding you, but you should shake that off right now. Otherwise, you won't be able to fight properly. I know. Although Levin felt slightly angry, he knew that Hazawa was right. Of course, it was not enough to get his mind out of its predicament, but it was enough to help him try to shift his focus off from that thought. Regardless of the reason, it doesn't change the fact that you managed to get yourself good equipment. Heck. It's good enough that it would have been difficult to get through normal means. So just focus on earning more with those weapons of yours. It would be stupid to keep dragging yourself down and miss this chance to earn money, you know. I know, alright. The moment he tried to calm himself down, 
he was reminded of how bad his situation actually was. Thus, Levin could not help but inadvertently roar out. After working long and hard under Katsuragi to pay back his debt, he finally was able to get out of that life. Though, his debts have not been fully paid off yet. He had to go to the ruins and return back with relics. He had to return back alive from these dangerous ruins and to do that, he would need to use up expendables. Each use cost him and when it was not enough, he knew had to get better equipment to safeguard his life and get better relics next time. Nonetheless, his cost usually exceeded what he could gain from the relics. Due to this, each time he was sent out, instead of reducing his debt, it was only piling up. But even so, his rank was increasing. Thanks to the debt, he did not have the money to spend on drinks, or women, or gambling. So the time that he used to use for leisure in the past shifted to work instead. With each expedition that he survived through, he returned back with better relics, which also slowly increased his hunter rank. That was when Katsuragi recommended him a set of equipment to match Levin's hunter rank. This was when he had just a little of his debt left, in proportion to what he earns from a single expedition. It would have been all for naught if he died after raising his rank that high. Moreover, he should be able to pay it back considering his earnings at the moment. In the first place, it would be stupid to die just because he did not have decent enough equipment after all that he had gone through. Levin's cautious nature pushed him to take up the offer even if he had to increase his debt even for a bit and hoped that he would earn enough to clear away his debt. If Levin were to be frugal with his expendables for the sake of repaying his debt, he would take more time to fight against monsters. This would lead to a higher chance of getting injured, which in turn would mean he would have to rely on expensive medicines. So in the end, it would only end up increasing his debt instead. While on the other hand, splurging money on ammo for the sake of safety would be directly translated to more debt. He also could not go to a safe ruin. This was due to his contract with Katsuragi, which stated that the ruins he could go to were under the discretion of Katsuragi. Levin himself knew that he had grown as a hunter. But he also understood that his debt was only growing bigger. If he does not do anything fast, it would be really bad for him. As he was agonizing over his choices, he went for some cheap drinks, got into some fights, and by pure chance, he met and consulted Viola, who was nearby at that time. Viola happily suggested a way out for him. It was to join all the debts from various companies into one place, moreover, they were concentrated on a single legitimate loan company. The interest was close to zero, which made the company seem like it was Levin's sponsor. Thus, Levin was no longer controlled by Katsuragi and was able to get better equipment through the connections owned by that company. And then, finally, Levin's debt went past 300 million. It was the culmination of Viola's payment and the more debt from his new equipment. That sponsor corporation was Kiryu and the new equipment was actually experimental products. Basically, he was participating in the pruning request for the sake of weapon testing. My debt with Kiryu doesn't have that strange rule like the one with Katsuragi. If the amount of debt passes a fixed limit, they will also give me some compromise to make sure that I would be able to repay all my debt. Kiryu itself will also cooperate in order to get good advertisement material for their products. If they can leave a good track record during the weapon testing, it should also increase my worth as a hunter and increase my hunter rank. Considering all of these benefits, that 300 million orum is not really that bad. Or more like, it can be taken as some kind of investment from Kiryu to me. I know that, I know that but. Levin was once again reminded. Viola never lies in order to manipulate someone, but after a few days, he started to feel anxious. And finally, that day, after Hazawa asked him where he got all of his high-quality equipment from, Levin was reminded that Viola's help never came for free, it always had some kind of string attached. Kiryu itself was a decent and honest company, compared to other individual lenders such as Katsuragi, it was obviously a better choice to borrow money from them. Levin had no complaint regarding the matter. But still, 300 million orum was not a small amount. Each corporation had different ways to collect their loans depending on their size. 
or at least, they would always have a connection to certain debt collectors. If it was a debt collector sent by individual lenders like Katsuragi, he at least would have a chance to fight back. However, that was not the case when it was against a large corporation like Kiryu. At the moment, he was given special treatment since he was helping out with the weapon testing. However if he could not deliver good results during the testing or if the corporation decided that he was useless during the testing, he would lose that special treatment. That would be the moment when Kiryu's debt collector would come for him. That would also mark his end. What awaited him after that was the same thing that happened to those that attacked Cheryl's base the other day. He would have preferred death instead of having to go through that fate. After Hazawa pointed that out, Levin finally realized just how dire his situation actually was. If he could not perform well in today's weapon testing, it would end up really bad for him and that possibility sent a shiver down his spine. Hazawa tried to calm Levin down for the sake of his own safety as well. Your new equipment has that coordination support system, right? It's a support system that includes augmented suits maneuvering support. It's the same system that those brats are using. Right? Yeah. I heard it's a version of that system with some extra adjustments. After all, unlike those who are working in a huge team, I'm working alone. I think it's to create a system where you can join the other already working network under the same system when it's needed. Considering that there are hunters further to the east who prefer to work solo. They developed this new option to attract them, and they also mentioned many other features as well. It's good enough to turn those brats who were moving like amateurs not too long ago to be decent enough to bring out for this request. I'm sure it'll work like magic for an experienced hunter like you. Especially since you have gotten a lot stronger as a hunter recently. So I'm looking forward to your performance. Yeah, you have a point. I paid a lot of money for this, so it must be at least be that good. Levin knew that Hazawa was trying to calm him down by saying that, but since it did help him lessen his anxiety, he decided to just accept it and use it to get himself more fired up. But still, I didn't expect someone as cautious as you to come as well. No, wait, it might be because I'm too anxious that I assume it's more dangerous than it actually is, huh? Well, it's up to you how you want to take it. Seeing how casually Hazawa responded, helped Levin to calm down as well. But Hazawa was only trying to look calm. Moreover, remembering his first time meeting with the source of the main true requester, Akira, really made him feel conflicted. Although we were riding in the same truck not too long ago, to think that we're already this different in such a short span of time. It's a matter of talent, huh? Or maybe it's a matter of how many times we challenge dangerous situations. Though, I don't think that's all there is to it. It was a mix of envy and jealousy toward someone who overtook everything that he had worked hard to achieve. Constant victories over the life-betting gambles was an obvious route to reach glory. Although he had given up in the past, it seemed that he still had some admiration, or even hope, to reach that glory. Being cautious was nothing more than an excuse to be a coward. He had fallen from grace compared to his past self. He thought that he did well dragging himself out of that hole. Although he was able to reduce the times when he hid behind the word caution, he still could not return back to those hunters' activities that proactively chase for greater glory. But as of late, there were way too many big incidents around Kagamayama City. Many hunters died in those incidents. Half-baked caution would only lead to death. Being overly cautious would mean that he would not even be able to go out of the city. When he was agonizing about what he should do, Colbert suddenly came to him with today's request. I've started to change ever since I met him, this must be some kind of fate, I just have to keep moving forward. He could not afford to get back to his past self that had nothing to chase after. Hazawa decided so as he took a step forward. When they noticed that Ariel and the other children started to move out, they changed gear and said with a big smile. Levin, here we go. Yeah. Let's do this. Levin tried to fire himself up by saying so as he pulled out the large-sized gun that he saved for that day. If he could not earn enough today, then there would be no tomorrow for him. 
That thought filled his mind as he had a grim look on his face and fought with the ferocity of a cornered man. Rebuild World, Chapter 230, Change in Akira Old world cities were spread across the wide wasteland. Most of them were not dilapidated enough to be called ruins, so hunters tend not to visit those places when they hunt for relics. Thanks to that, monsters could freely multiply in those places. Usually, even if they were not close to the transport route, people still take the safer approach. They would keep their distance away from these places in order to avoid getting detected by the monsters there. In the first place, the infrastructure for the transport routes was made to avoid them. However, issues arise during the transport season. The ruckus that the large transport vehicles made would attract swarms of monsters from these old world cities. Once they arrived at their destination, from the open door of the trailer, Ariel and the other children started throwing out devices to attract the monsters' attention. They needed at least that many decoy devices to imitate the signals that those large transport vehicles would produce. The decoy devices would produce noise and vibration as well as scents and fake signals to lure the monsters. Some of them were stuck in the ground while some floated above as they were spread throughout the area. Not too long after, Elena's radar detected uncountable monster signals. It was then followed by a large trail of dust and shaking that even the hunters from afar could feel. Akira, here they come. All right. Elena San. Get closer first and try to keep your distance from them. As for the rest, I'll leave the smaller details to you. Roger that. Elena pushed the gas and turned the vehicle toward the direction of the incoming monsters. Akira in the back seat had both of his hands armed with rifles as he measured the distance between them. Sarah San. I'll focus on the smaller ones, so please focus on the bigger ones. But that's only for the opening, as for the rest, you're free to move at your own discretion. Okay. Now then, since we both are the main firepower here, let's do our best. Of course. Sarah smiled excitedly at Akira and he responded with the same smile. They then aimed their rifles toward the monsters and pulled the trigger. Explosions rang out from the raining warheads. This signaled the start of the battle as well as a slaughter fest of monsters, turned into minced meat. It was Akira's debut fight with his new equipment. This time. He was using a CA-31R augmented suit made by Kiryu. Its official name was Cerberus. It had many extension ports over its jet black body due to the multi-purpose function of its design. Although the headpiece of the augmented suit seems flimsy, it was actually equipped with force field armor, thus as a defensive piece of equipment, it was stronger than the usual full-face helmet. It was even further equipped with many other functions such as displays and other extensions as well. It could also be connected to particular types of gun so that both armor and weapon could work together when Akira took his aim. Meanwhile, there was display technology in place which could display information in 3D if needed. It even allows Akira to float in the air. Though, he did not have it on at the moment. Instead, Akira had a balance support device installed to help him move around even on soft ground. And if he wanted to, it could even help him move above water surfaces in exchange for exorbitant amounts of energy. Even as a pure augmented suit whose main objective was to augment the physical power of its user, it performs extremely well. With the powerful full-body force field armor, he could even flip over a powered suit if he pushed the output of the augmented suit. To top it off, it was also equipped with a camouflage function. The guns on both of his hands were LEO multi-rifle. They were basically stronger versions of the SSB multi-rifle. Akira made sure to put extended magazines and energy packs to his two large-sized rifles. The bullets he was using were designed to absorb energy from the surroundings and turn them into kinetic energy, as such, the more energy used to shoot, the stronger the shot got. Akira aimed both of his Elio rifles at the swarming monsters. His vision was greatly enhanced with the help of information-gathering devices. It even added a bullseye indicator of where his LEO rifles were aimed. He kept the trigger pulled down as he made a sweeping motion as if to sweep through the swarm. 
Although it looked like an indiscriminate shooting from the outside, the bullets were actually only released when the hit probability was above a certain threshold. With each shot guaranteed to a certain level of accuracy, they accurately plowed through the incoming monsters. Moreover, any missed shot was quickly accounted for. The data was then used to readjust the aim for the next shot, thus slowly increasing or maintaining Akira's accuracy. Moreover, Akira actively checked the dead monsters. He would readjust the output power of the bullets using his headgear to get it barely strong enough to kill the monsters. This way, his shots would guarantee a kill while making sure that he was not wasting any unnecessary energy. Coupled with the high accuracy shots, the bullets tore through the swarm like ravenous locusts, leaving only a field of dead monsters behind. Both his augmented suit and rifles were already well past what was considered normal for hunters in Kagamayama City. Elena and Sarah too had updated their arsenals compared to before. Unlike Akira, who did not earn a single orum from the large-scale expedition, Elena and Sarah were properly paid. They were paid as emergency reinforcement, the data that they gathered afterwards during the chaos, plus the reward for escorting Nelia back to the base. And of course, they did not go with Nelia afterwards to look for Akira for free. The combinations of all these rewards resulted in a good sum of money. Furthermore, they managed to get a good discount through the deal that Akira made with Tosan and Kiryu. Considering that if Akira's close friends were loyal customers of a certain company, then it would be easier to get Akira himself to buy from that particular company, plus by making a contract that their next set of equipment would be also from the same company, they managed to get discounts from those two companies although not as much as Akira. They then decided to splurge half of the money that they received from the expedition to upgrade their equipment. Thanks to that, they were able to get powerful augmented suits complete with so-called old world design. Although the design was a bit too much, they decided to put up with it considering the quality of the equipment. In contrast to that, Akira, who was carrying Nelia half the time, did not get paid at all for that. It was something that he did voluntarily when he was busy with Anabe's request, it could even be said that he abandoned Anabe's request to help out Nelia. Thus, it was not easy for Inabe and city management side to reward him for that. But as a compromise, it seemed that Inabe helped Akira to procure equipment through his connections. Akira's firepower with his new equipment was no joke. The swarm was obliterated one by one. Although the common monsters around Kagamayama city would not even stand a chance against them, in front of Akira, they were nothing but small fries. Both the colossal beasts and the armor-covered robots were indiscriminately devoured by the explosions and shredded to pieces. Although they had the upper hand, Akira's team still could not call it an easy fight. The decoys lured in a continuous flow of monsters leagues above those that they were used to fighting against around Kagamayama City. As expected, they could not face all of them on their own. The monsters that Akira's team missed fell to Ario's team and Colbert's team to deal with. Of course, these monsters were extremely powerful from their point of view. They were desperately trying their best to fight back. The monsters, which took a detour from the annihilation circle with Akira's team at the center, were rained down with explosives by Ario's team from the trailer. Don't stop shooting. And don't mistake your target. Keep following the order of priority. Just because Akira-san's team prioritizes taking out monsters with a long-range weapon, that doesn't mean that we can take it easy. Focus first on the monsters indicated in the coordination support system. The coordination support system focused the firepower on the monsters with guns and cannons. Although shooting from a moving vehicle lowered their accuracy, they dealt with that by praying over the whole monsters instead of aiming for their individual cannons or rifles. The trailer was protected by portable walls equipped with force field armor, the portable wall was made of plastic-like transparent material which did not impede vision. Aerio's team were shooting through the gap of these force field walls. Some of the monsters that slipped through the barrage shot back at the trailer. The bullets hit the force field armor, their kinetic energy was converted to a blinding light that soaked the area. Although no one was injured, the force field provided no defense against the terror and the shock they felt. Replace the wall quickly. 
they won't be able to take another shot. Hurry up. They quickly went to grab another portable wall, placed them behind the hit wall and pushed them forward. The old portable wall slid over and fell off the trailer. Seeing that, another boy bitterly smiled and shouted to hide his fear. We're doing something crazy, aren't we? This thing costs one million orem each, right? And we're just throwing them out like this, you know. The other boy shouted back excitedly. I heard that these are from Kiryu and it was cheaper since we bought them in bulk. But if you say so, even the bullets that we're using actually cost one or two million orem per shot if we buy them ourselves, you know. That's wicked. It's as if we're throwing away money. The bullets are cheaper since Akira-san has a special discount only for high-ranking hunters, or so I heard. Even that 5 million orem per shot anti-force field armor bullet only costs 500 orem for him. The heck? That's even crazier. I feel like we can get a lot of money if we hide just a single bullet and sell it ourselves later. Pretty sure Akira-san would slaughter you if you do that. Do you seriously still want to do that? Like hell if I would. That's basically a death sentence you know. The reason they could just laugh it off was because both of them were just joking and had no wish to try that at all. It was not about being an honest person. Stealing anything would mean mocking Akira and Cheryl. One thing for sure, it would not end pretty. That was why none of them even thought of trying to do that. They said that we'll get paid based on how many monsters that we kill, so let's just focus on them and earn more. It's not like we can get an opportunity like this every day. Let's earn as much as we can while we still have the chance. You're right. Let's go back home with more than we can swim in. They were fighting the fear of the incoming swarm through their fighting spirit and greed. That was the only way they could let go of their anxiety. By the way, Colbert-san and the others don't have this support system too, right? Yep. The reason why Kiryu is sponsoring us is simply because it would leave a bad track record if we get killed here. But still, they have killed more monsters than us, right? Although we have more people here and our equipment are not that different in term of quality. Well, I bet it's a matter of skill. It's true that we're stronger than before but just look at Akira-san. There's always a bigger fish. The hunter world was not that naive, equipment would not be able to compensate for everything. But at least it would give them enough of a chance to fight back and survive. The children were reminded of the harsh world of hunters, the gap between them and the other proper hunters as they fought desperately. As for Colbert's team, they brought in equipment that would be enough to hunt bounty monsters. But it was difficult to use such powerful weapons at such close range. But it still did not change the fact that they could be used to kill monsters. Seeing Colbert shooting the monsters with such excitement, Bashu and Peppa could not help but smile happily. Although he was facing monsters that were clearly more ferocious than the one that almost killed him. Well well well, you're doing pretty well for someone who just recovered from his trauma. There's no need to be that desperate, right? Colbert replied to that light jab from Peppa with another light jab. That doesn't sound convincing at all coming from someone with a lesser kill count than me. Ah, uh, don't worry, as I said, I will do something about it even if your skills get rusty, yeah. Yeah yeah, just let the dog bark. Just watch, I'll overtake your number in no time. That was when Boss Shu interjected. By the way, Colbert. Levin has quite a powerful rifle. At the moment, he has killed the most. If I'm not mistaken, he has a huge debt, right? So how did he get that weapon? I'm seriously getting interested in all your connections, you know. Colbert smiled bitterly. I don't really recommend doing the same thing he did. He basically mishandled Viola. I don't know all the details, but it seems like he has ended up 300 million orem in debt. That is in exchange for his equipment. Peppa who was listening closely could not help but to raise his eyebrows. 300 million. The lender is Kiryu. I heard that he's doing a job for that company, you see. After all, 
There are many ways to collect debt from a hunter who can't pay it back with money. It's 300 million we're talking about here. Whatever fate awaits him if he can't pay back, it won't be pretty. Peppa, if you're interested, I can still go ask Viola, you know. Colbert smiled provokingly. But as expected, Peppa would never dare take up that challenge. Ah, uh, no thanks. Thought so. Well, although I said 300 million, I'm sure someone as strong as Akira would not have any trouble paying that back. Colbert glanced at the radar. Although monsters were flowing endlessly from the edge of the radar, half of them vanished the moment they entered Akira's range of fire, creating a circle sterile of any monsters with Akira's team in the center. This is the power of rank 50 and 40 hunters, huh? They are no joke at all. Colbert could only swallow his pride, there was not even a shred of envy. He then returned his focus back to his own battlefield as he fought together with his team against the incoming swarm. Elena continuously scanned for the location of the monsters while driving. Thanks to that, she was able to reposition the vehicle to advantageous locations while evading barrages from the enemies. Explosions shook the ground and threw the vehicle off balance. The shaking was too intense even for the advanced balancer attached to a wasteland vehicle. Forget shooting back, normally, it would have been impossible to stand in that kind of situation. But even so, Sarah was accurately shooting back with long-range weapons using her large and heavy gun. The bullets pierced through rows of monsters as they sought their main target, leaving behind carcasses that were blasted to small pieces. It was a feat that would have been impossible without adequate skill and equipment. Of course, it was not something that someone as strong as Sarah alone could do, it was thanks to the perfect synchronized teamwork between her and Elena. Elena's skilled driving always put Sarah in an advantageous position while Sarah always kept the route that Elena would take clean of any monsters. This made it easier for Elena to reposition the vehicle. They did not even need to exchange words, the experience that they had from working together for years allowed them to understand each other without saying anything, allowing them to work efficiently as if a single cohesive unit. Elena and Sarah understood that very well, that was why they were amazed that Akira could adapt to their teamwork with no problem at all. Sarah smiled as she glanced at Akira and complimented. Akira, as I thought, you've really become strong. Well, I splurged all my money for my new equipment, after all. It would be all in vain if I only stayed as strong as before. Akira's augmented suit was equipped with extensions to keep his feet on the ground as well as to keep his balance. These two extensions were no doubt helping him tremendously in taking aim, even when the vehicle was shaking intensely. Not to mention, both his rifles and the ammo that he was using were stronger than before. All of these factors helped him annihilate the monsters in front of him. Naturally, it still required a skilled user to pull off what he did. It's already amazing enough that you've mastered using your new equipment, you know. Since you're that strong, it's okay to say that you're amazing yourself from time to time, you know. As Sarah said that, she remembered the past Akira, who always looked down on his own strength. She thought she might have said something that she should not have. But against her expectation, Akira did not seem offended at all, he instead replied with a smile. Considering that I still want to get stronger, would have to say that I still have a long way to go. Although Sarah did not expect him to reply in such a manner, she thought that it was a good change encountered with her banter. Elena. Akira is saying that we lack ambition to get stronger. Eh. No no no. I didn't mean that at all. Seeing Akira flusteredly tried to deny it but Elena smiled mischievously and continued. He said that. Well, it can't be helped then. I guess we should work harder to satisfy this rank 50 hunter. Sarah. I'll go faster. Roger that. Elena accelerated the vehicle even more. She started aiming to take down the monsters that she originally planned to leave to the other teams. Their position changed from holding back the incoming swarm to actively chasing after the swarm. She dialed up the machine gun that she was set to be on low, believing that they could just leave the small fries to Akira. 
Sarah also responded accordingly by increasing her firing rate. Akira glanced at Sarah and Elena, who seemed to be having a good time there and smiled wryly. Nonetheless, he then also started firing more intensely as if not to lose to them. Although it seems like he was randomly sweeping around with the two LEO rifles in hand, he was actually trying to aim as accurately as possible. More than half of the bullets accurately hit their targets due to the aim adjustment function of his augmented suit and aiming device as well as Akira's own compressed time perception. Akira. Although you are only doing it slightly, you're basically maintaining your time compression at all times, are you okay? I'm fine. For some reason, I don't feel much burden from doing time compressions ever since that expedition. I wonder if I got used to it after I forced myself to use it for an extended period of time back then. I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons. Are there other reasons as well? It's not like you're doing something with your support to lighten my burden without me knowing, right? Yep, there are multiple reasons for that. Of course, your body is getting used to it after using it so many times both for real fights and in training, you might have figured out the ropes. But with that being said, it's not okay to think that you can get even stronger by doing reckless things when you lose my support, okay? I know. It's not like I want to go into a fight without your support. Having you around is a huge help, you know. Is that so? Thanks. But still, since you have me around, how about I change my outfit to something more extravagant, with more exposure that will make a more refreshing impression. Thanks, but no thanks. Good grief, you won't even pay attention to my beauty, huh? That part of you doesn't change at all. Alpha then smiled at him who even had the leeway to indulge her in silly banter even when he was in the middle of a battle. In reality, the main reason why Akira's time compression did not place much burden on him ever since the large-scale expedition laid elsewhere. It was the drug that Tsubaki gave him. Akira, who took that drug, was healed back under the old world standard, which meant that it also fixed something in his brain. The prolonged use of time compression would strain Akira's brain, which eventually resulted in damages. The drug that he took healed that damage as well as assimilated into the damaged part and strengthened it so that it would be able to withstand more strain. Moreover, the drug even healed Akira's imperfection as someone who could connect to the old world domain. Due to this, the security portion of Akira's brain was rewritten and upgraded, but as a side effect, it limited Alpha's connection to Akira. Since the drug basically cut off Alpha's complete one-sided control on Akira's bandwidth, it left a noticeable effect on Akira. Even if the subject gave permission to use all of his connections, rules placed constraints that made it impossible to do that in one go. When Alpha met Akira for the first time, she used excuses such as, that he was too weak and such an act was necessary for the sake of preserving his life. Therefore, she was able to gain permission to establish a strong connection with Akira. She then used that as a way to wrestle more and more rights over time. This was the reason why she was able to monopolize Akira's bandwidth. But with the repaired security feature and how Akira was able to perform extremely well even without her support, Alpha no longer had those rights anymore. This was not a complete coincidence. Half of it was due to Tsubaki's scheme. She originally planned to prepare Akira, such that she could connect to him if he had accepted her offer back then. While the other half was simply Tsubaki harassing Alpha. With this, Alpha had to readjust her plan. She had to wait until she recovered her monopoly on Akira's bandwidth before she could bring him to a certain ruin. Alpha was especially worried that there would be more unexpected turn of events regarding Akira. After all, unexpected meant that she could not control it. So in order to regain her control over Akira, she was observing Akira closely. After that, the fired-up Akira team made short work of the remaining swarm. Once they finished pruning the monsters around the area, Ario's team and Colbert's team moved on to their other job. They scourged the ruin for relics. Although there were still some valuable relics left in that ruin, most hunters thought that it was not worth the trouble gathering them due to the powerful monsters living in the area. But after the pruning, 
the monster density in the area was greatly reduced though only for a short time. With more than half of the monsters in the area dead, they were free to gather relics left in the ruin. It was ingrained in the hunter's blood to monopolize such a sweet opportunity. Thanks to that, Ario's team and Colbert's team were in high spirits. While the others were doing that, Akira, Elena, and Sarah were taking a break in their vehicle. That was when Elena threw a question to Akira. Akira, you're not going to look for relics. I'm here to prune monsters, so I have no plan to hunt for relics. I'm also already spent too. Ah, it's okay if Elena-san and Sarah-san want to go hunting for relics, you know. I can watch the radar for enemies while you two go look for relics. Hmm, if you're not going, then I won't go too. We're here as your hires today after all, so we have to respect your opinion. Akira looked a bit surprised and sent a questioning glance to Sarah. Which, she responded with a light smile. If we're talking about duties, our job here is to be your support. That's why our job at the moment is to stay near you. I don't think it's a good thing to criticize someone when they're taking their job seriously, you know. I see, that's true. All right, in that case, I guess we'll be taking a break here then. Seeing the happy Akira, Elena and Sarah also smiled happily. As they were wasting time talking to each other, the radar suddenly picked up some signals. When Elena checked it, she frowned. Judging from the signal, it's a monster, although it's alone, it seems to be a rather big one. Is it here because of the decoy device? Not sure. But I think it came pretty late if that is really the case. When they were discussing how to handle that monster, Alpha suddenly interjected. Akira, it would be a pain in the neck if it gets any closer. So let's take it out while we have the chance using that thing on your back. Is that so? All right then. Akira then told Elena and Sarah his plan and took some distance from the vehicle before expanding the foldable large-sized gun that Akira was carrying on his back. As the cannon unfolded, it peeked out from Akira's back, past his shoulder. Akira used both of his hands to hold the cannon and aligned his aim with his target. After Akira fixed his aim with the support of Alpha, he then let Alpha take control of both his cannon and augmented suit. Its aiming device worked together with Akira's information gathering device, allowing Akira to zoom in on his target in his headgear's display which showed the range, trajectory, and lock-on notices. The target was an abnormally huge mechanical monster, it was about 10 meters tall and its body was enveloped with resilient-looking armor. Countless legs were fixed on the huge cannon that grew out from its body. Although it was classified as a multi-legged tank, its shape was closer to that of a mollusk. Its outer appearance was far from the tanks that the hunters used as well as the security drones of the Old World ruins. Seeing that monster slowly crawling towards him, Akira frowned and said. That thing, it looks like a squid, or an octopus, no. It's true that its shape indeed imitates that kind of animal. That kind of monster basically comes from old world factories right? Just like those insect cannons, right? I wonder why they make monsters in that shape. I have no idea. Someone might have sent in faulty designs in order to render them useless. If someone sends in a huge amount of unrelated data while the system is updating its blueprint, it might corrupt the blueprint. Once they accomplish their goal, operational systems might use its advanced self-repairing function to fix the blueprint based on data it compiled. Since everything is a variable at that point, it might cause this kind of design to be produced. Leaving its appearance aside, they're still functional. Wait, if their auto-repair is that advanced, then can't they just delete the unrelated data? That's the source of the problem after all. Although it can fix the method, it doesn't have the privilege to fix the goal. So a system with only that level of privilege would not be able to completely fix it no matter how advanced its auto repair is. Or more like, it doesn't even consider fixing that part. I see, so basically, because it can't change the basic shape, it instead forcibly add other parts with its old world technology, right? Well, there's also a chance that the factory AI was too bored, 
having nothing to do and decided to make a weird design just to kill time though. And also, Akira, shouldn't you shoot it soon? There's no need to use time compression just to prolong this conservation, right? Whoops. Akira refocused back to his target. Since he had already compressed his time perception unconsciously, that exchange with Alpha did not take that much time in the real world. The lock-on notice was still there as well. Akira made sure that his aim was properly locked on that monster as he pulled the trigger, the cannon released a thick blinding light that produced a shockwave. The pillar of light grew larger and larger as it traveled, when it hit the monster, the pillar of light that had grown bigger than the monster and entirely swallowed it. It then dispersed into smaller light threads before vanishing. The portion of the monster enveloped by the pillar of light also vanished together with that pillar. There were only the legs left behind as if its upper half was sliced through with an extremely hot object. The weapon that Akira just used was an AD antimaterial cannon. It was one of the extension parts of his CA-31R augmented suit and it was made to be used in tandem with that augmented suit. After his experience fighting Zalmo during the large-scale expedition, Akira was looking for a weapon with enough firepower and accuracy to take out a powerful opponent while still small enough to be carried around. Thus, he ended up with this cannon which was also his trump card at the moment. Normally, it would only be used by the hunters who work in the far eastern part of the eastern district, it was produced with a limited supply. Kiryu would not sell such equipment to hunters below rank 50. Of course, the ammo was equally expensive as well. When Akira realized that he just shot an ammo with the firepower that matched its price, he was surprised by how powerful it was. As expected, it's really powerful. I guess that laser cannon name is not just for show, huh? To be more precise, it just looks like a laser because of the leftover warhead turned into particles of light. So, it's technically not correct to call it a laser. After all, it's not like it is shooting out plasma. We're hunters, after all, we don't really care about the details as long as it's strong enough to kill monsters. Aside from the price of the ammo, my only worry is probably how dazzling it will be if I use it during the night. Since it will also annihilate everything around me, I can't use it while I hide. The moment Akira released his grip on the AF antimaterial cannon, it retracted and returned to its folded state on Akira's back. So the hunters in the Far East shoot this kind of thing around as if it's normal, huh? No wonder they're treated like a walking powered suit or a tank. I can't understand how hunters would want to go to such a place on their own volition just because they have a high enough hunter rank. Oh my, to be honest, I hope that you would aspire to be one of those hunters though. Yeah, I know. I'm doing my best here to satisfy your expectation, so it would be great if you would wait patiently. Alpha smiled at Akira because of his growth. In contrast, Akira returned back with a bitter smile. That was when Hikaru suddenly called him. This is Hikaru. It seems that a large-sized Okpolos monster is heading in your direction, it came from area E1173 which is three areas away from the area assigned to you. I just got a report from the hunters responsible for that area. It seems that there were too many monsters for them to handle so some monsters ended up escaping to other areas. It's far stronger than the other monsters in that area so I think it's better if you get away from there. The other hunters responsible for the other areas also avoided that monster. Hurry up and retreat, I can send reinforcements to help you run away if you need assistance, do you need me to do that? How many? Is it in a big swarm? Just one. But it originated from the area further to the east, so it's abnormally stronger compared to the other monsters around your area. In the worst case scenario, it might even be more formidable than a swarm of monsters in your area. I actually just shot down a monster that looks like an octopus, or a squid, are you talking about that one? Eh. Akira replied so casually that Hikaru needed a few seconds to process what she just heard. You killed it. Ah. Can you send me the data? Akira proceeded to send the data. Hikaru went silent again for a while before replying in a rather surprised tone. Ah, uh, yes. 
That is the monster from the report. They mentioned that only one got away and they have confirmed that as well, so it should be okay now. They actually sent a few hunters to hunt for that monster, but I've already informed them that the monster has been slain. There was another pause before Hikaru continued, this time, she sounded apologetic. And also, uh, I'm sorry. I underestimated you. To be honest, after hearing that your payment for the large-scale expedition was all converted into hunter rank, I thought you were not that strong. Well, you're not mistaken, so don't worry about it. Although I did say I killed it, I had to use my expensive trump card to do that after all. Well, if you still feel sorry for that, I hope you'll help me to get a better reward so I don't end up in red after using that expensive trump card. Since Akira sounded like he was not offended at all, Hikaru's voice returned back to her usual tone. Sure. I'll do my best, so you can look forward to it. Later then. Hikaru then closed the call there. After that, Akira frowned and mumbled. So Hikaru also did not expect that monster to be here, hmm. I guess that's just how strong that monster was. For some reason, I always get stuck in this kind of situation, don't I? Alpha smiled amusedly and answered him. Well, it's business as usual for you. So it's no problem at all as long as you're well prepared. Aren't you glad that you are? Akira chuckled. Although he could agree with that statement, he still felt conflicted to just brush that aside and accept it as his normal. Rebuild World, Chapter 231, Reevaluation. Further to the east from where Akira's team was, a guy by the name of Tatsukawa was talking through his information terminal. He was the leader of the hunter team that was responsible for Area E-1173. In that case, we don't need to send our men, right? Very well, understood. No. Yes, I'm sorry to trouble you. No no no, it's our fault, so please don't be sorry. Thank you once again. After he closed the call, he immediately made a stern face. Mel Shia. There's no need to send anyone to hunt that Okpolos. Get everyone to look for those bastards. Mel Shia, who was Tatsukawa's partner as well as the vice captain of the team, frowned. Eh. What gives? We're just about to go, you know. The target for that hunt is no more. The team from Area 1168 took care of it. Mel Shia walked toward Tatsukawa and tilted her head. If I'm not mistaken, that area is handled by the hunters from Kagamayama City, right? There's no way they can take care of that Okpolos. Well, they've been gathering high-ranking hunters with more rewards ever since that incident in Kuzusuhara ruin. Even I was called by Kibayashi. So, I bet one of those hunters got assigned to that area. Well, that would explain everything. Are you going to? I'm still considering it. But that doesn't matter right now. Just get the men to look for those bastards. Yeah yeah. Mel Shia proceeded to convey that order to the rest of the team. Although they were complaining at first, Mel Shia, who was good with people, knew what they were thinking and told them that Tatsukawa was not in a good mood, thus shutting them up. Just to let you know, bringing a few extra people won't help much. I don't think we can find them, you know. It's still better than not even trying. It's not like I'm going to get angry at them if we get to find them. In order to expel his horrendous mood, Tatsukawa heaved a big sigh. So then, what do you know about them? I know you did some investigation beforehand, right? Well, I did confirm that their available record is fake. With this, it's obvious that they're weak hunters who changed their track record to take on their current job and they seem to be already used to this kind of thing. Although, I still don't know their affiliation. They might be from city management, or from the corporate government, or from the nationalists, or maybe even from somewhere else. I still don't understand, what's their plan? Luring the Okpolos to the west just to let it get away. And also, why would they use falsify their track record to join us? I have no guess either. It might just be harassment. Or maybe they're one of those who get pushed aside from the fierce job competition during the transport season. 
or they're just trying to add something meaningful to their track record. There are many possibilities. By the way, they chased Okpolos toward the direction of Kuzusuhara ruin, right? So, they might have something to do with that ruin as well. Why would they do that? The A. I in that ruin can communicate normally with humans, right? Although Kagamayama City is monopolizing that A. I, it must want to contact other cities as well. But with the soldiers from Kagamayama City surrounding the area, it's difficult to send people there. So maybe they're trying to open a hole in that blockade by sending powerful monsters there and to use that opening to sneak in? Normally, intentionally sending monsters to a ruin guarded by a city is the same as picking a fight with that city, that's why they're falsifying their background information to cover their tracks. It could be maybe something like that. After working together for a long time, Tatsukawa knew that rejecting Melshia's guess, even if it was a paranoid one, would only give her more trouble to deal with, so she just ignored it. Well, it doesn't really matter. Whoever they are and whatever their goal is, it doesn't change the fact that they gave us a bad name. So, we have to make them pay for that. Melshia, place a bounty on their head based on the information you have on them. Set it to 100 billion per person, wait, no, make it 200 billion. Roger that. I'll do that later, ah, uh, you'll be the one paying, okay? A, it's related to our reputation, so shouldn't that money be paid by the whole team? No no no, we don't have that much money, you know. Tatsukawa clicked his tongue. Make it two billion each then. All right, I'll take care of the administration, but it doesn't change the fact that you'll be the one paying, okay? Yeah yeah, I'll pay for it, so just get the bounty up. Honestly though, I don't see any need to go that far, you know. There's no compromise for this one. You and your hard head. Mel Shia smiled wryly seeing that childish side of her partner. It was due to pure coincidence that Akira shot down that Okpolos. But the reason why that happened was not because of pure coincidence, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Ario stood frozen in the cafeteria back in the base. There was a pile of money in front of him, three million orum in total. It was his payment after his last job. The pruning job that he took last time was already done. Akira himself already went to take another pruning and extermination request from Hikaru. As for the relics that Ario and the other children brought back from the last request, they were all basically bought by Cheryl's gang and turned into money. After subtracting from the expense, the leftover was then divided equally among Akira, Elena, Sarah, and Cheryl. Then the money that Cheryl received was used to pay for Viola and Colbert's reward as well as to Kiryu. The remaining amount went to the gang's collective deposit. After all, they could never have enough funds stored up considering the price of the coordination support system that was lent to them for monitoring as well as the augmented suits and other equipment. Because of that, the sum paid to Ario and the other children were actually relatively small. But even so, it was large enough to cause Ario to start shaking when he received it. Other than Ario, the rest of the team received 1 million orum each. Although all of them had their bank account made when they registered themselves in the hunter office as hunters and were able to receive the payment from direct transfer, in order to maximize the shock effect, Cheryl gathered everyone in the cafeteria and handed over their payments one by one. Thanks to that, most of them looked like nervous suspicious individuals with that large pile of money in hand. Alicia sat down next to a flustered Ario. Alicia, who was one of the officers on the managerial side of the gang, had to deal with money on many occasions. Thanks to that, she had built up a level of resistance against something like this. In contrast to Ario who was greatly flustered, Alicia was sitting next to him, completely calm. Ario kept looking around, alternating between the money in front of him and Alicia. Hey Alicia, is there anything you want? Your safety, I guess. Ario did not expect that answer from his girlfriend and was taken aback a bit by it. After he managed to somehow calm down, he looked at Alicia once more with confusion still etched on his face. Alicia then whispered. Even if we use it to buy medicine, this much will only get us three boxes, right? 
W.L., that might be true. But, it's still a huge amount of money, you know. At least that is the case for us. After Ario said so, he could feel the worth of the three million orum in front of him drop. No matter how many times he looked at the pile in front of him, it would not shock him again the same way it did the first time. Seeing that, Alicia knew that she had successfully changed Ario's view of money. She then stared at Ario and said. Yes, it is. But it's still not enough to endanger your life. So please don't think of joining Akira-san's job again just for this amount, okay? I know that you couldn't refuse because it was the boss order, but please do your utmost effort to return alive. Not for money. Of course. Ariel gave an honest smile, Alicia responded with a similar one. That aside, it's money that you get from your hard work, so I think you should use it for yourself, but if I may, I want you to use it for your safety. Everyone used to ignore us in the past, but ever since the transport season began, there are many new people coming to the slum. I'm sure I don't even need to tell what might happen to a slum kid carrying three million orum around. You have a point. Well, I do think that it should be okay during my guard duty as long as I have that augmented suit on. We cannot use that augmented suit unless it's for gang-related work. It's the gang's augmented suit after all. They might kick you out if you use it without permission. I think you can use this amount to buy other equipment from Katsuragi or use it to get a rental augmented suit. You can also add it to the gang's collective budget. Boss will be happy to hear it and she might allow you to borrow some of the gang's equipment, I can put in some good words too if needed. I can also use my money too in case she says that the gang doesn't have enough budget. Hmm, that's also a good idea, what should I do? Seeing that Ariel was starting to think about how to use the sum he received, Alicia was relieved in many ways. Her boyfriend, Ariel, was able to return alive after going out on a hunter job with someone who she considered a madman. Moreover, he had calmed down from the initial shock so there should be no need to worry about the danger of suddenly getting that much money. To top it off, although it might be just a selfish wish of hers, it seems that Ariel did not have any plan to use that money for other girls. Though she felt a bit guilty about it, she was still relieved. Due to her contract with Cheryl, Carol was at least banned from messing with any gang members who already had a girlfriend. But there was a loophole in that deal. If the other party insisted that he did not have a girlfriend or had broken up with his girlfriend, then Carol had free reign. Girls in the gang were afraid of that. They were trying to find a way, through trial and error, to prevent Carol from getting her hands on their boyfriend or the boy that they liked, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Akira placed a one-week gap between each pruning job, which always take place with Elena and Sarah. As long as Akira himself was not badly wounded, he actually had no problem doing it every day. However, afterwards, he had to replenish his supplies through Shizuka's shop. Although he did pay them up front before he made the order, he still could not get all the supplies right away. Moreover, considering the time that Elena and Sarah needed to recover from their fatigue, he could not afford to shorten the gap any further. In reality, one of the reasons for the gap was because Shizuka, as well as Elena and Sarah, thought that it was extremely likely that Akira would decide to go to the wasteland every time he had some free time. Thus, they were using those excuses to force Akira to take regular breaks. Even when Hikaru suggested shortening that time gap, Akira just ignored her pleas. On one of those rest days, when Akira was training with Alpha in the garage of his house, he received a call from Shiakarabe. The content of the call was a simple wish to meet if Akira had some free time. Although Shikarabe asked in a casual manner, Akira could feel that there was something serious he wanted to talk about. Akira did find it weird, but he still decided to go and meet him. Night in the entertainment district was still as busy as usual. Many hunters were enjoying their drinks or the girls of the red light districts. Meanwhile, there were some of them who were only passing through on their way back from the wasteland. Akira waved between those crowds as he walked toward the bar where he was meeting Shikarabi at. But it did not take long for him to notice that there was something strange, 
and the source of that feeling became obvious after he took a few more steps. Alpha, people are avoiding me, are they not? Well, it can't be helped, you're basically flashing your expensive equipment out in public after all. Akira was using his CA-31R augmented suit and carrying two LEO multi-rifles, it was understandable for people to take him as one of those hunters who were originally from the East. Even if they did not understand the exact cost and value of Akira's equipment, they knew that what he had on, were on a completely different level compared to the common equipment in Kagamayama City. It was not a big mystery that Akira was a high-ranking hunter based on his appearance alone. Many hunters in the entertainment district were drunk. Among them, high-ranking hunters tend to look down on the hunters of Kagamayama City. Therefore, those who did not want to get in trouble with those high-ranking hunters were keeping their distance from Akira. I guess I should buy a coat next time. If I'm not mistaken, one of the options that came with this augmented suit was a defensive coat. Wait, no, I guess it's useless if I use that coat, huh? It's better than using a cheap coat, making you seem weak and getting others to pick a fight with you, right? Although it's thanks to your equipment, isn't it great that people finally stopped looking down on you? I think it's better for you to just get used to this kind of thing. I see, yeah. You're right. This is better than having them coming at me. I'm also planning to get better equipment as well, so it's true that it's better to get used to it from now. Akira also thought that he would rather have people actively avoiding him instead of going at him. Thus, he just shook that off from his mind and moved on. Because of that, he did not notice the other reason why the hunters were avoiding him. Ever since Akira accepted the fact that he was no longer a weak slum boy, strange changes have been happening to him. Others around him started perceiving him differently. He turned from a hidden landmine into an unearthed landmine. So, it was given that those who did not want to step on a landmine even by pure coincidence, would keep their distance from Akira. Akira eventually reached his destination. It was the same bar that he visited the last time he had gone to meet Shikarabi. But this time, the master did not tell him to leave, instead, he took him to where Shikarabi was. Shikarabi then sent a glance to the master of the bar and he just left. There was more than one person in the room Akira just entered. Those inside did not seem like they were in a bad mood, and they were not as rowdy as the others in the bar. It did not feel like they were in deep trouble as well. However, it was obvious that they had something preoccupying their minds. Shikarabi was exuding that kind of feeling. You're here, huh? I'm sorry for asking you to come here, we can talk later, so can you finish your talk with Arabe first? Long time no see, please, take a seat. Sure, okay. Akira was a bit bewildered, but he still took a seat. Shikarabi took a sip of his glass and glanced at Akira. Do you want? Ah, uh, right, you don't drink, right? Well, they have non-alcoholic drinks as well. We'll be the ones paying, so you can go ahead and pick anything you want. I know this is not the kind of place to request a meeting with a rank 50 hunter, but Drankam is not really doing well with money, you see. Due to that, unfortunately, we can't really invite you to the upper floors of the Kagama building, am I right, Arabe? Eh? Ah, uh, yes, it's as Shikarabi just said. I don't really mind though, so. Akira was a bit thrown off by Shikarabi's unusual attitude, but as they agreed on, he first listened to Arabe's business with him. But after listening to the content, Akira was a bit surprised. Basically, Arabe was requesting to let Drankam join in the pruning job that Akira had been receiving from Hikaru. Seeing Akira who was frowning at him, Arabe felt the awkward mood start to drift in, so he flusteredly added in an explanation. Ah, please don't misunderstand, Drankam itself finds this request a bit awkward. But it came from the higher up, or more like, it came from city management so we can't really ignore it, you see. It's true that we have signed an official peace treaty, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that we can guarantee that there won't be any trouble. We thought that city management had already informed you about this, but it does not seem to be the case. I this is the first time I heard about this thought. 
So, give me a second. Akira quickly called the person that might know about this. Hikaru immediately picked up the call and after a short explanation of what was going on from Akira, Hikaru also replied saying that such a proposition did reach her as well. Back when we were talking about the gap between each request, you did say that you need someone else to handle the vehicle and wait for your supplies to arrive, and these two things become a bottleneck for you, remember? You also said that otherwise, you would have gone every day, right? And that was when you asked me if I have a solution for that, right? I did. I feel like I did, but... I feel like I just said it because I just wanted to complain. It was not like I was looking for a solution. Either way, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to actually ask for your help back then. But you did say that, remember? Although, I might have received it differently than what you have intended. But putting that aside, because of that, I went around looking for something to help you out, you see. And that included Drankum too. Not directly. I did ask the other staff, so someone with a connection to Drankum might have gone and asked them. Ah, I'm sorry if I'm troubling you instead. I have no wish at all to pressure you to accept it. So, if you think that it's too troublesome, please feel free to just reject it. Tell them that there's no penalty even if you don't take up their offer. And also, if it's too much work for you, you can just leave that to me if you want. I will happily do it for you. All right, ah, uh, don't worry, it's not like I'm angry or anything, I just didn't expect it, that's all. I'm glad to hear that. Please call me again if you need anything else. After he finished that call, Akira gave a short explanation to Arabe about what he just heard from Hikaru. So that's basically what happened, it seems that it's not like city management is forcing Drankum to do it either. So, uh, can we just drop this subject? Ah, uh, I see. Honestly speaking, if you're not bothered by it, we from Drankum wish that you would accept our offer. The transport season brings in many jobs and all of them are good for building one's reputation. Of course, we promise that we'll be careful with the team composition. I, I see, hmm. Akira started to look troubled. He had signed a peace treaty through the hunter office with Drankum, so it might look suspicious if he insisted on not working with them. It's true that bringing more people would mean that Elena and Sarah would have less burden and he himself would not have to resupply as often as before and put Shizuka in trouble. It was not a bad offer at all. But making a deal with an organization was a huge pain in the neck, or at least, that was the case for Akira. Unlike with Elena and Sarah, who he could trust, or Cheryl, who would just accept any amount that Akira decided to give her, dealing with an organization was different. He would have to wrestle with all the trouble that came with dealing with an organization, not to mention, he had to think about commanding the team as well as some kind of insurance for each person. All in all, it was extremely troublesome. After taking his time to consider his options, Akira decided to take on Hikaru's offer. He then recalled Hikaru, gave her a quick overview, and left the rest of the negotiation with Drankum to Hikaru. Hikaru happily accepted the job, she quickly called Arabe after that and completely took over the negotiation in place of Akira. With Arabe's negotiation opponent being shifted to Hikaru, Akira decided that he had no more business with Arabe, so he moved on to Shikarabi. So then, what do you want to talk about with me? Well, about that. It has more or less already been taken care of, so. The heck. It's done. But I haven't said anything yet. You can't just say that when you're the one who called me here. So, what is it? Seeing Akira was still curious, Shikarabi took a rather aggressive chug of the drink in his hand. Let's see. Well, you did come here, so I guess it's only fair if I tell you. What can I say? It's some kind of adjustment for my intuition, wait, no, it's more like a check for my intuition. What in the world are you even talking about? It would be a long story if I have to tell you everything, but I will tell you the bare minimum since you did come here after I called you. If you're interested, you're welcome to listen, but if you're not, feel free to finish your meal and leave any time you want. 
Akira frowned and took a posture saying that he was interested. Shikarabi took one big gulp of the newly filled beer cup before he started talking. After Katsuya's death, Drankum went through dramatic changes. It basically eradicated Katsuya's faction and it sent a shockwave through the inner management of the gang. Everyone, including the officers as well as the ordinary members, were all busy dealing with the aftermath. Thanks to that, there was no struggle for power at all. With the excessive prioritization toward the young hunters gone, Kurosawa and the other veteran hunters, who had left the gang because of that policy, returned to Drankum. It was all thanks to them that the gang was able to finish the other deals that should have been handled by Katsuya. Although they were able to fill in the hole that Katsuya's left, they still could not do anything about the long-term contracts involving Katsuya as an individual. Due to the violation of the contract from Drankum's side, Drankum had to pay a huge fine. With no more support from Yanagisawa, Drankum was quickly thrown into a financial crisis. It's all because those in the managerial side accepted those reckless long-term contracts. Those who took on such risks are now in deep trouble. But still, it's not like I can just say that they got what they deserved and be happy about it. It's also our fault for not stopping them before they signed those contracts. I know all of them are now blaming themselves, but that's the same for me too. Just like them, I believe that Kastsuya would never die, that he would only keep growing bigger. Shikarabi pour another beer into his empty cup and heaved a huge sigh as if he just let out something heavy that was latching onto him. He brought the beer to his mouth as if to fill in the hole that was left from his huge sigh. He was basically just that good. Whether it was hatred or the opposite, he had power that not all hunters have, and his power threw us off. But with all being said, he still died in the end. People die when their time comes, it was obvious and even doubly true for hunters. His death allowed us to come to our senses and sober up. Shikarabi then looked up as if he was digging through his past. I always hated his guts. No, I still hate him even now. Although it's not as bad as how the me from the past would have felt. I hate him just like how I hate the other brats that get too cocky. I still don't know, even now, why I hated him that much. Well, it might be actually just jealousy for his talent and that jealousy is now gone now that he is dead. No matter how far he dug through his past, Shikarabi could not recover the hatred that he once had. He somehow looked even more irritated than before. Let me return to the real subject, so, basically, my intuition is telling me that he's someone who would not die and grow big. In contrast to that, I'm sorry to offend you, but you're not that amazing and I've always felt that you'll die sooner or later. But then, the result was the opposite, he's dead and you survived, you even got to rank 50. So, I just want to know just how wrong my intuition is. As a hunter who placed his very own life on his intuition, for Shikarabi, questioning his intuition was like questioning the most basic principle of his identity. That was the reason why he called Akira to meet him. Even though it was important for him, it did not show at all on his face. And so, after I calmed down and threw away all my preconceptions, I once again asked my intuition, whether you're an amazing hunter. If even after that, I still can't see you as an amazing hunter, then it only means that my intuition is not to be trusted. That's why I called you here and I'm already done with that as well. So basically, that's all there is it. I see, so, what is your intuition saying now? To Akira who was asking while showing his honest interest in the answer, Shikarabi just smiled at him. We are not so close that I would just tell you that. Well, at least, I'll tell you that there's no need to completely throw it off the window for the time being. I see. Shikarabi's reply already served as half an answer, so Akira just slightly smiled at him. They continued talking while Shikarabi was enjoying his beer and Akira, enjoying his meal. As the alcohol started to take effect on Shikarabi, he suddenly asked a rather rude question to Akira. But still, that's pretty impressive of you to kill Katsuya. Oh, it's not like I'm looking down on you. It's just that you were alone when you were facing Katsuya and his whole team, right? 
considering the difference in fighting prowess, it should have been impossible, no. So how did you kill him? Did he make a mistake somewhere? Or did you catch him off guard or something? Both, I guess. I'll omit the details, but in the end, he died protecting his teammate. That's why I won. If he had abandoned his teammate, I would have been the one dead. Shikarabi gave a lonely bitter smile and mumbled. I see, so in the end, he thought too highly of himself and brought his friends closer to death again, huh? But I guess he did hold on to his belief to the very end. Well, that's just like him to die like that. He was always like that. Well, yeah. Now that I think about it, back then, when he was the leader of a small team, he remained like that. He should have continued to lead a small group of people that he could save with his hard work. That way, others would not have died. Well, it's Drankum who pushed him to lead a bigger team, so it would be wrong to blame him on that one, huh? He has always. Akira listened to Shikarabi's recollection of Katsuya for a while before leaving, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. On their way back, Arabe glanced at Shikarabi and threw a question to him. By the way, what is your intuition saying about Akira now? Whoa there, are you seriously asking me that? It's fine, isn't it? It's not like we're strangers anyway, right? Arabe asked that question in a casual manner. But Shikarabi replied with a rather serious tone. Let's see. Before you think of anything weird, I'll tell you this first. He's crazy, that's what I think about him right now. That's rather harsh, but it's not like he's weak or anything, right? Overall, including his equipment, there's no doubt he's stronger than me. And even if we're using the same equipment, it would still be a close fight. But rather than strength, his craziness sticks out more. In order for that crazy talent to bloom, it needs to be accompanied by someone crazy enough to do crazy things. You've heard about Kibayashi, right? I heard that Akira is just the kind Kibayashi loves. A reckless hunter. So, basically, he gambles on his life on a daily basis and survives through all the risks he takes. There's no doubt that someone who has gone through all those things would become that strong. So, it just makes me wonder. Why did I only see him as a common hunter in the past? Seeing Shikarabi starting to admonish himself, Arabe decided to stop his original plan of trying to recruit Akira to Drankum. Shikarabi, who had been close to Arabe for so many years noticed that. I think you've made a good choice there. If you got Akira into Drankum, I bet he would drag the whole gang to his crazy stunts. So just forget about it, he would never be able to replace Katsuya. You're right, I'll tell the others that too. Woe there, so there are others who consider that too. Yeah, pretty much. Shikarabi sighed exasperatedly, seeing that Arabe could only smile wryly. Rebuild World, Chapter 232, Middle District After finishing business with Shikarabi and Arabe, Drankum started to join Akira in his pruning job. After a fierce negotiation between Cheryl, Drankum, and Hikaru, they decided to keep the one-week gap while still increasing the area coverage based on the new size of the team. Due to Kurosawa's return to Drankum, the command chain quickly stabilized. The team worked very well under Kurosawa's command which was great for Akira. While at the same time, hunters kept encountering powerful monsters around the city, that should have been further to the east from Kagamayama city. With the appearance of these monsters, hunters started to feel the pressure. Some of the hunters backed out from their job, some demanded more money to make it worth the preparation and the risk. One of the reasons why Hikaru asked Akira to shorten the gap was to help tip over the balance. But Akira himself was not that powerful yet, he ended up having to use his trump card, the AF Antimaterial Cannon, every day. It reminded him just how scary the wasteland of the Eastern District was. During noon, Akira was having a meeting with Hikaru in a restaurant on the first floor of the Kagama building. But still, just how long is this pruning request going to continue for? It has been a month since the transport season started, you know. Hasn't it already ended a long time ago? 
Although it started together with the transport season, it doesn't stop together with it. It will continue as long as there's demand for it. Especially this time. There are many people coming to this city because of the last incident in the Kuzusuhara ruin. These people of course include higher-ups as well. It's not like we can stuff these people to a safe box and send them away without escorts, you see, but at the same time, there are not enough intercity transports to ferry them since their schedule is already fully booked. I even heard that even someone from Sakashita Heavy Industry is sending their officers in secret too. I see, that's pretty amazing. Hikaru smiled bitterly. For the cities under the corporate government, getting an officer guest from the Sakashita heavy industry was a huge thing, but even so, unlike what Hikaru was looking forward to, Akira only showed the bare minimum interest in the matter. She felt that it was a mistake to leak insider information in hopes that it would surprise Akira. Yep, that's really amazing. This is pretty valuable information, you know. So don't leak it outside, okay? Okay. Hikaru felt a bit disappointed that Akira reacted to something so important so casually, but she just shook it off for now and continued. So then, it's about today's main subject. I want you to escort one of the intercity transports. I know it's a bit sudden, but it'll be tomorrow. Tomorrow? That's just way too sudden, I have to make sure that Elena-san and Sarah-san are ready too, so... I'm sorry, but the transport only has limited capacity, so you'll be going alone. That's why I've only finished the paperwork for you thinking that if it's you alone, it should be fine. You should already have your supplies and seem ready to go anytime. So, that should be okay, right? Well, if it's only me, then yeah. But still, this is pretty sudden. Yeah, it came to us out of the blue as well. Although I can't tell you all the details, there's this strange thing going on where abnormally strong monsters are appearing around the area. So, the original hunters assigned for this got injured fighting against those monsters or something like that. But with that being said, it's not like they can just postpone the dispatch, you see. So, can you go? If you insist on refusing, I will have no other choice but to back off, but if you can, it would be great if you would do it. Akira thought while looking at Hikaru who was smiling at him while still giving off a serious aura. All right. Thank you. Really really thank you. Hikaru said so and gave an honest thank you to Akira. After listening to a short briefing about that request, Akira left the restaurant and went back home. Hikaru, who was left behind, stayed in the restaurant, working through the paperwork while enjoying her parfait. Since Akira had accepted, she had to take care of the administration work as soon as possible. Since she was basically trying to insert Akira into the request using the opening created by the suddenly vacant escort slots, she had to hurry up or someone else would take that spot. All right. I made it. Although it's a little bit too close for comfort, it's all good as long as it gets through, yep. Judging from his performance in the pruning requests, Akira obviously had the skill to handle this escort request. He would have no trouble fighting in the wasteland further into the east. So, if Akira could contribute well during this escort mission, it would no doubt pull up Hikaru's reputation as well. Hikaru could not hold back her smile as she was looking forward to the result. Akira, good luck out there, I'm rooting for you, you know. Akira unexpectedly took the request without much need of convincing. So, it seems that she could expect more from him in the future. As Hikaru was thinking about that future, a call suddenly reached her. It was from Kabayashi. Hello, it's Hikaru, what is it? It's me. There's something I want to talk to you about the escort request. Is there a problem? Don't worry, I was able to get Akira to take on the request. Hikaru thought that Kibayashi was calling her, worried that he might lose his connection to Akira, that was why she replied with a rather haughty tone there. But unexpectedly, Kibayashi replied with a rather amused voice. Oh, not bad at all. To be honest, I didn't expect you would be able to pull that off. Well well, I guess it was a good thing I introduced you to Akira. 
Hikaru was taken aback by that unexpected reaction. I, I see. Thank you very much. I heard that you pushed the joint work with Drankum in order to cement the peace treaty as well as to win some trust from Akira, right? That peace treaty, it's actually made by me, you see. Is that so? Thank you. No no no, I'm just happy to find that my work is useful to others. But still, it's pretty impressive using that peace treaty to push for that joint operation. Hikaru was not sure how to react to Kabayashi, who was praising her. Anyway, I'm sorry for imposing on you by bringing this matter up, but returning back to the main subject, there's something I want you to do for me when you meet Akira tomorrow. What is it? After hearing Kabayashi's request, Hikaru replied with a confused tone. Is that all? Yes, that's all, that's all from me. Call me again if something comes up. Kibayashi then closed the call. Hikaru tried to understand the meaning behind Kibayashi's request for a bit, but nothing came to mind. Thus, she just stopped there and left it as something that must have some kind of deeper meaning to it. On the morning of the next day, Akira was waiting for Hikaru in front of the Kagama building. He was carrying one spare AF anti-material cannon and four LEO rifles that were hidden under his newly bought coat. The large-sized rucksack on his back was filled with extended magazines and energy packs. Each one of these energy packs were focused more on capacity instead of price, so both were by no means cheap. The transport truck was also filled to the brim with ammunition, so if needed, Akira could just buy them right there. But Akira wanted to buy from Shizuka's shop as much as possible. Of course, the quality of the product from the transport truck was guaranteed to be great, and he could use his position as the escort to get a small discount. In comparison, the ammo that he bought from Shizuka was slightly more expensive, but even so, he still prioritized Shizuka's shop. It was basically one of those occult things among hunters. Hikaru, who came right on time, looked puzzled at Akira's luggage. That's quite a lot of luggage for a three days, two nights journey. Regardless of the estimated time, the journey between cities is always going to be long. So, it's better to be safe than sorry. Well, you're the one who will be escorting that journey after all. Now then, let's go. Hikaru then happily took Akira through the Kagama building and into the inner wall. In the middle of that, Hikaru gave Akira a bracelet-type information terminal. Always keep this on during the request, okay? It doubles as evidence that you have permission to enter the middle district as well as permission to bring your weapons in. So, make sure not to lose it. The area where you're going has the same security system as the middle district. In the case where you break that bracelet, don't move and contact me right away. In the worst case scenario, the system might recognize you as a treat and deal with you. All right. Can I just put this on top of my augmented suit? It's pretty durable since it's designed for hunters, so it should be okay. You can also change the size, you should have no trouble putting it on. Do you need my help to put it on? Thought that would be on your neck. Hikaru smiled mischievously, Akira only lightly chuckled and replied. No thanks. That's unfortunate. Akira put that bracelet on his left arm. He then showed it to the guard on the gate before he could proceed into the inner wall. The moment he stepped into the inner wall, Hikaru twirled around and spread her arm as she looked at Akira with a huge smile. Akira, welcome to the middle district. The huge wall divided Kagamayama city into the inner and outer sections. The thick tall wall represented the gap of public order, economy, and environment between the inner wall and the outer wall, and Akira finally stepped into the inner section. Of course, there was no shortage of land considering all the unused lands out in the wasteland, but once walls were erected, it created a limited supply of safe areas. In order to make the best use of that limited resource, tall buildings were erected inside the inner wall. But even so, it did not feel crowded. In fact, the urban landscape was designed to give off a sense of freedom. The well-cleaned road boasted the difference between the inner and the outer section of the wall to Akira. 
An unmanned vehicle stopped in front of Akira and Hikaru. She was the one who summoned that vehicle. It was the common way to move around inside the middle district. The inside of the vehicle was relatively wide for its size thanks to the fact that it did not have a driver's seat, Akira did not have any trouble at all stuffing his luggage in. After he boarded in as well, Hikaru set the destination, and the vehicle started to silently move without making any noticeable shaking, but even so, it was coursing at a rather high speed through the middle district. Akira was gazing at the cityscape through the car's window with great interest. However, Hikaru found something strange looking at Akira's expression. You don't seem to be that excited. Is the middle district not as great as you thought it would be? Ah, uh, no, it's indeed really amazing, I guess it's as expected of the middle district, but because of that, I kind of expected this so it doesn't really surprise me. Is that so? Many who enter the middle district for the first time from the outer wall seem to feel overwhelmed and found it absolutely amazing though. The area around the gate of the Kagama building that connected the inner and the outer part of the wall was deliberately built to give an impactful impression to those who entered for the first time. It was the way the middle district showed its glory and greatness to those from outside the wall as well as the way to encourage the people who live inside the wall to be proud of where they lived and worked. Hikaru also thought highly of the middle district, and she was planning to move on to the upper district one day. This was the reason why she was working so hard right now. But that was also the reason why she wanted Akira to be happier after she took him from the lower district to the middle district. Unfortunately, Akira was as apathetic as usual with his reaction and Hikaru found it regrettable. Ah, uh, it might be because you're a hunter that you found something more amazing somewhere in the ruins, right? Well, it's true that no matter how amazing the buildings in the middle district are, they're all still just buildings made in the current era. There's no way they can stand a chance against the old world buildings, huh? Is that so? Hmm, that might be the case. That was when Hikaru remembered what she heard from Kabayashi yesterday. She thought that it was a good time to bring it up and smiled. But still, this place is not the same as the outer wall, you know. And it's not limited only in terms of the outlook. Hear this and be amazed. In the middle district. If someone gets killed in the middle of the road. The murderer will be properly caught, sent to the court, investigated, before finally punished based on the available evidence. Isn't that amazing? Oh. That's amazing. As expected of the inner wall. Both Hikaru and Akira were surprised, but the reason for it was completely different. Akira was simply being honest that he was surprised at how public safety was enforced in the inner wall. Meanwhile, Hikaru was taken aback that Akira was so surprised. The difference in their common sense regarding public safety was in full view. Hikaru was suspicious if Akira was only trying to match her excitement instead of being honestly surprised. But judging from Akira's reaction, it was obvious that he was truly surprised. When she remembered what Kibayashi said yesterday, it caused her to start feeling anxious. Kibayashi asked Hikaru to do two things. The first one was to tell Akira just how safe the inner wall was, which she had done just now. The other one was something that she thought was not that big of a deal. However, after seeing Akira's reaction, she conveyed this last bit to Akira carefully. By the way, Akira, how many people have you killed till now? It might be rude for me to ask this, but it has something to do with submitting your permission, you see. Akira pulled back his head and thought for a bit, but eventually, he shook his head and said. Sorry, I have no idea, it's not like I'm counting it in the first place. There's no need for a precise number, an estimation like how many digits should be enough. In that case. Three digits. I guess. I'm sure it doesn't go as far as four digits or does it? Hmm. It's just my guess though. I I see. Is that the number from the ones you killed directly? Or does it include those who are killed indirectly as well? Leaders often counted the people that the team killed due to their orders. Hikaru thought that Akira might be one of those when she asked that question, but he interpreted that question differently. 
Does indirect include something like I shot them, but they did not die right away only to die later because of the wound too? That would be direct. In that case, that number is from the direct ones. I, I see. Akira answered Hikaru's questions as if it was a casual conversation. Like what he just had for lunch a few days ago. Hikaru was only barely able to maintain her smile thanks to her greatly polished negotiation talent. She then reached for the information terminal and stopped the car. Sorry, I forgot to report something to Kabayashi, can you please wait here for a bit? I'll go out and make a quick call. Sure. Akira replied with a short affirmation, so Hiraku smiled at him and left the car. She unconsciously walked away from the car where Akira was, half running. After she opened some distance from the car, she repeatedly took some deep breaths to calm down her throbbing heart. She tried to calm down as much as possible before calling Kibayashi. Oh, did something happen? Kibayashi's casual voice incited an explosion of emotion from Hikaru. Don't give me that. Just what the heck is wrong with him? Even if you yell at me like that, I have no idea unless you tell me what happened, you know. Kibayashi was chuckling since it turned out exactly as he expected as he listened to Hikaru's explanation. After that, he then innocently asked Hikaru. I see, so, is there any problem? Are you dash? Of course, it's a huge problem. Why did you let someone who killed that many people into the middle district? Why, you ask? What are you even talking about? Isn't that because you asked me to? It doesn't take a genius to refuse that request, you know. Don't tell me that you did something behind the curtain to get permission for him. I didn't do anything. Well, if you ask me if he's a dangerous person, I'll give you a straight yes. Even I would hesitate to let him into the middle district. So, I'm really amazed by your negotiation skill, you really managed to get him into the middle district. I'm being serious here, I'm honestly impressed that you actually did it, didn't I tell you yesterday as well, remember? In contrast to Hikaru, who was barking complaints, Kibayashi replied with an amused tone. It seems that you're suspicious why your request got through, the final decision for the permission is made based on many considerations. For example, even if it's true that Akira killed hundreds of people, that happened outside the wall. In short, that happened out there in the wasteland. So, I bet the higher-ups are not really concerned about it. But with that being said, if he was a murderer who killed people he saw no matter where he went, the permission would not have been granted. As a matter of fact, he would have been put on a bounty. Even if he has killed hundreds of people, it happened outside the wall, and considering that the public safety outside the wall is virtually non-existent along with his hunter rank being 50, I bet his permission was only barely managed to get approved. T that's. Aren't you going a bit too far with that guess of yours? But that's completely possible, you know. Didn't you work so hard to close that gap? That peaceful resolution with Drankum through the hunter office, and with that as a basis, you get them to join operations with him. That should be enough to prove that Akira is a professional hunter who obeys his contracts closely. Basically, what you have done so far is guarantee that he's safe. Man, that's really impressive. If it was me, I wouldn't be able to do that. After all, that guy went in alone and crushed a huge gang in the slums just to kill someone who stole his money, you know. He did kill quite a lot of people during that incident, after all, so there's no way his kill count only stopped at dozens, you know. S so that was not because he somehow got roped into the conflict. HM. The record didn't go into that detail, huh? Did the record mostly omit that part because of its connection with that powered suit? Hmm. I see. It's under the information restriction, huh? Well, I guess things like this do happen from time to time, ah, uh, right. Make sure not to leak this info, okay? Hikaru's face turned paler and paler. I'm sure you'll be deemed responsible if he causes some sort of issue there. Though it won't go as far as firing you, I bet you won't be able to live inside the inner wall anymore. But again, 
I bet you know this very well before you brought him into the middle district, right? By the way, I went to call you in person yesterday because I just wanted to confirm if you're sure with what you were doing, just to be safe, you know. Hikaru then thought that she should have noticed at the moment Kabayashi said something suspicious to her yesterday, but all that she could do for now was just to wallow in her regrets. Well, basically, everything will be fine as long as he doesn't do anything bad and it's your job to make sure that nothing bad happens. Be careful, yeah. If a random thug in the inner wall said to him that they would kill him, there's no doubt that he'll go ahead and kill them instead, that's just the kind of person Akira is. Even with the fact that he's a ranking 50 hunter with a connection to city management's officer and a strong letter of recommendation from city management staff, he only managed to get temporary permission to enter the middle district, you see. So, I'm sure you understand the meaning behind it without any further explanation. Hikaru always thought that high-ranking hunters with connection to city management's officers would always be proper hunters, but that did not seem to be the case. He might be able to accomplish whatever crazy plan you have, you know. So, just give it your best shot, I'll be waiting for the result. Even after Kabayashi closed the call, Hikaru still stood there without doing anything for a few minutes. When she returned to herself, she finally understood that Kabayashi was using her to do something crazy and she had no inkling of how to get away from that. Sending Akira as the escort for the intercity transport was supposed to be a low-risk high-return gamble, but now, it has completely changed into a life-staking high-risk high-return gamble. Unfortunately, she had gone too far to back out now. Not only did she forcefully get Akira into a job related to another city, if she suddenly decided to back out of it at the very last minute, her reputation would be crushed to nothing. In the worst-case scenario, they might blame her and banish her from the inner wall. In the first place, it was highly unlikely that Akira would be okay with quitting at this point. For the hunters, the request to escort intercity transport was a fortuitous request. If Hikaru told him to back out although she was the one who strongly pushed that request to him, it would definitely buy her a lot of grudges. She did not even want to imagine what would happen to her after that. Okay okay. I just have to do this, right? Her route of retreat had already been destroyed. Which meant, her only choice was to push forward and reach for the win. She clapped both of her hands on her face and expelled the fear inside of her. Let's do this. Hikaru declared so to help herself get fired up as she gave off a strong smile. The transport terminal inside the wall was built like a harbor to handle large cargoes. The huge trucks carrying countless containers were going back and forth between the transport trucks and the warehouses. The size of the tires of those large trucks was even bigger than Akira. The transport truck was large enough to make those large trucks that hunters used look like cute tiny baby trucks. The scene laid out here really threw off the sense of the size for everyone there. Akira was looking closely at one of those vehicles and was completely overwhelmed by the size of it. Although he encountered them a few times in the wasteland, he never looked at them up close. Their sizes really felt different when he was this close to it. I know that this thing is designed to be used in the wasteland, but still, it's really something. If a vehicle this huge is going through the wasteland, it's no wonder it would attract monsters. That would explain why there were so many pruning requests. Well then, I'll be going now. Of course, Good luck. Akira walked through the ramp and boarded the vehicle, Hikaru saw him off with a smile. But after Akira vanished into the vehicle, her smile quickly turned wry. She only stood there while running her brain at full power, and then when the ramp was about to be removed, she finally made her decision and ran into the vehicle as well. Akira went to the room that he was assigned to and took a short rest there. Since the inside of the transport vehicle was considered as a part of the middle district, it was well equipped to welcome the guests suitable for those who would visit the middle district, the individual rooms were relatively large and equipped with all kinds of facilities. And to match its size, the bath in the bathroom was also equally big. The wall was equipped with holographic displays and projected the scene from the outside of the vehicle, it gave off a sense of grandiose. 
Hunters could also pay extra to get better rooms with more facilities, but Akira did not think that it was a wise thing to spend his reward for that. Akira's job was to watch the outside and to follow command when a battle broke out. Since the escorts groups and posts were already decided beforehand, they were free to do anything until they were called upon. Akira was thinking of going to the cafeteria or perusing the merchant quarters to waste time. As he left the room, that was right when Hikaru, who was running toward his room, arrived at his door. Hikaru was still panting when she asked Akira. Hey Akira. Where? Are you going? I'm just thinking of checking the cafeteria or the stands. I I see. W L. Can you please stay in your room? For now. P please. Hikaru was still panting as she meekly pushed Akira back into his room. Akira was weirded out by it but still decided to get back to his room. Hikaru was trying to calm her breath while giving off a rather anxious look, Akira frowned at Hikaru and threw a question at her. The truck will be going soon, is it okay for you to be here? Weren't you planning to give me support from the city? That was the plan, but there's a small change in that plan. I'll be going with you too. It's faster to give you support from closer by after all. Although I can't help you during the fight, we don't need to worry much about lag and interference when we're close. I'll be with you for the full three days, so, I'll be in your care. I see, in that case, I'll be in your care as well. Now then, I'll be going out for a bit dash. Wait. Akira stepped back and was really weirded out by Hikaru, who stopped him so suddenly and desperately. But Hikaru then gave a polite smile and said. Please just stay in the room. If you want to do something outside, please tell me first. If it's something I can do, then I'll do it for you. So don't leave this room, okay? Why don't you want me to go out that much? As expected, Akira started to find it suspicious. Hikaru tried to keep calm as she looked for an excuse. Although you received permission to go to the middle district, we actually kind of forced it so that the permission got approved on time. Because of that, some data is still being processed. I'm worried that the security system might not correctly recognize the permission supposed to be granted to you. So, if it's possible, I want you to just stay in this room. I'm sorry, this is all my fault. Is that so? Ah, that's why you suddenly have to change your plan, huh? Why yes, exactly. I'm really sorry. Well, it can't be helped then. Fine, I'll refrain from going out from this room as much as I can. Thank you, and again, sorry. Hikaru sighed in relief, Akira sent a glance at Alpha who was floating next to Hikaru. Alpha. She's not lying, but I bet it's just an excuse. Thought so. Well, I'm sure she has her reasons too. She has been acting weird ever since she left the car to call Kabayashi, I wonder if Kabayashi said something to her. Since it was basically an order from his requester and it was not something that hard to do, Akira thought that there was no need to unnecessarily refuse that order and did not dwell any further on it. For the time being, Hikaru's plan was to reduce Akira's contact with others. This was in order to reduce the possibility of him causing any form of trouble as much as possible and that plan was going well for now. The displays on the wall suddenly turned on, showing the views outside the vehicle. It seemed that the vehicle finally started moving. The large transport vehicle approached the high walls. The wall then started to move and opened a passage into the wasteland. The transport vehicle passed through that opening and immediately accelerated the moment it entered the wasteland. With this, Akira's request to escort the transport had begun. Rebuild World, Chapter 233, Eastern Area The transport that Akira was boarding lined up with the other transport trucks and formed a long line in the middle of the wasteland. Their huge size left behind a trail of dust storms, it was an easy thing to spot the convoy from afar. They marched forward mercilessly, pushing aside and crushing anything in their way. Rubble meters in length and large carcasses were no match to the size of the transport truck. None of them could even pose a challenge to the vehicle. 
The transport vehicles were equipped with powerful force field armor that could easily deflect cannon warheads. The cannon perching on top of it had enough firepower to shoot down flying monsters. It had enough space to carry the population of a small town, with all its members armed to the teeth. It was so well equipped that it could be called a moving fortress. That was the transport vehicle that Akira and the other hunters were boarding. Akira was there as the escort to Gigant 3. He already had his position decided beforehand, so he was currently waiting for the hourly guard exchange while talking and studying with Alpha to kill the time. During that time, he glanced at Hikaru, who was moving her mouth as if she was quipping. She was not making any sound and smiling while facing toward an empty space. She would only make a sound when she was using a mini AR device to negotiate with someone from afar. To Akira, who already knew what he was doing, this scene seemed completely normal. However, for those who had no idea, she looked like a madwoman talking to herself. Alpha. Do I look like that too when I'm talking to you? Only when we're alone. But I've always made sure that you won't look like that when there's someone else, so it's fine, at least, it's fine right now. So basically, I was completely hopeless back when I just met you, huh? Bet I stuck out a lot. Akira smiled wryly next to Alpha who was smiling amusedly. Hikaru lightly bowed and sighed. It seemed that she had finished negotiations. Hikaru then turned to Akira. Judging from her smile, it seemed that it went well. As Akira thought about why she was looking at him, sudden order to dispatch reached him. Akira was about to pick it up, but Hikaru stopped him with her hand signal. Thus, he paused for a bit before finally picking it up. He was a bit surprised to see the person shown in the display of his augmented vision. Although the notification said that he was connected to someone in command, the person displayed was Hikaru. Akira immediately glanced at Hikaru and saw her smile mischievously at him. It seems that it went well, I'm a part of the escort unit's commander now. I'm glad that I made it on time. Akira, I'm joining the escort unit as your operator. Akira raised his eyebrows. He was obviously surprised, Hikaru noticed that too as she smiled wryly and explained. Well, although I'm an operator, it's not like I'm going to bother you with my orders. Basically, I'll just convey the orders that I receive from the higher-ups to you. In exchange, if you want to be allowed to ignore said order. Oh. It could be either because it was a bad order or because you are not in a position to obey it. Regardless of the reason, I can negotiate in your place. So instead of being an operator that gives you detailed support, I'll focus more on supporting you so that you can move freely. Ah, uh, I see, all right then. I'll be counting on you. Just leave it to me, well then, as my first job as your operator, Akira, get ready. I'll guide you as close as possible to your post once you're ready. Hikaru said so to Akira with a smile, although there were lies mixed in her words, Akira could not notice them thanks to how skilled she was. Once Akira was done with his preparation, they left the room and walked through the transport's hallway guided by Hikaru. She was walking next to Akira while vigilantly watching her surroundings as if she was carefully walking through the dangerous ruin. As expected, Akira found that very weird, but he then caught Alpha smiling amusedly next to him. What? HM. Well, it's just that she basically doesn't allow you to get out of your room, and when you do, she'll always be close by. That bracelet also allowed her to track your location all the time. It's as if you're a prisoner. Just what did I do to deserve this treatment? Killing many people outside the wall, although it doesn't really matter to me, it seems that is not the case for city management. Akira somehow was able to make a guess as to the reason why Hikaru was treating him like that. It's not like I'm involved in all those things because I wanted to, though. Of course, but it's a completely different story whether they'll trust you or not, right? Yeah, you're right. Akira threw a bitter smile, which Hikaru could not have noticed. The top of the transport vehicle was basically flat. It was designed to maximize the efficiency of the force field armor. 
Because of that, the only thing that could serve as a shield from the wind was the huge cannons perched on top of the transport vehicle. With the vehicle traveling at high speed, the atmosphere on the roof was constantly turbulent. Akira's post was on the rooftop. Thus, he was standing straight in the middle of the raging storm, which would have blown any normal human away. It was only thanks to his augmented suit that he could stand straight. The enemy detection was done through the powerful radar installed on the vehicle. So, Akira's current job was to wait there until he received an order that allowed him to start shooting. Akira stood on one edge of the rooftop and scanned over the wasteland. The fast-moving transport vehicle had already entered the eastern area of the eastern district. Although he was still far away from the front line, the area was already filled with monsters that were way stronger and smarter than the monsters around Kagamayama City. Even the view there left Akira the impression that he was looking at something high-tech. Alpha. There's something that looks like a huge bird in the sky over there with a column-like building hanging under it, you're not playing with my vision, right? Nope. Then, I guess it's a real monster, huh? Akira glanced at Alpha, aside from her unrealistic beauty coupled with the too exposed dress and the fact that she sometimes floated in the air, she looked like a real person. People could feel her if they touched her through their prosthetic body or augmented suit, but in reality, she was not there. Meanwhile, the fantasy-like bird that was flying far away was not virtual, it was a real monster. I feel like I am starting to not be able to trust my own eyes. There are things in this world that are real although you can see them, you know. I know the real meaning of that saying is different from what you're implying. But it's true. The connection between you and me is not something that eyes can see, right? That's true, but still. Deals, contracts, trust, debts, favors, schemes, compromises, obligations, evaluations, toleration. Alpha built a complicated connection through the old world domain based on all these factors. As for whether this link was weak or strong, Alpha herself was not certain. Nonetheless, Alpha wished to create a stronger connection with Akira when she smiled at him. However, Akira just thought that Alpha was being cryptic as usual and just ignored her smile. Hikaru's voice suddenly could be heard from the comms and her image quickly appeared in his augmented vision. Akira, the monsters are coming, a swarm of flying monsters are approaching. The transport's cannon will take care of the bigger ones, so you only need to focus on the smaller ones when they are closing in on you. There's no need to fight the ones outside your range even if you have the leeway to. As long as there's no order to do so, the other hunters might mistake it as you trying to snatch their prey and reward, so it might cause some issues. I'll send you their locations, you can make your own decision based on that data. Another display showing the enemy's locations appeared in Akira's augmented vision. Akira could see a swarm of monsters coming from the front of the transport convoy, the display also showed that none of them were currently Akira's targets. Just tell me if you're having a hard time over there, I'll send help. Roger that, well, I'll do the best I can first before asking for help. Is that everything? Yes, if I may add something, I'm basically monitoring you as an operator, so you can show me your cool side, or so I want to say, but. Hikaru's smile which was brimming with confidence up until that point suddenly turned cloudy. Just because I said so, there's no need for you to do anything reckless like what Kibayashi wants. Akar smiled bitterly and replied. It's not like I did them because I wanted to. Is that so? That kind of thing depends on the individual, I guess. Well, I'll be watching as the operator so we can compare our impressions later. Now then, good luck, Akira. Hikaru's image vanished from Akira's display. He then changed gear to get ready for the fight. The monsters approaching the convoy had come close enough to be seen with naked eyes. When Akira locked his gaze at those monsters, Akira's information gathering device recognized the enemy as it augmented Akira's vision to be able to clearly see them. The swarm looked like a group of flying insects. The display also added the information of their distance as well as their location. But when Akira glanced at the distance, he found it rather surprising. Oh, wait. 
Are they still that far away? Are these numbers correct? They're so big that they already look that big although they're still so far away. And since there's nothing to compare to when they're flying in the sky, it's so difficult to grasp how far away they are with just your eyes. Is that so? But I still feel like the number is a little bit too big, though. In that case, let's add something to help you compare. Alpha suddenly vanished and reappeared next to the monsters. As Akira compared the size of the monster and Alpha, he could not help but frown. The oval-like monster had a relatively small head with small round eyes. That eye alone was already bigger than Alpha. Although the initial impression made it seem like a small insect that Akira could easily scoop with the tip of his finger, its true size was comparable to that of a small island. Worse, these humongous monsters were all flying toward the convoy. Isn't that just way too big? So, the eastern region is filled with these kinds of monsters, huh? No wonder hunters there bring their tanks and powered suits with them. Alpha reappeared next to Akira again and smiled at him. Oh my, are you scared now? To be honest, yeah, a bit. But being big doesn't mean that I can't defeat them. I fought something that big before too and compared to that time, I have better equipment now. So, I'll just do what I usually do. And it's not like I have to fight all of them in the first place. But still, give me full support this time. Just leave it to me. They're coming, Akira. Alpha pointed her finger to the direction where the convoy was heading, the other vehicles in front of the one they were on had already started firing their cannons. Multiple cannons fixed their aim at the incoming swarm. Then they released a loud explosion, followed by a lance of light that pierced the swarm. Although the light lance looked similar to the AF antimaterial cannon, its speed, accuracy, firepower, and size were completely different. As these lances cut through the swarm, they drilled a hole through the monster's resilient-looking armor, evaporated and melted their organs, and ended them. As the monsters fell to the ground one by one, due to their size and their distance, they seemed to be falling in slow motion from Akira's point of view. At the same time, the cannons started shooting, the transport vehicles ahead also started deploying drones to fight the monsters. Each of them was equipped with powerful rifles with extended magazines, which they used to release a barrage. The convoy also did not hold back releasing all of their missiles toward the swarm. The bullet storm and explosions made easy work of the smaller monsters. Among the deployed robots and drones, there were also some infantry which also participated in the battle. Since they were equipped with weapons used in the eastern district, they were able to mow down the smaller monsters without any issue at all. The intense battle continued. Akira was watching it in amazement. They're really not holding anything back. So, this is how the hunters in the east fight. Air, what can I say? It's like we're living in different worlds. I don't think your impression is wrong. The further east you go, the more sophisticated the technology. And the civilization created with such technology is an abnormality in itself. Well, we're talking about an area filled with those flying things after all. So, it's obvious that it's not normal. And there are hunters who work and live there, so it's only to be expected that they're also not normal either. And here I thought that I've grown pretty strong, but I guess there's always a bigger fish, huh? Stronger escorts were assigned to the front of the convoy and Akira right now was assigned to somewhere near the end of the convoy. So compared to the other hunters, he was relatively on the weaker side. Akira imagined just how big the world was inside. He was making a rather conflicted expression mixed with a tint of both admiration and self-mockery. But Alpha was smiling as usual at Akira and said to him. If you keep looking up at the sky while you're climbing a mountain, you won't notice how far you're from the top, but there's no mistaking it. You're getting closer to the tip. So don't worry, there's no need to rush. Let's climb it at our own pace. You're right. Akira pulled himself together and managed to give a smile to Alpha, who replied with a confident smile. Now then, let's do what we usually do. 
Akira, let's take them down and add them to your track record for the sake of reaching the top. Alpha pointed at the monsters that broke through the front and started shooting at the transport vehicles at the back of the convoy. They were the smaller monsters that the vanguards let go through since they were relatively harmless and would not be able to deal much damage to the transport vehicles. But even so, they were still huge compared to a single human. Some of them stuck themselves on the side or on the top of the transport vehicle and started biting off its armor. While the other small group continued forward toward where Akira and the rest were. The display indicating the enemy started changing color to let Akira know that they were his responsibility now. Roger that. Akira smiled and aimed his rifle. With LEO multi-rifle in both hands, he aimed the muzzles toward the incoming monsters and started shooting. Hikaru was observing the situation of the battle from inside the transport vehicle. She was checking the information sent from Akira's information terminal and the sensors of the transport vehicle to look for enemies. She was watching closely at the flow of the battle from that information she was receiving and was planning to send a help request without asking Akira first in case the situation got worse. But it seemed that there was no need to do so. Akira already turned everything that entered his area into minced meat and the number of the dead carcasses scattered in his area only kept increasing. He was holding the line against the swarming monsters using countless bullets and warheads. Despite being at a great disadvantage in terms of numbers, Akira was pushing back the swarm just fine. The camera fixed on Akira's headgear swayed left and right, up and down, following Akira's movement. But it was not as bad as how fast Akira shifted his aim around. Of course, Akira did not have a problem following that movement but that was not the case for Hikaru. Ah, uh, nope, I'm out, this is going to make me puke. Thinking that it would help her judge the situation better, Hikaru tried to follow Akira's movement. But she knew that it would be impossible to keep doing that any longer and dialed down the setting on her augmented vision. As she zoomed out the display of Akira's vision, she expanded the data feed from the transport sensor. The information display showed the blips around Akira vanishing one by one. Although the swarm was far from eradicated, judging at how fast the blips were vanishing, it seemed that the monsters could not overwhelm Akira. This is amazing. No wonder Kibayashi likes him. Although she evaluated Akira's skills highly, she was still making a stern expression. In the worst case scenario, someone of this level of strength might rampage inside the middle district. And when that happened, the perpetrator and the one who allowed him inside would have to take responsibility for the damage, basically, it was Akira and her. Those who had successfully handled dangerous articles for a long time were given special privileges to match their achievement. As such, those who were able to handle them skillfully and produce profits were rewarded with special rights. This was exactly why Kibayashi had a lot of special privileges, this was also true for the relationship between hunters and the hunter office. The corporate government was still having a hard time making sure that their power, which was enough to pose a threat to the whole eastern district, was to be used for the sake of good and for the development of the eastern district. At the very least, for now, they were managing themselves well. Hikaru herself was yearning to join them, or at least, up until now. Ha! This is a mistake. No, I'll do it. Like hell I will lose here. She shook her head and tried to banish that weak thought that she just worded out as she renewed her resolve. Akira was moving around the rooftop of the transport vehicle while shooting the monsters down. The muzzles in front of his eyes were moving extremely fast. He no longer had the leeway to leisurely take aim, all of his focus was assigned to confirm the situation in front of his eyes. He was receiving the data straight from his expensive information terminal through his connection to the old world domain. He unconsciously took that flow of information as a normal thing and his brain used that information to perceive the world. Thanks to that, Akira was able to feel where the monsters were and quickly aimed his rifles in their general direction. He then used the aiming device connected to his headgear display to make the smaller adjustment to his aim. Then to top it off, Alpha also made a finer readjustment on his aim as well. 
The bullets that Akira was using for his LEO multi-rifles were fueled by force field reactants. Instead of using physical force, their firepower came from compressed energy, this type of bullet was known as charge bullet. Although, theoretically, there was no limit in how much energy it consumed, the available technology became the limiter of its firepower since stuffing too much compressed energy would cause the bullet to explode instead of flying forward. Furthermore, the energy to power conversion became highly inefficient quickly past a certain level. Thus, further limiting the firepower of the charge bullet. The charge bullet drew energy from the energy pack and compressed it to increase the firepower of the bullet, Alpha made an adjustment in that process as such, the bullets only consumed the right amount of energy needed to kill the monsters that Akira was fighting. While at the same time, Akira made sure to use the expensive extended magazine for his LEO multi-rifle so that he would not run out of ammo. Due to these factors, the firepower, accuracy, and shooting speed of the LEO multi-rifles that Akira was using were abnormally high, and this was true for both the left and the right ones. Akira was constantly swinging them around, spreading death and destruction to everything around him. Even with the overwhelming number of monsters in the swarm, the dead carcasses that were piling up around him made it obvious which one was overwhelming the other. From Hikaru's point of view, it seemed that Akira was having an easy time dealing with the monsters, but in reality, Akira could not take that fight easy. There are just too many of them. What the heck with this number? Akira already killed several monsters and the carcasses scattered around him were in no way scarce. But the monsters just kept coming at him. Although Alpha, who was smiling next to him, let him know that the situation was still far from dangerous, Akira still could not help but spit out some complaints. Akira, if it's so hard on you, you can ask Hikaru for some help, you know. If it's way more than I can handle with your support, then I don't mind asking her now. In that case, there's no need to then. Alpha and Akira exchanged a smile which let both of them know that they were doing fine, but Akira then frowned. Alpha, just how many more do I need to kill? You're doing very well, these smaller monsters are all coming from the bigger monsters that were shot down. It's just like those smaller spiders from that tank tarantula, you remember that one, right? So, it's the same as that monster. I see. With their size, it's not strange for there to be so many monsters. There doesn't seem to be an end to them. Well, there is also the fact that they are swarming all the transport vehicles, so even if you clean up the ones around you, it won't take much time for the monsters surrounding the area to fill in the vacuum. To be more precise, although Akira was assigned somewhere in the back, it was still originally an area assigned for a whole team. It was only because Hikaru somehow forced her way to get Akira in, that he was able to accept this escort job. Furthermore, in order to avoid any possible trouble in the chain of command, there was quite a distance between each team. This was to lower the chance of them getting into a fight. Due to that, Akira had to do the job that was originally meant for multiple people, alone. Hikaru knew that this would happen and so she had prepared accordingly. But it seemed that it was unnecessary seeing how Akira was able to handle that job alone just fine. Akira had no plan to call for help but fighting an unending flow of monsters was still hitting his motivation hard. Since it was not like there was anything else he could do there, Akira decided to use that chance to get a better track record. Alright then. Let's use this chance to get a good achievement. Alpha. Let's get a little bit more serious. Roger that. Alpha understood what Akira was talking about through telepathy, she then smiled and changed her instruction that she had been holding back to increase Akria's destructive power. Of course, the monsters did not just stand there waiting for Akira to destroy them. Although with their relatively large size, these monsters were flying agilely like small insects and had the power to lift multiple times their body weight. Their speed and strength were just as great as their size. The armor scales that enveloped their bodies could easily deflect normal bullets while their legs, arms, and jaws could easily crush metals and rubble. Although the transport vehicles were protected by force field armor, they still could not withstand this assault forever. Not to mention, 
many of the monsters also had long-range weapons. They were spitting out fluid produced from an organ that grew out from their bodies. The fluid itself also varied. Some of them hardened and turned into bullets in mid-air, some of them had an abnormally sticky property, while some were highly acidic and melted everything they touched. Either way, it would be fatal if Akira got hit by any of them. The hardened fluid would crush his body, while the sticky fluid would stop his movement and he would drown in them, and the acidic fluid would melt his body. These fluids started dotting the rooftop, thus limiting the area where Akira could safely set foot on. Akira quickly jumped between the safe areas, although they were not that many and not that wide to give Akira a place to plant himself, he was still able to jump between them without slowing down at all. He understood and followed the visual instructions that Alpha placed in his augmented vision. Moreover, the force field armor on his augmented suit also served some level of protection from the acidic fluid. He moved around swiftly to evade the incoming attacks while shooting down the enemies so that it would give him more places to step on. While at the same time, he was also hurting the monsters. Due to his hurting, the monsters around Akira were concentrated into one location and it only grew more concentrated with time. Although Akira was surrounded just a moment ago, he now was fighting the monsters in one general direction. Right when he reached that point, Akira pulled back his LEO multi-rifles and turned on the AF antimaterial cannon on his back. As the AF antimaterial cannon unfolded in front of him, Akira gripped it with both of his hands and changed its setting to maximize the shooting area. After he pulled down the trigger, he also swung the cannon in an arc. The light lance shot out from the AF antimaterial cannon's muzzle swallowed the monsters in front of it. Once the light went off and vanished to the distance, due to the lowered firepower in exchange for the area covered, none of the monsters disintegrated. But that did not mean that it did not have any effect on them, the monsters that were swallowed by the light started falling to the ground one by one. While those that were still flying had lost their original mobility due to the damage, although they still could fly, they would not be able to catch up with the transport vehicle anymore and were left behind just like that. Akira lightly sighed. Although he was satisfied with the result, he was still frowning. That took out most of them, but am I in the red with that one? I wonder. It depends on how they calculate the reward, but if I have to say, it might be in the red. The ammunition for the AF antimaterial cannon was extremely expensive. Although it was a trump card to kill huge monsters, it was not designed to clean up small fries. If that shot did not take out enough small fries, it would definitely mean his total revenue would be in the red. Akira knew that very well, but he told himself that it was for the sake of building up his career as a hunter and decided to use it. At least, that was what he thought before he pulled the trigger. It's fine. I don't want to spend time chipping on a swarm that big. I'll leave it to Hikaru so that it will end up in black. Yep, let's do that. You're right, let's put our hope in her negotiation skill. Alpha was smiling mischievously as if she was teasing Akira and he just returned with a bitter smile. After Akira eliminated his area from monsters, the other monsters near the area quickly filled in that vacuum. Akira, we have reinforcements. All right. One more time. Akira returned LEO multi-rifles to both of his hands and started shooting at the incoming monsters, hoping that the reward from that would balance out shooting his AF antimaterial cannon. Rebuild World, Chapter 234, The Difference of What is Normal Akira got too fired up fighting the monsters and ended up using AF antimaterial cannon three times, that was when he noticed a change. They stopped coming, didn't they? As he said so, he scanned the area and saw the other hunters were still locked in an intense fight with the swarm. So, it was not like the swarm retreated, but even so, none of them was trying to come near Akira. Akira knitted his eyebrows. Akira, don't relax yet, let's use this opening to reload. You're right. As Alpha ordered, Akira checked his equipment. He took some medicines, exchanged the energy packs and magazines for new ones. And while he was at it, he also walked around and kicked the dead monsters off the rooftop to give him more space to move around. 
but even after finishing all that, there were still no monsters trying to approach him. This sudden free time really weirded Akira out, but when he looked around, the others were still locked in intense battles. The reason why no more monsters coming at him was simply because he had already killed too many. The dead monsters were releasing a pheromone that would normally attract other monsters, but when it got too thick and reached above a certain level, it instead repelled monsters. That thick pheromone let the other monsters know that there was a power gap in that area so the weak monsters with no winning chance would avoid getting closer. While at the same time, the thick pheromone would also attract bigger and stronger monsters to come. But in this situation, those stronger ones were already killed first by the vanguards, so none of the bigger monsters was able to reach where Akira was. The vanguards knew that it would be disastrous to let any of the bigger monsters pass through them, that was why they made sure that none could pass. Thanks to that, no more monsters approached Akira, who was stationed a little bit too far to the back that no monsters would try to attack him. Seems like I have nothing to do now. In that case, how about going to the other transport vehicles to help the other team? Or so I want to say but I'm sure Hikaru would stop you from doing it. Yep, that sounds just about right. Akira would go if he was called, but he had no plans to go around uninvited to the other areas and snatch the rewards from the other hunters. So, for now, he thought of at least telling Hikaru that he was free and could lend other areas help if needed, but before he could call her, Hikaru called him first. Akira, just in case you are curious, there are help requests that you can take up. Sure, where? Hikaru was lightly shocked by that sudden and casual answer from Akira. You don't have to push yourself too hard, you know. Just because there are help requests, it doesn't mean that you have to take them. You fought quite a lot already, aren't you tired? You can take a break, refresh your supply, and only take on the requests if you really want to. It would be bad if they start forcing help requests to you, you know. I already took a short break and I still have some leeway in my medicine and ammo reserve. I would also be sticking out if the rest are still fighting while I'm just taking it easy here. Well, of course, I won't help them just for free, but I'll leave that part to you. If they won't pay me for taking on their help requests, I'll be more than happy to just stand by. Akira chuckled as he said so, Hikaru replied with a smile. All right then. I got it. Just leave that part to me. For starters, I'll send the help request details to you. Good luck, Akira. The help request's detail was added into Akira's augmented vision, and it identified the extra area that was assigned to him. Now then, let's keep this up for a little bit longer. Alpha smiled teasingly and spoke. Yeah, let's do that, after all, we need to make sure that you actually earn instead of lose right? Don't worry, it will be okay, right? According to the contract, he was to pay for his ammo on his own. Although it was unlikely that he would end up in the red, it did not mean that the possibility was zero. In order to shake off that creeping anxiety, Akira took up his LEO multi-rifles and went to answer the help request, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Hunters were fighting desperately on the back of the convoy. They were the hunter group consisting of hunters around rank 40. It was obvious from their movements and teamwork that they were already used to working in a team. So, they were completely a different unit compared to a simple gathering of hunters who worked together for the first time. The inside of the vehicle was equipped with portable walls, especially around the entrance. They were using the energy from the force field armor on the rooftop to increase their durability, of course, they did that with proper permission. The hunters used these walls as covers as they fought against the monsters. The bullets slowly tore off the armor plating from the huge insects and eventually killed them. The rooftop was already riddled with dead monsters as they fell over to the ground one by one. But the situation was far from good, the monsters were too numerous. We can't keep this up forever, you know. What's going on with the help request? We've already sent them, you know. Multiple times as a matter of fact. But since no one is coming, it only means that the other sides are facing the same problem as well. They can at least send us the reserve force, you know. Yeah, they did. 
but they were already sent to the transport vehicles that sent the help requests first, you see. I knew it, we should have sent the help request sooner. It can't be helped, you know. Melshiasan warned us that she would crush us if we sent a help request so lightly. I'm pretty sure what she meant by that is that we should handle the situation better so that we don't get crushed, you know. It's true that we made a mistake and handled the situation wrongly. What we can do now is nothing more than by time. We'll lose at this rate, but it's not like it would happen right away. If the people in the front finish off those larger monsters, the situation will turn around. So, we just need to survive until then. I know I know. God damn it. Everyone there understood that what they were doing was simply buying time in a losing battle. But even so, they were still able to maintain their teamwork and fought relatively well. That was the biggest reason why they were able to postpone their defeat for that long. As the losing battle continued, the hunters were pushed back, monsters kept coming non-stop and the density of monsters surrounding the hunters kept slowly increasing. Some of the hunters already lost their arms from the acid fluid, some were enveloped in the sticky fluid and could not move, so they ended up having to cut off their limbs to stay alive. Some were badly wounded from the hardened fluid. The wounded were sent to the rear, which meant that they could only produce less pressure to hold back the monsters. As such, the faster they were pushed back and the faster the monsters mobbed them. Everyone in the team understood that their time was slowly coming, and a heavy mood befell them. But right on the next moment, the area was enveloped in a blinding light. The blinding light temporarily devoured the monsters and disintegrated them in an instant. The hunters were taken aback as that light went off and was gone. Once their vision returned, they could see some of the stronger monsters rise back up with some of their body parts scorched black. So that wasn't enough to kill all of them, huh? The hunters there had their jaws hanging, there was also another emotion mixed in their expression. Alpha was smiling wryly next to Akira who just used his AF anti-material cannon to help out the hunters. Some of them survived. Well, we're shooting from this far and there are a lot of them. You need to also note that we were focused on the area of effect, so the firepower got lowered. One more time then. Damn it. Akira noticed that the monsters were outside his LEO multi-rifle's effective range, so he decided to use AF antimaterial cannon instead. Although that decision was not a mistake, it did not alleviate the ammo expense. He could not help but frown, imagining how much money he just used to fire that shot. Let's clear the leftovers and hope that the reward is worth the expense. You're right. Akira immediately started running to close the distance, this time, he used his LEO multi-rifles to mow down the surviving monsters. As half of the monsters surrounding the hunters were eradicated, they quickly bounced back and joined the battle. The situation was turned over, Akira and the hunters had the upper hand now. As they cleaned up the monsters in the area, reinforcement slowed down and shrunk in size. It was not like the monsters were limitless as well. With the hunters working hard, it was a matter of time before the swarm was eradicated. As Akira thought that should take care of the monsters for the time being, another notice came from the security, which showed the enemy's location in the area. Although there were no more monsters around them, there was a huge swarm coming from outside the area under their watch. They immediately glanced toward the direction of the signal and found another swarm of insect-like monsters coming at them. But this time, they were bigger than the ones that they just fought. Wait for a sec, aren't there a bit too many? And a bit too big as well? Among the monsters that came out from the mother ship-like monsters that were defeated by the vanguard, the smaller ones reached us first and basically the rest, which are mostly the medium-sized monsters, finally caught up with the transport vehicle. Give me a break already, it's not funny at all. Akira frowned thinking that, as expected, this was out of what he could handle, the other hunters there thought the same and had the same expression as him. But Alpha was smiling as usual, Akira noticed that and was about to ask if he had a winning chance against that swarm when the answer revealed itself. A barrage composed of energy bullets and physical bullets blazed straight toward the swarm and shot the monsters down one by one. 
The energy bullet extended like a lance that cut open the swarm while the physical bullets dyed the sky in fiery explosions, devouring the monsters in it. Akira quickly traced back the source of those bullets. A powered suit from the front line flew to the back of the convoy. All the five fingers of its each arm turned into cannon muzzles. The right hand was shooting out physical bullets while the left was shooting energy bullets. A heavily armed woman was standing on the shoulder of that powered suit. That woman was the leader of the hunters in that area, Melchia. She was wearing an Old World augmented suit, and as usual, the Old World design was very daring. The extra arms that were coming out from her shoulders and back were carrying huge rifles that did not suit the size of those arms. While a flying device that was equipped on her back extended to her lower half. Melchia noticed her men cheering on her, after sending a glance at them, she also noticed Akira and obviously raised her guard. She then jumped from the powered suit's shoulder and landed next to Akira. Akira was a little surprised when Melchia landed next to him. She then threw a friendly smile with a tint of suspicion at him. I'm pretty sure this area is assigned to my team though. You're not a new member of the team either. So, who are you? I'm here because of the help request, I. Before Akira said his name, he suddenly stopped there and smiled wryly. Sorry, I'm under a strict prohibition from my operator so I can't speak any further. Melshia also received a flustered call from Hikaru through the security team's shared network. Melshia was being extra careful of Akira since they just got through a bad experience with a stranger infiltrating her team not too long ago. But after seeing how flustered Hikaru was, she lowered her guard and smiled wryly. I see. You must be having it hard too, huh? I'm Melshia, thank you for saving my men. I'll take care of the rest, so it's okay now. You can go ahead and take a break first. Later then. Melshia then returned to the shoulder of the powered suit and went charging toward the swarm. The weapons fixed on her augmented suit had more or less the same firepower even when compared to the firepower of the powered suit she was on, and she was showing that power in full view in front of her men as well as her opponents. As the vanguards finished taking care of the larger monsters, they slowly joined the battle at the back of the convoy. The tanks and the powered suits coursed back, past transport vehicles one by one. While the hunters used the flying device equipped on their augmented suits to jump to the transport vehicles behind them, some of them had air bikes. With the vanguard joining the fight, they had the upper hand to quickly disperse the remaining monsters. Akira was watching that battle and thought that there was nothing left for him to do. Hikaru, can I get back inside now? Or should I just stand by at my post? Just return back to your post for now. I'll get permission from the security team first and pick you up after that. All right. Good work out there. But still, it's obvious even from my point of view that those hunters are abnormally strong. Couldn't agree more to that. It was as the saying goes, there would always be someone else better. Akira could really appreciate that saying now. After that, it did not take long for the escort team to clean up the rest of the swarm. Although it was still a bit too early to end their shift, Akira and the rest of the hunters were allowed to leave their post. They still could fight if the need arises, but many of them were injured. All of them needed rest and to resupply. It was an important thing to maintain their fighting strength, that was why they were allowed to get back inside the transport vehicles. As Akira returned back in, Hikaru welcomed him with a smile. She then stuck close to Akira and escorted him back to his room. Taking it positively, it looked like they were lovers, but taking it negatively, it looked like Akira was being treated like a prisoner. Other hunters who saw that had two different impressions. The first one was that it was a hunter trying to look cool during his escort duty and brought a girl with him. While the other was that Akira was a hunter with restricted permission and had to be kept under supervision all the time. Although each hunter had slightly different impressions, most of them leaned toward the latter. After returning to his room, Akira was recommended by Hikaru to take a good rest. She would be watching the radar and take care of anything else. 
So, Akira took off his augmented suit and threw it together with the exclusive inner that came with the augmented suit to the laundry machine, while he himself went to the bath. It was so luxurious that it made him feel a bit conflicted as he unconsciously compared that to the bath back home. The high-tech laundry finished laundering and drying the augmented suit and the inner in no time. Akira felt that it was a bit regrettable as he dragged himself out of the bath, put on the inner and returned to his room. Akira then started stretching his body, which was a daily routine for him. He made sure to stretch every part of his body to slowly increase the flexibility of his body. One of the stretches that he did was standing on one foot while having his other foot pointing up, making almost a straight line while maintaining the balance. That was when he caught Hikaru watching him. What? Ah, uh, ah, uh, I it's just that you're pretty flexible, aren't you? The inner that Akira was wearing was designed to be durable enough to prevent inflammation when his skin rubbed the augmented suit as he moved around inside it, while at the same time, it was also thin and tight enough to allow sensation to flow through the augmented suit and convey it to his skin. Because of that, it stuck close to his well-trained and pronounced body. Although it was a little too stimulating for a girl around her age, Hikaru thought that it would be a bad move to get flustered there since Akira seemed to be completely fine with it. So, Hikaru tried to come up with something else, but he misunderstood it and replied with a confident smile. My body was really stiff before and I am only able to do this just recently. Thanks to it, I feel I can move way better in my augmented suit. Is it really that different? Yeah, I know someone who could not follow the movement of his augmented suit and ended up having his arm torn off, you see. I'm pretty sure that something like that is completely avoidable with a body that is flexible enough. Hikaru could not help but imagine the tragic bloody scene and turn pale. T torn off. Well, it might be an exaggeration to say it was torn off. But it's true that the joint was torn, and he was in a lot of pain. It would have been fatal if he had been in the middle of a fight. It would be impossible to perform normally even if he tried to force fix it with medicines. So, it's better to stretch my body like this beforehand to reduce the strain on it when I'm using an augmented suit, you see. I, I see, that must be tough. As an officer from city management, Hikaru knew that Akira frequently visited the hospital. She already knew that he had once received a full-body treatment and had his arm regrown after losing it. She knew the details of why and how Akira got those injuries. But all of them only ended up in mere knowledge, she still did not fully understand the real weight of that information. But after seeing how Akira fought and listened to his talk, and finally saw his body, the realization finally sunk in. A boy of around her age, sent to the hospital a few times after medicine overuse, was injured so badly to the point that he had to go through cell regenerative treatment. In short, his experience was filled with such a cruel life. Although she was only able to get a glance of it, that understanding caused her to stop having the awkward expression that she had and change into a serious one. It must have been really hard. I can't deny that, but still, I've already gotten used to it. Just how many cruel experiences did he have to go through to get used to it? Hikaru tried to think of an answer but she could not come up with anything. Even after the changing shift, Akira continued resting in his room. The security team changed the shift composition. The one who took Akira's place was someone who was forced to retreat during the previous battle, which caused the transport vehicle to take on more damage. After the previous battle, there were no more major confrontations with monsters, so the escort team mostly worked on cleaning the rooftop. They pushed the dead monsters off the rooftop, cleaned up the dangerous fluids, and made sure that no monsters were still alive. Although the payment was not as much, they were still paid for doing it. The reward for the hunters were usually calculated on a team-by-team -team basis. But Akira not only was able to do his job while well protecting his area which was originally a job for a team, he even went to help another team as well, as such, he was earning way too much money as a single hunter. Since there was a case where paying too much of a reward to a certain hunter caused dissatisfaction among the other hunters, as long as there was no emergency, Akira was thus placed on the reserve force. 
Meanwhile, hunters who went out to the field when they were not ordered to would be fined instead. Thus, it was not worth losing money because of something as silly as that. In order to balance out their rewards, the rest of the hunters were working their asses off while Akira was resting in his room. Akira and Hikaru were looking back at that battle on the rooftop. Hikaru was playing a slow motion replay of what she saw on the room's display, Akira was beside her explaining what he was doing in the clip. After listening to his explanation, Hikaru could not help but frown. Akira, that. Over there. You obviously shot at the monster when it was completely outside your field of vision, you know. And you hit it accurately on top of that, it's not like it happened out of luck, right? How exactly did you do it? Basically, I got the general direction from the information gathering device and then locked my aim using the video feed from the aiming device. While running? Yeah, while running. Akira replied so casually, Hikaru tilted her head and asked. Akira, do you know just how crazy you sound? Huh? See crazy. Seeing Hikaru looking at him like she was looking at a crazy person, Akira retraced back what he just said. He tried to put himself in a normal person's shoes, using his past self before he met Alpha as the starting line. He imagined how he would have reacted if he heard someone say the same thing to him. And as expected, he would have reacted the same way as Hikaru. I it's true that it's not something everyone can do. It's not like I could do that right from the start, you know. I only started being able to do that after getting expensive equipment and rigorous training, you see. You're basically saying that everyone can do that with good enough equipment and enough training? Ah. Uh. Well. Akira was about to say, of course, but he noticed Alpha smiled amusedly while shaking her head. It depends, I guess. Hikaru looked at Akira as if she was looking at an immensely problematic child and sighed. If you know that, I think you ought to rethink your actions, you know. Akira, who did not know that until now, could only smile wryly without saying anything back. Let's return back to the point you mentioned. You did say that you get the general direction from the information gathering device, right? To be honest, I can't really understand that part. How did you do that? Wait, I understand that it was the information gathering device that picked up the monster's locations, my question is how did you get that information? Judging from the recording, it doesn't seem that it's displayed in your augmented vision, you know. And I don't think you get that from sound as well. Well, ah, uh, about that, you see. What can I say? Of course, Akira could not say to Hikaru that he accessed that data using his connection to the old world domain. As Akira was trying to find a plausible answer, he ended up making vague excuses instead. But with that answer, Hikaru looked at him as if she was looking at a strange person and nodded convincingly as if she just remembered something. Oh, I see, so, you've gone through sixth sense training too, huh? Well, in that case, it's not strange for you to be able to understand the information from your information gathering device without using any display. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Akira was acting as if he understood what Hikaru was talking about while asking Alpha for help. Alpha, what is this sixth sense thingy? It's an artificial sixth sense which is outside the normal five senses that people usually have. The sixth sense was rather popular among high-ranking hunters. It started from the cyborgs who directly connected their brains with their information-gathering devices. It then evolved to a word referring to an artificial means to perceive information and to expand it outside five normal human senses. Basically, it referred to an extra sense outside the five normal senses. Kinetic sense to detect movement, thermal sense to detect heat, dynamic sense to understand 3D objects. There existed many kinds of sixth sense, it included abilities to perceive light with a wavelength outside the normal range or the ability to see 360 degrees. Of course, it was not something that one could easily gain by installing an extra device in one's brain. It was much more difficult to achieve compared to prosthetic arms or extension limbs. It relied deeply on the compatibility of the person. In the worst-case scenario, the brain might not be able to process that sense correctly, 
which would cause chaos in the brain. So, in order to get used to that difficulty and danger, hunters often would have to go through particular training. And then, the words, I can just tell, became an expression often used by those who had gone through such training and attained sixth sense. Normally, this expression was often used by those who received a sixth sense just recently. Although the word sixth sense was not an unfamiliar expression among the high-ranking hunters, more often than not, those high-ranking hunters had dozens of senses including their original five normal senses. So, judging from how Akira fought, Hikaru thought that it would not be strange for Akira to have more than five normal senses. After that, they continued discussing the record from the last fight with Akira asking for Alpha's help from time to time. Due to them going through the record in slow motion, when they finished reviewing the battle that should have only taken minutes, it was already night outside. Hikaru had a stern look on her face as she told Akira her thoughts. I'll now tell you my thoughts after seeing that recording. As someone from city management that has worked with many other hunters, I can say that I'm not exactly an amateur in this but I can't claim that I'm an expert in this either. I can't really judge what is normal and what is not normal for hunters. But with that being said, I want you to take my words positively as praise for your fighting skill. In one word, you're not right in the head. If what you're doing there is not reckless or crazy, I don't know what is. It's no wonder why Kibayashi is really invested in you. That is what I think. I, I see. For some reason that he did not really understand himself, Akira felt a bit discouraged. For two people to talk about what was normal when one of them lived in the inner wall while the other one in the outer wall. When one was a normal person while the other was a high-ranking hunter. The difference in what was normal was, as expected, unsurprisingly large. After all, it was as if they came from two different worlds. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Hikaru was taking a warm dip to heal the fatigue that she accumulated that day. She looked back into her memories of what happened inside, half of that sigh was from her enjoying the bath. Today was really full of surprises. And I still have two more days to go, huh? Working with Akira was filled with way more surprises than she had thought, it was especially hard on her mental stamina. That Kibayashi. He is basically working with multiple hunters who are like Akira, huh? It might even be in the dozens too. It's no wonder why he's so influential. The high-ranking hunters were way more skilled than the normal hunters, while at the same time, they were harder to handle as well, that realization hit Hikaru hard. She did not doubt her skill, but that did not mean everything went well for her. As she told herself that this was nothing more than a bump, she pulled herself together and renewed her resolve. All right then, only two days left, let's do this. But for that, I will need my important rest. This bath is even better than the one back home, so I might as well enjoy it while I have the chance. As expected, equipment for high-ranking hunters is really special. I wonder if this is normal for Akira. Seriously though, the world that we live in is really so different. Hikaru started to feel a tint of jealousy toward high-ranking hunters, it was normal for those hunters to earn billions of orum. The thought of Akira only using cheap baths daily never crossed her mind. After she finished her bath and changed into rental pajamas, she returned back to the room to find Akira already sleeping. He was even wearing his augmented suit's inners when sleeping. Hikaru took a peek at Akira's sleeping face. He was sleeping so soundly without a shred of anxiety. It was completely unlike how he usually was when he slept back in the slums back alley. When I look at him like this, he looks completely normal. Well then, good night, Akira. Hikaru smiled and went to sleep in the bed as well, since the bed itself was pretty big, it did not cause any inconvenience to her. Rebuild World, Chapter 235, Ziegelt City In the morning of the next day, Akira went up to the rooftop. It was not for watching the area, but to have a look at the sunrise. Powerful gust of turbulent wind was roaring on the rooftop, like usual. But it did not give much trouble to Akira and his augmented suit. But that was not the case for Hikaru, who came up there together with him. 
Don't let me go, okay? Don't ever let me go, alright? I know, I know. Akira was holding Hikaru close. Hikaru was also holding Akira close. They looked like a couple from the other's point of view. But unlike Akira, who was having an exasperated expression, Hikaru looked scared. So, it was obvious that they were not in that kind of relationship. I took you with me because otherwise, I wouldn't be allowed to come here, but, if you're really that scared, isn't it better if you go back inside? It's fine, right? I want to get the sunlight too, you know. At first, Akira was planning to go to the rooftop alone, but Hikaru, who wanted to keep Akira away from any possible conflict, wanted to keep Akira inside the room as much as possible. However, she did not want to worsen Akira's mood by rejecting his wish to go out. That was when she put a condition that she would have to accompany him. Saying wanting to get the sunlight was only an excuse to not leave Akira alone, while at the same time, it was also half true that she wanted to get some fresh air outside. With the transport convoy already entering the secured area near the destination city, there was close to zero danger from fighting, and that gave Hikaru an extra push to have a peek outside. But once she actually got onto the rooftop, the shaking from the transport vehicle and the strong wind alone were enough to scare her. That was the reason why she was clinging so closely and shamelessly onto Akira. But even so, she did not return back inside, half of it was because of pride while the other half was because of the safety that she felt from Akira holding her tightly with his augmented suit. If one of them was lacking, she would have returned back inside. Seeing Hikaru acting like that, Akira was a bit weirded out. He questioned why she would go that far just to bathe in sunlight, but after getting to soak in the warmth of the sunlight, he could somewhat understand where she was coming from and decided not to pursue the matter any further. Eventually, the sun showed itself from under the horizon line, the peaking sun banished the darkness of the night and unveiled the landscape of the desolate wasteland. This scene still attracted the curiosity of the people, even back during the Old World era. Akira looked over that scene and was glad that he went up to the rooftop. He noticed that Hikaru also stopped getting scared. As if she had completely forgotten that she was on the rooftop. Her shaking ceased and her eyes were fixated on the view unveiled by the morning sunlight. Akira found this change surprising, but he also knew that it was rude to interrupt her. Thus, he just silently held Hikaru in his arms to make sure she would not fall off. As the sun continued climbing up and finally left the horizon, the beautiful scene showed itself. It was the start of a new day. Hikaru, who was getting drowned by the breathtaking view, finally returned back to reality and noticed that Akira was looking at her with surprise in his eyes. She immediately blushed and spoke. T the view is very nice, isn't it? No wonder you wanted to wake up early and go to the rooftop to have a peek at this. Yeah. D do you usually look at the rising sun like this? I'm sure you often go out to the ruins as a hunter, right? No. Not that often. I won't go out so early in the morning to the wasteland just to see the rising sun. I mostly only go to the wasteland during the day, so I guess I only get to watch the sunrise when I have to go out to the wasteland early in the morning. I I see. How about you, Hikaru? And me? You really enjoyed that view, so I just thought that you must not have that much of a chance to watch the sunrise. But now that I think about it, I guess it's impossible to watch the sun rising from the horizon from inside the wall, huh? I won't say it's impossible, but it's extremely difficult. Tall buildings in the middle section like the Kagama building where you can look over the wasteland outside the wall are mostly reserved for individuals in high positions. So, it's impossible for someone like me to get a room in those kinds of building, you see. Is that so? I guess it's not all that easy living inside the wall, huh? Although Hikaru slowly regained her calm after idly conversing with Akira, she could not just ignore the fact that she was clinging close to a boy around her age. Her eyes battered around as she was looking for an excuse to change that situation. She quickly found a good excuse. Away in front of the convoy, a huge dome that looked like a hill showed itself. Akira, 
since we already got to see the rising sun, how about we return back? Ziegelt City is finally visible. Once we enter the city, the rooftop, as well as the inside of the transport vehicle, would be considered as a part of their middle district. It would be problematic if we get caught in some kind of trouble while we're out. So, let's get back into your room. Hikaru urged Akira to hurry up and they returned back together. She was still clinging close to Akira until they returned back inside the vehicle. Even if she was slowly getting used to the fear of being on the rooftop, she needed some time to fully return back to her usual self. Zegital City was fully enclosed in a dome. It had a wall that surrounded it just like Kagamayama City, but that wall extended further up and formed a semi-sphere on top of the city. The dome was made of a completely clear and transparent material. Thus, light from the outside could pass through it without any distortion at all. Thanks to that, the inside of the dome still felt liberating although it was completely encased. Even the tallest building inside the dome was still far from touching the dome, which helped give it an impression of an open space. Hikaru took a small self-driving vehicle and headed to Ziegelt City. She was alone, Akira stayed behind in his room, inside the transport vehicle. The transport vehicle was to resupply in that city and head back to Kagamayama City the next day. In short, the hunters had one free day inside the city. Most hunters used their free time to explore the city to kill time, but Akira was still confined inside his room, as per usual. Although Akira had the permission to step into the middle district, that permission was only for Kagamayama City, moreover, it was a temporary one. As such, it was not okay for Akira to go to the middle district of Ziegelt City with his current permission. Although Hikaru could most likely find a way to solve that issue, Hikaru did not want to increase the possibility of Akira bumping into trouble. Thus, she used it as an excuse to keep Akira inside his room. But Akira did not just accept it that easily. He asked Hikaru if she could do something about it. Hikaru did not want to sour his mood and she still wanted him to stay in his room. As such, they were looking for a place to compromise. Akira mentioned that he wanted to take a look at what kind of vehicles the hunters in this city were using since it was not that often he could visit a city in the east. Thus, it concluded with Akira not going out of his room, and in exchange, she would go to the vehicle shop in his place. Ziegelt City was located in the eastern part of the eastern district, although it was also still far away from the front line. As one of the General Area Management Division staff, Hikaru sometimes had to talk with people from this city. It was all done online and she herself barely ever went to the city. When she had to go visit another city, most of the time, it would be a city somewhere to the west of Kagamayama City. She had not visited that many eastern cities such as the Ziegelt City. As she was looking around the city, which was completely different from Kagamayama City with great interest, Akira's voice could be heard from the calm he was even more interested in the sights than her. Back when Akira was on the rooftop of the transport vehicle, Hikaru used his view to look at the situation on the rooftop. So, this time, the roles were reversed. Akira was now looking at the scene using Hikaru's view. The image of the surrounding area was sent to Akira using a glasses-type device that Hikaru was using, and that image was enough to attract Akira's interest. When she heard his compliments for this city, Hikaru felt slightly irritated. After all, Akira did not sound that interested back in the middle district of Kagamayama City. Akira, do you now see these kinds of things often? Hmm, rather than rare, I guess the better way to put it is that it just catches my interest, I guess. Is that so? To be honest, I don't think it's that much different from the middle district of Kagamayama City though. Hmm. Well, I guess that's the case since you're living in the inner wall, huh? But look over there. Unlike Kagamayama City, there are many air bike and self-driving cars buzzing around, right? That's just because this city is encased in a dome, that's why people are allowed to use flying vehicles. There are some facilities inside the Kagamayama district with a huge open space as well. Over there, people are allowed to ride similar things inside those facilities. I wonder if it's really okay for so many of them to fly around like that. 
won't they sometimes collide with each other? Most of them are either fully autopiloted or at least semi-autopiloted. They're obeying the instructions sent out by the city. So as long as nothing goes terribly wrong, they won't collide with each other. The auto-driving vehicles that we used back in the middle district of Kagamayama City worked using a similar system, you know. As I thought. The thing that left the biggest impression on me is the dome. That thing is continuously expending energy to fuel a powerful force field armor right? Well, those huge insects are flying around in the area so I guess they'll at least do this much to protect this city. Even Kagamayama City has dash. Hikaru suddenly stopped herself from saying any further. But a moment later, Akira guessed what Hayaku was about to say. What? Kagamayama City also has that kind of dome. Hikaru paused for a bit before answering his question. We have something similar installed in case of an emergency. But it's only used during an emergency since the energy consumption is negligible. That's why we hardly use it. I see. That's pretty impressive. Hearing Akira was honestly impressed by that, Hikaru smiled, satisfied and thought. It should be okay, there are already a few people who know about it. It should not be an issue telling someone with a high ranking like Akira. It should not violate the information secrecy. Although she thought so, she still added a warning to her words. Well, not that many people know about that, but it's not like we're keeping it a secret either. Some might focus more on the potential danger that might occur since city management took the effort to install such a thing, so, instead of feeling calmer with that device installed, they might panic instead. So, just keep this a secret, okay? Sure. Hikaru was relieved hearing that answer and changed the topic to something unrelated to force field devices. The hunters in Ziegelt City were high-ranking hunters, thus, the shops here were catered specifically to those hunters. The vehicle shop that Hikaru visited was a large shop that refused any hunters below rank 50. Even so, the hunters in that area did not have any problem with that rule. This rule worked well for both sides, the shop would not have to deal with hunters who were only there to browse. At the same time, Hunters who did not have the skill or the fund to buy expensive vehicles were not allowed to enter. Naturally, this rule did not apply to those who came into the shop with someone that met the conditions. Hikaru, who entered the shop as Akira's proxy, was able to get into it thanks to Akira's hunter rank. There was also the fact that she was a city official. When the autonomous vehicle stopped in front of the shop, a staff member welcomed Hikaru and guided her in. The shop was so big and wide that it looked more like an exhibition hall. Inside it, there were tanks, wasteland bikes, and even powered suits lined up. The staff gave Hikaru a guide through these products while giving a short explanation of each product to Hikaru. He had been informed beforehand that the real customer, Akira, was listening in and watching through the glass that Hikaru was using. Since Hikaru came here as Akira's proxy, that staff gave Hikaru the same treatment he would for the customer visiting the store. After the staff took down what Akira was looking for, he started to think about how to deal with Akira. Hikaru-sama, regarding the bike that Akira-sama is looking for, does he already have a certain budget in his mind? Wait for a second. I see, alright. He said that he would decide after seeing how much he would need to pay for it. So, he wishes to get your recommendation first if possible. Very well. In that case, I'll give a quick overview of our lineup in order while asking what the features that Akira-sama is looking for. The staff smiled politely but in the back of his mind, he was wondering whether Akira just wanted to keep his budget a secret or he actually did not have enough money to buy anything. After introducing several bikes, Akira started asking detailed questions regarding the bikes through Hikaru. Thus, the staff stood in front of a white bike and said. In that case, how about this one here? The Silphid A3. Both of its wheels are using force field armor, which allows it to race through the air. To be more specific, it's not flying, the force field armor can be used to create a footing under the wheels, so it can literally race through the air. Because of that, 
it's not as expensive as the ones with a flying device installed. Furthermore, it doesn't consume as much energy as well. Although, it's true that it's harder to control in the air compared to the ones with a flying device installed, considering that it can race in the air and on the ground, it is very versatile. The ability to race in the air can also bring about unique benefits, especially when mastered. The staff patted the surface of the bike before continuing. The chassis is protected by a powerful but energy-hungry force field armor. It is also possible to expand its force field outward. This is optional but, you can also purchase an extended arm to go with it. With the extended arm, it can handle anti-personnel weapons to weapons meant for tanks. From what I understand, I believe this is what Akira-sama is looking for. Personally speaking, I recommend using the extended arm to hold rifles instead of holding them on your own while driving the bike. Other than that, we have other options as well. Here are the specs. The staff sent a document regarding the product to Akira through Hikaru, he then waited for the response while pondering. Hunters with no funds usually opt out of the recommended option for the cheaper ones. Well, he's a hunter who can enter this place, so I guess I should just treat him as someone who's only here to browse. I should just pin my hopes on him coming again next time. As the staff was waiting with a low expectation, Hikaru finally asked him about the customization that Akira was hoping for and how much it would cost. That staff raised his eyebrows when he read through the customization list. No starter weapon, only taking an extended arm for anti-personnel weapons, these two customizations did lower the price, but besides that, Akira asked for a better sensor and energy tank. Thus, in the end, the price actually went up instead of down. With all of these customizations and the wish to send the product over as soon as possible, I have to add in the delivery fee as well. Rounding the price up, it will be around 3 billion orum. T3 billion. Hikaru gasped and could not help but to word out the surprisingly high price, seeing that reaction, the staff smiled wryly and thought. That reaction only for 3 billion, huh? You won't get far in this city like that, you know. But well, if I'm going to judge based on that reaction, I guess this city official from Kagamayama City is an amateur. Well, it can't be helped, now then, I wonder how about the hunter. Hikaru went to ask Akira while the staff was making a more detailed approximation of the total price. Hikaru once again looked surprised and returned to the staff. Um, he'll take the offer. Thank you for the patronage. Now then, we'll immediately start the customization once we finish discussing the details of the payment. As for the negotiation regarding the details of the payment, would it be okay to continue the discussion with Hikaru-sama as the proxy for Akira-sama? Ah, uh, no, he said that he's going to pay it in full right away. The staff retracted his head and raised his eyebrows. Pay in full in one go right away. Did I get it correct? Of course, we're more than happy to accept payment like that, but is Akira-sama really okay with that? Hunters could die any time, so installments and loans were not available for them. One-time payment was the only thing that was available to them and that was indeed how most hunters paid for their stuff. However, that was only for most. This did not apply to high-ranking hunters. High-ranking hunters were expected to stay alive for long, so installment plans were available to them. The fact that large corporations, strict with money, recognized their skill and judged that they would live long enough to fully pay their dues, was a testament to the trust these high-ranking hunters had as well as their skill. Thanks to that, some high-ranking hunters opted to use payment methods that were similar to that of a loan. There were even hunters who got angry if the shop did not offer that method of payment. That being said, paying 3 billion orum in one go was something that was difficult to do unless the hunter had more than enough funds in their account. Hunters would always set aside emergency funds. So, before finalizing any purchase, they must make sure that their account would not be emptied out. Based on that common sense, Akira's decision surprised the staff. Although, he did not show it on his face thanks to the training he had. The staff asked for confirmation, so Hikaru conveyed that to Akira. Akira, are you sure? It's three billion orum, you know. 
not thirty or three hundred million. No, I was also already informed how much you earn from your recent rewards, but this and that are two different things, you know. Are you really sure? All right then, just to remind you that you fully agree to this okay? No backing out okay? Yes, yes, that's right. Okay then. Now that Hikaru received his seal of approval, the rest was up to her. So, she pulled herself together and became solemn. Yes, it's not a mistake. I'll take care of the paperwork in Akira's stead from here on out. Let's proceed with the payment. Understood. The staff also changed his attitude and proceeded to process the paperwork. The process went through quickly and without any trouble, once the 3 billion orum was taken out from Akira's account, they quickly began working on the customization. We'll work on the customization right away so that we can send you the bike as soon as possible. Please wait for a bit while we finish the customization. Meanwhile, I would need to inquire on how would Akira-sama like to receive the bike. Is it okay to just give it to Hikaru-sama? Ah, about that, I actually want to discuss that matter. Hikaru requested the staff to send some escorts together with the bike while it was carried to the transport vehicle. The staff understood what Hikaru was implying when she made this request. Basically, Hikaru wanted to be spared from the responsibility of sending that bike to Akira as much as possible. After all, it was a 3 billion orum bike. If something was to happen, a simple apology would not be enough to solve it. On the other hand, it was a request made after making the 3 billion orum was paid, so doing that much was included as an after service for the shop. Very well. We shall send escorts together with the bike until we can hand the bike over to Akira-sama. Thank you very much. Likewise. This must be some kind of fate. We look forward to your visit in the future. Seeing Hikaru obviously sigh in relief, the staff smiled wryly. After that, the staff asked Hikaru for the details of Akira's equipment. He was using the adjustment for the general extension arm to fit Akira's equipment as an excuse. Moreover, he also pulled up information about Akira based on his hunter code that the shop received when processing the purchase. Although they could not inquire about hunter-specific data from the hunter office, they were still able to use that code to investigate Akira's purchase history. After all, a high-ranking hunter was still a potential customer. Of course, Companies did not give away all the information about their customers. They would want to keep their customers' vital data private to make sure they had a monopoly over their customer. Outside of that, companies would share as much information they could. Thus, those in the business shared a lot among themselves. His equipment is basically from Tosan and Kiryu, huh? Does he have some kind of contract with those two companies? It seems that he opted to buy equipment solely manufactured by these two. Well, purchasing from another manufacturer might violate the contract. So, there might really be a contract. But since he is buying his bike from us, it might be a good idea to let the higher-ups know that Tosan or Kiryu's contract does not include vehicles, huh? Without Akira knowing it, his information started to spread. Although, it was a completely different matter whether the people who received that information could make good use of it or not. Now then, Hikaru-sama. It will still take some time until the preparations are done. If I may, I would be more than happy to introduce other options as well. A hunter who was interested in such a unique product might be interested in the other unique products. That was why the staff started recommending other products to Akira, which was half out of business while the other half was out of pure curiosity. And as expected, Akira was indeed interested and ended up buying a few things. Thus, the staff remembered Akira, his name and mentally noted him down as an interesting customer. After that, Hikaru stayed inside the shop until the bike was ready. In order to kill time, she continued her conversation with Akira this morning. After telling Akira that she was not allowed to leak particular information regarding the city, she then told Akira to feel free to call her again if something came up and closed the call. However, it did not take long for Akira to call her. Akira, is there something wrong? The interphone is ringing, is it okay if I pick it up? 
Hikaru, who was waiting calmly, immediately replied. It was obvious from her voice that she was flustered. No. Don't pick it up. I'll pick up the call. I can connect from here, so don't pick it up, okay? Hey, all right, I'll leave it to you then. Akira bitterly smiled and was a bit overwhelmed by Hikaru's attitude. Since he understood that Hikaru did not want him to meet anyone, he believed that it was best to ask her so he could just leave the rest to her. Hikaru immediately stopped doing whatever she was doing and connected her information terminal to Akira's room's interphone in a hurry. Akira had no acquaintances inside the transport vehicle and if it was from the escort team, then she should have received a notification beforehand. Thus, no matter who it was, as she felt the presence of trouble, she checked the interphone camera, and the visitor was Mel Shia. It's her. Why is she visiting Akira? Hikaru thought that it was weird and sent a data request to the escort team regarding Mel Shia. Mel Shia hummed in front of Akira's room. No answer, huh? The record says that he's not outside the transport vehicle though. Is he not in the room, right now? Hmm, what should I do? While she was in the middle of thinking about what to do next, she suddenly received a call from Hikaru. When she picked it up, Hikaru's image appeared in her augmented vision. Nice to meet you, I'm the operator for the hunter in this room, my name is Hikaru. Ah, you're the operator from back then, right? Nice to meet you, I am Mel Shia. I heard that the men under me were saved thanks to you, so I came to give my gratitude. I see. Thank you very much, I shall convey that gratitude. H.M. I can convey it myself, you know. He's inside, right? You won't open the door. Ah, uh, please don't worry about it. To be honest, I think it's only right for me to give my thanks directly to him. I'm really sorry, due to certain circumstances, it is impossible to meet him directly at the moment, I hope you can understand. In contrast to Mel Shia, who was acting casually, Hikaru politely bowed her head. After that, there was silence as they were staring at each other. It seemed that neither of them were going to break the silence. Mel Shia's smile deepened and she decided to take the first move. I don't really like doing this, but you do know my hunter rank, right? Mel Shia's hunter rank was 75. In short, she was someone that was to be given exceptions. Although Hikaru was indeed a talented young staff member, she was still an amateur in the grand scheme of things. So Mel Shia was basically out of Hikaru's league. Yes. But this hunter is under contract with the General Area Management Division of Kagamayama City and he's in the middle of his job. So, I'm afraid it is not right to interrupt. This is even for someone as highly regarded as Mel Shia-sama. Hikaru knew all of that and still refused Mel Shia. Hikaru did not want to let Mel Shia meet Akira considering the possible trouble if they got into a fight. Thus, even if it meant that Mel Shia, a rank 75 hunter, would have a bad impression on her, that did not change her stance. Hikaru refused Mel Shia with a smile that was filled with anxiety. Mel Shia was a bit surprised by that, but she then lowered her shoulders and said. I see, if that's the case, then it can't be helped, all right then, I'm sorry for saying something unpleasant. Please let him know that I'm thankful to him for saving my men. Thank you for your understanding, I'll definitely convey that message to him. Okay, thanks. Hikaru politely bowed and vanished from Melshia's vision, after that, Melshia left the place and called Tatsukawa. It's me, how's the situation over there? Nothing in particular. We did tell the escort team to wait until you return. Roger that. I'm heading back now. All right, so, how is he? I couldn't meet him. Tatsukawa was a bit surprised that Mel Shia casually replied in such a manner. Oh. That's pretty rare for you to obediently retreat like this, is there a problem? I'll tell you the details later, I'll see you soon. Mel Shia cut the call and teasingly smiled. After Mel Shia cut the call, Hikaru heaved a big sigh. Why would a rank 75 hunter even come to meet him? This is not normal, you know. 
I guess his gift to attract unexpected things is one of the reasons why Kibayashi really likes him, huh? Seriously. Give me a break already. After spending her time lamenting how hard it was to handle a high-ranking hunter, Hikaru pulled herself together. She called Akira and conveyed Melshia's gratitude. After that, she pulled out excuses to satisfy Akira, who was curious why someone would come to meet him just to convey something like that.